Prologue, 15 Chess, The Year of the Mages in Amber, 1466 DR. The shrill ring of steel on steel woke Garen Hullmaster in the dark hour before dawn. He rolled up onto one elbow in his bed, listening with his brow creased in the darkness of his room. He could hear cries of alarm spreading through the castle of Griffinwatch, his family's ancestral home. For a long moment, he wondered if he were caught in one of those strange dreams that came with a delusion of wakefulness. Then the shouts and the commotion started again, and Garin came fully awake. He threw off his covers and jumped out of bed. The flagstones of the floor were cold under his bare feet. Fighting in Griffin Watch, he wondered. He'd lived in the castle of the Hallmasters all his seventeen years, and never had the castle come under any kind of attack. Oh, there were the occasional barracks-room brawls down in the shield-sworn quarters, but that was down in the castle's lower bailey, where the soldiers and the servants had their lodgings, and he doubted that the fighting he heard was any kind of drunken brawl. It sounded serious and deadly. He tucked his nightshirt into the thin breeches he usually wore to sleep, and stepped into the boots standing by the foot of the bed. He was a tall, sparely built young man, with arms and legs that seemed a little too long for him, and a wild mop of thick black hair that fell across his keen gray eyes. Stamping his feet to the floor to seat his boots, he stumbled over to his sword belt and buckled it around his narrow waist. Garin had been training at arms since his twelfth birthday, and his hands already had the hard-earned calluses of an accomplished swordsman. Whatever commotion was loose in Griffin Watch, it would find him ready for a fight. Garin gave his boots one more stamp, then hurried to his chamber door and threw it open. The hallway outside was empty, but he could hear the sounds of fighting echoing from the lower parts of the castle. "'Who attacks us?' he muttered to himself. "'Orcs or goblins from Thar? Brigands from the High Fells? How could they have gotten all the way into the castle?' And why would they attack the Harmax soldiers in their own fortress? He'd never heard of orc raiders or human bandits trying anything like that before. Since the Hullmaster family quarters seemed quiet for the moment, Garin headed down the stairs leading to the tower's lower room. There he found his cousin Kara, who stood by the door leading out to the upper court. The door was ajar, and she peered out cautiously with her eerie, spell-scarred eyes glowing faintly blue in the dim light, a short sword bared in her hand. She was a year younger than Garin, but she could use her blade almost as well as he could use the sword at his hip. Like him, she wore her nightclothes, but she'd belted her gown tight around her waist so that it wouldn't hinder her. She spared him a quick look, then returned to watching the courtyard. "'What's going on?' Garin asked in a low whisper. "'I don't know, but I heard fighting,' she answered. "'What should we do?' He frowned and peered out into the courtyard as well. A cold, steady rain pelted down in the night, and he shivered in his thin nightshirt. The shield-sworn guards, who normally stood watch by the hallmaster quarters, weren't at their posts. All of a sudden he found himself unwilling to answer Kara's question. His curiosity was rapidly giving way to dread. Something was terribly out of place in the house of the Hallmasters this night. Garin thought he knew what it was to be in a fight. After all, he'd held his own in a skirmish or two up in the high fells, riding against orcs and other such savages alongside the shield-sworn. But it was a different matter to wake up to a battle in his own home, wondering which of the soldiers or servants he knew were already lying dead in the halls. Several armored figures emerged from the doors leading down from the courtyard to the great hall. Garin tensed, dropping his hand to his sword hilt. But Kara shook her head. She could see as well as a cat in darkness, a gift of her spell scar. It's your da, she said. Burnov Hallmaster strode across the courtyard with several shield sworn at his back. Garin and Kara stepped back from the door as he and his guards entered. Garin's father was only an inch taller than Garin, but he was a thick-bodied bear of a man with a stout beard of gray-streaked brown. Garin got his black hair and his lean build from his mother's side of the family. 
Bernov wore his battle armor and a heavy cape against the weather, and he filled the doorway with his broad shoulders and pauldrons. His face was set in a grim scowl. "'Ah, you're awake,' Bernov said. "'Are you two all right?' "'Yes, Tom,' Garin answered. "'We're fine, but we heard fighting.' "'I know,' Bernov glanced around the family's hall, as if he expected enemies to burst out of the shadows at any moment. "'I want you and Kara to stay here. Bar the door when I leave, and admit no one to the Hullmaster quarters except the Harmac or myself. And no one's to leave, either. Keep your mother, your aunt, and Sergen here until I tell you it's safe. Do you understand me?' Garin did not understand at all, but he managed a weak nod. "'What's happening? Are we under attack?' Bernov's scowl deepened again. "'It's your uncle Kamoth. He tried to murder the Harmac and seize Griffin Watch. The Harmac survived, but the castle is still in doubt. I fear some of the shield-sworn are his, so you're not to trust anyone.' "'Kamoth tried to kill the Harmac?' Garin stared at his father. Kamoth Castlemar was husband to Garin's aunt, Tarina, Burnov's sister. Their older brother, Grigor, was Harmac of Hullberg, lord over the town and the surrounding lands. Garin knew that his father didn't think much of Kamoth and hadn't ever really trusted the man, but he couldn't believe that Kamoth was capable of the sort of treachery that was apparently afoot. He liked Kamoth. The Hillsfarian nobleman had married into the family only two years past, bringing with him his son, Sergen. But even though Garin and Sergen didn't get along, Kamoth had never had a hard word for Garin. Kamoth had a wicked sense of humor and the charm of a born rogue. But the capacity for treason and murder? There must be some mistake, Garin said. There's no mistake. Kamoth and his men killed the guards by Grigor's door, but another shield-sworn happened by and caught them at it. They killed her, too, but not before her shouts raised the alarm. Burnov reached out to set a hand on Garin's shoulder, and his expression softened. "'I know you think highly of Kamoth, Garin, but he's turned against us, and he means to kill every last Hullmaster and take Hullberg for his own. He's an enemy now.' Another sharp exchange of sword-play came from lower in the castle, and Burnoff glanced over his shoulder. "'I have to go. Stay here and keep the door barred.' "'Wait! I'll come with you,' Garin said. "'I can help.' He wasn't a match for his father yet, or Kamoth either, but he could best many of the shields sworn in the practice yard. Burnoff smiled and squeezed Garin's shoulder with rough affection. "'I know it, son.' But I'm worried for your mother and the rest of the family, and I'd feel a lot better if I knew that you and Kara were here to keep this door closed and make sure they all stay safe. Garin knew his father was simply putting a good face on ordering him to stay out of the fighting, but he acquiesced anyway. I understand, he replied. Burnoff nodded and strode back out into the rainy courtyard. Kara shot the heavy iron bolt into place. They waited in silence for a quarter hour or more, straining their ears for a clue as to what was taking place in the castle outside the Harmax Tower. From time to time, new shouts echoed through the halls below, punctuated by sharp cries or the clatter of steel against steel. But the sounds of fighting steadily diminished. Garin thought that one side or the other must be getting the upper hand. He wished that he hadn't agreed to remain in the tower— if he'd gone with his father, he might have been able to tip the scales in some close skirmish. He was old enough and skilled enough to fight for the Harmac. The door to the tower rattled against its bolt. Garin and Kara both jumped at the sound and turned to look. The door, a sturdy construction of thick oak planks riveted together with bands of iron, shook again in its frame. "'In the tower! There! Open up!' a man called from outside. "'It's Kamoth!' Kara gasped. Garin nodded. Together they drew their blades and stood facing the door. Its bar was sturdy enough to stop anything short of a small battering ram. There was a small scratching sound, and the small spy-hole in the door swung open, pushed by the blade of a dagger. The panel was only about the size of a hand, but it was enough for Garin to recognize his uncle's features peering through from outside.' 
Kamoth's bright blue eyes fell on him, then crinkled at the corners in a warm smile. Ah, there you are. Garin, my boy, and Kara, my dear. Open the door, will you? Garin glanced at Kara, but she did not move. Kamoth was her stepfather, but she'd known her uncle Burnoff all her life. Kamoth's brows knitted together. Hmm, perhaps I wasn't sufficiently clear. Draw back the bolt, if you please, because I'd like to come inside the tower. We can't do that, Garin answered. Oh, why in the world not? My father told us to keep this door barred until he or the Harmac tells us otherwise. Kamoth glanced away and muttered something under his breath, but he returned to the spy hole a moment later, his eyes bright and kind. Be that as it may, I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you just let me in for a moment. I'm in need of a few things from my quarters, and then I'll be right out again. Garin straightened his shoulders and looked his uncle in the eye. My father told us you tried to kill the Harmac tonight. Is it true? A terrible misunderstanding, my boy. I have some important letters in my room that I need to show your father to clear this all up. Now mark my words, you two— Open that door before this whole affair takes a tragic turn. It's dangerous for me to stand out here on this doorstep talking to you. Garin felt himself starting to waver. He wanted to give Kamoth the chance to explain himself, even though he knew exactly what his father had told him to do. But he felt Kara standing at his shoulder. Don't do it, Garin, she whispered. There are more men just behind him. He closed his eyes and shook his head. We won't let you in. Not against my father's orders. If you're innocent, you should give yourself up. Anger flashed in Kamal's eyes, but swiftly passed. Well, I never took you for a fool, my boy. That's it, then. I'd best be on my way. Kara, give my regards to your mother. I'll certainly miss her, I will. There was a small sound of movement outside. Then Kamal's face vanished from the spy hole. Garin waited a moment then cautiously crept up to peer from the small spy hole. The rain-slicked courtyard outside was empty. "'What's going on here?' At the foot of the stairs leading up to the family quarters, Garin's cousin Sergan stood in his nightshirt. He looked at Garin and Kara, and his eyes narrowed suspiciously. "'Was that my father at the door?' Garin and Kara exchanged looks. "'You'd better tell him,' Garin said to her. I doubt he'll believe it from my mouth. Believe what? Sergan demanded. He was a dark-haired youth of fifteen years, wiry like his father, but he was paler than Kamoth, and stood a good four inches shorter than Garin. He'd come to Griffin Watch two years past, when Kamoth married Tarina Hallmaster. Garin didn't like him very much. In his experience, Sergan was quick to find fault with others— and quicker still to take offense when someone found fault with him. Kara grimaced and looked over to their step-cousin. "'Your father tried to kill the Harmac. He's got men in the castle.' "'What? That makes no sense.' "'Can't you hear the fighting?' Garin snapped. "'Those are Kamos men fighting the shield-sworn. Your father's a traitor.' "'That's a lie,' Sergan snarled. "'You're a damned liar.' "'No, I'm not,' Garin said coldly. "'In fact, I wonder if you're in on this, too.' He took two steps toward Sergan and narrowed his eyes. He didn't particularly like Sergan calling him a liar for no other reason than saying something Sergan didn't want to hear. He'd earned more than a little trouble for teaching Sergan manners with his fists before, but that wouldn't stop him from doing so again if his step-cousin didn't mind his words. "'My father is no traitor!' Sergan shouted. He balled his fists and refused to give ground. Garin frowned. He'd never known Sergan to challenge him so directly. And I'm not either. Say it again and I'll knock your teeth out, you lying bastard. Garin started forward with the intention of extracting an apology from his step-cousin, but Kara reached out to set a hand on his arm. Wait, Garin, she said. He really does think you're lying. He doesn't know anything about this. Kamoth didn't tell him. Stop saying that! Tears of anger gathered in Sergan's eyes. My father is no traitor! 
Kara did not reply. Garin glared at his step-cousin, but to his surprise, a small measure of compassion for Sergan stopped him from another sharp retort. By sunrise, Sergan would know the truth of events. If Garin had been in his place, he knew he'd find the shame of his father's actions absolutely unbearable. He might as well allow Sergan to enjoy his ignorance for a few hours more. "'Very well,' he said. "'I'll say nothing more on it.' Sergan looked suspiciously from Garin to Kara. "'Where is my father, then?' Kara sighed, and her voice softened. "'He's gone. I think he's leaving Hullberg.' "'Leaving?' Sergan stared at Kara for a moment. Then, without another word, he brushed his hand across his eyes, turned, and bolted up the stairs, leading back to his room. Garin guessed that his step-cousin did not want to let him see how he'd been wounded." He watched Sergan retreat and ran a hand through his hair. He couldn't even begin to imagine what all of this meant for Sergan, for his aunt Tarina, for all of the Hallmasters. Sergan would likely never believe it. Any pleasure Garin might have felt at his stepcousin's humiliation was rapidly souring in his stomach. Not even Sergan deserved what his father had done. Kara cocked her head to the side, listening. I think the fighting's over she said. I don't hear any more sword play. Kamath's gone, then. Garin thought about his father's instructions, and decided he'd better follow them to the letter. Go check on your mother, and you'd better keep an eye on Sergan, just in case. Watch his door, and make sure he doesn't leave. I'll stand guard here. All right, Kara agreed. She started up the stairs, but turned to look back at Garin at the bottom of the steps. Where do you think Kamath will go now? Garin shook his head. Back to Hillsfar? Or maybe Mullmaster? Whatever Kamoth had done, Garin almost hoped that he did get away. He didn't like the idea of watching Kamoth try to answer for what had happened in Griffin Watch this night. I don't imagine we'll see him again. He can't very well come back after tonight. No, I suppose he can't, Kara agreed. She went up the steps, and Garin took up his vigil by the door. He glanced out the window. The rain was passing, and a clear, bright moon was setting over the waters of the moon sea. Sunrise was not far off, and he'd learn more about Kamoth's treachery soon enough. 1. Eleven Elint, the Year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. Nearly fourteen years later, and twenty miles from Hallberg, Garin Hallmaster rode over a steep rise on the coastal trail, and found pirates plundering a house Sokol merchant ship. He halted and stared down at the two ships drawn up on the beach of the nameless cove below him, before he recovered from his surprise. Then he spurred his mount down from the ridge line to take cover behind an outcropping of rock. He was fortunate. The sun was setting behind him. Anyone looking up the hillside from the beach below would see nothing but an eyeful of bright sunshine. Garin patted his horse's neck and whispered soothingly to it. He was a tall, lean man, a little over thirty, dressed in a long, weather-beaten cloak over a leather jacket, breeches of dark green wool, and high leather boots. At his hip rode a long, elven backsword with a hilt fashioned in the shape of a rose. His trail clung to the hillside above the cove and didn't come all that close to the beach itself, but there was no way he could continue on without being spotted. Backtrack and go around, he wondered aloud, or wait until it gets dark and then ride by on the trail? He decided he preferred to ride past if he could. It should be safe enough if the pirates didn't send out any foraging parties, but any way he looked at it, He'd be riding long after sundown and making a late camp with no fire. He scowled at the thought. The presence of a Corsair ship only twenty miles from his home was not a good sign. Piracy had been bad this year, growing worse with each passing month. Hullberg's ships were harried all over the moon sea. Now here was another cargo that wouldn't reach Hullberg's storehouses— it would be a heavy blow to the Sokols and to the Harmac's coffers, too. He dismounted, looping his horse's reins around a bleached pine stump amid the boulders. 
As long as he was waiting for nightfall, he might as well see if he could learn anything useful about the Corsair's plundering ships on Hallberg's doorstep. Picking his way down the slope to find a better vantage point, he eventually settled under the branches of a wind-sculpted thicket of gorse, about fifty yards up the hillside from the strand, and studied the scene more carefully. The pirates were mostly humans, with a mix of other folk, a dwarf or two, some goblins, even one ogre that he could see. They had the Sokol ship's cargo scattered all over the beach, sorting out what was worth taking and what they'd leave behind. Garin couldn't see any of the merchant's crew, but that didn't surprise him. Most likely the pirates had killed them after capturing the ship and dumped the corpses over the side. He chewed his lower lip, thinking. He'd do something about it if he could, but for the moment it was no real business of his. It was only an accident of fate that he was in the vicinity at all. he spent the last few days visiting his mother, who resided in a Selenite convent in Thentia, and was on his way back to Hullberg. It was usually an uneventful journey, since no one lived along the coastland between Thentia and Hullberg, and most traffic between the two cities went by sea. There wasn't even much reason for highwaymen or marauders from the wilds of Thar to come this way. They probably chose this cove just for that reason, he said to himself. They needed a quiet place where they could sort through their plunder, and they weren't likely to be troubled here. He couldn't do much about the Sokol ship now, but at least he could carry news of the attack to Hullberg and let the Sokols know what had happened to their ship. He settled in to study the pirates and their vessel closely, while he waited for the sun to set. The pirate vessel was a three-masted war galley, a ship that would be equally handy under sail or oar. Garin couldn't make out any name from where he was hiding, but the figurehead was clear, a mermaid-like creature whose fishy tail was instead a mass of crocken arms. He'd never seen anything like it. There couldn't be too many ships on the moon sea with that device. As the sun set, the pirates built a bonfire on the beach and broke out casks of wine taken from their prize. Garin judged that it was dark enough to make his way back up to where he'd left his horse. But just as he was about to crawl out from under the gorse, he heard a scream. From behind the hull of the pirate ship, two crewmen dragged a young woman in a fine blue dress with a bodice of dove gray into sight and roughly tied her to the pirate vessel's kedging anchor up on the beach. She'd been hidden on the far side of the ship from Garin's vantage point. One of the ruffians knotted his hand in the woman's long golden hair, pressed his bearded face against hers, and forced a kiss. Then he reached up with his other hand and stripped her to the waist, tearing away her bodice. She snarled at him and struggled to get free, but her hands were bound behind her back. The pirate laughed and sauntered away. Garin started to draw his blade and surge from his hiding place, but he forced himself to stop and consider his actions. If he acted rashly, he could get both himself and the woman killed. "'Ah, damn it all,' Garin muttered. "'Now what do I do?' "'A moment ago there would have been no shame in slipping away "'and making sure the tale of the Sokol ship's fate reached Hullberg. "'He wouldn't have lost a moment's sleep over leaving a scene "'where the murders had already taken place. "'But it was all too clear what a beautiful woman, "'unfortunate enough to have been a passenger on the wrong ship, "'could expect in the pirate's camp. "'If he rode off and abandoned her to her fate,' he'd hear her screams in his conscience for a long time. He had to do something. The only question was, what? He might have considered attacking a handful of enemies who weren't expecting trouble, but there must have been sixty or seventy men on the beach, and likely more he just hadn't seen yet. Pirate vessels carried large crews so that they could overwhelm their victims through weight of numbers. It'll have to be stealth, he realized, or a diversion of some kind. I need something to take their attention away from her long enough to cut her free and spirit her away. And the longer I wait, the better. They'll get themselves falling down drunk if I give them the chance. But how long will they wait before they turn their attention on the woman? And are there other captives I haven't seen yet? Garin waited impatiently, watching from his hiding place. 
the pirates tapped another cask and drank eagerly, roaring with laughter and admiring their spoils. Several times he tensed and prepared to burst out of his place of concealment when one or another of the crewmen approached the woman, but each time the pirate retreated. Finally, Garin decided that the master of the pirate ship must have been saving her for himself. She was certainly pretty enough. She slumped with her chin down, held upright by the lashings that bound her to the anchor. He wondered who she was and how she'd come to be on the ship. Finally, he judged that the moment was as right as it would ever be. It was possible that more of the pirates would drink themselves into a stupor if he waited longer, but the leader might appear and rape or kill the woman at any time. Besides, Garin could see a silver glimmer to the southeast that hinted at a big, bright moon. Scowling at the foolishness of his own conscience, he slipped out of the brush and darted down to the water's edge. There was no surf to speak of, just small wavelets less than a foot tall. Wading out into the cold darkness until he was thigh-deep in water, he crouched down and began to creep toward the stern of the Sokol ship, which still jutted out a fair distance from the shore. The pirate vessel might be better for what he had in mind, but it was farther away, and he didn't want too many enemies between him and his horse if things went poorly. The moon sea was never warm even in the middle of summer. On a clear, dark autumn evening, it was bitterly cold. Garin's teeth chattered, and he shivered from toe to crown. But the water provided the best avenue toward his goal without crossing the open, firelit beach. The pirates' shouts and coarse jests rang out over the water, filling the cove with their callousness. After waiting a short distance, he reached the stern of the Sokol ship and paused to listen closely. He could hear muffled thumps, gruff voices, and planks creaking. At least a few of the pirates still searched the holds of the merchant ship, but he didn't think he heard anyone up on the deck. As stealthily as he could, Garin clambered up the ship's side toward the quarter-deck and risked a quick look. No one was in sight. He swung himself over the rail and moved back to the ship's stern lamp. It was a big lantern of wrought iron, suspended from a short pole fixed to the rail. He pulled it down and glanced inside. Oil sloshed in the reservoir. He poured it out on the deck, then splashed some on the rigging lines and the furled sail of the mizzenmast close by. From the caravel's quarter-deck, he could see the pirate's bonfire on the beach. Several men were gathered around their captive, leering and pawing at her. She's almost out of time, he realized. Kneeling by the oil he'd poured out on the deck, Garin focused his mind into the clear, still calm necessary for spell-casting. He whispered words in Elvish he'd learned years ago in Myth Draner. Amar Gellera. In the palm of his upturned hand, a bright yellow flame the size of an apple appeared. He flicked it down to the oil-soaked deck. As the pool ignited and flames began to climb into the rigging, Garin quickly scrambled back over the side and dropped back into the water. Ruddy light blossomed on the quarter-deck behind him. "'The prize!' someone shouted. "'She's burning!' Garin glided away from the burning ship as quickly as he could, hoping that none of the pirates would think to look for an enemy creeping away in the water. He heard more shouts behind him and risked a quick look. Men on the beach leaped to their feet and dashed for the grounded Sokol ship. Others stood staring in dumb amazement until their officers cuffed them into action. "'Put it out! Put it out, you dogs!' they shouted. Fire was the one thing that sailors feared more than anything else, for there were a thousand things on a ship that burned well, given the chance. If there had been a strong wind blowing, Garin might have hoped for the flames to spread to the other vessel, but even without that— it seemed that the fire was doing its part in diverting the pirates. He floundered back to the wet sand and gravel fifty yards from the caravel, with no cover to speak of, but he was in the darkness, and the pirates' attention was fixed on the bright fire. Men were swarming over the rail to battle the blaze now, beating at the flames with wet blankets and old cloaks, or throwing buckets of water and sand as quickly as they could draw them. 
Several pirates still lingered near the place where the woman was tied up, but they were looking at the fire as well. Timora, favor a fool, he said aloud. Then he drew his elven blade, locked his eyes on the place he wanted to be, and spoke another spell. Syrok, he said. In a single, dark, dizzying instant, he vanished from where he was standing and appeared beside the golden-haired woman. She looked up, startled, and he saw that she had elf blood in her. Her violet eyes showed just the slightest tilt. Subtle points graced her ears, and her features had a fine, sharp cast to them. She was slender of build and tall, but her pale bosom had a human fullness, and her hips were well curved. He pressed his hand over her mouth before she could give him away with a startled cry, and quickly set the edge of his blade to her bonds. A dozen pirates were sprawled on the ground nearby, too drunk to be roused by the fire. Three more stood within ten or fifteen feet, but they were watching their fellows fight the fire. Their backs were to Garin. "'Don't speak,' Garin whispered into the half-elf's ear. "'I'm going to try to rescue you.' The panic in her eyes faded, and she gave him a single quick nod. He took his hand from her mouth and turned his attention to slicing through the ropes, binding her as quickly and quietly as he could. It was harder than he'd thought. The firelight cast dark, dancing shadows, and he didn't want to cut her by mistake. He finally found the right angle for his sword and sawed through the cords binding her wrists together. "'Behind you!' the half-elf hissed urgently. Garin looked up and found that one of the pirates, who'd had his back turned a moment ago, was looking right at him. He was a burly fellow with a mop of straw-colored hair and a scarred jaw. "'Who the devil are you? And what do you think you're doing with our prisoner?' the man demanded. The other crewmen, standing nearby, turned to look at Garin. Garin seized the half-elf by her wrist and dashed off into the darkness. They struggled through the loose sand, but so did the men who pursued them. In twenty steps they were out of the firelight, and Garin began to hope that they might be able to simply outrun the corsair's pursuit. Then he saw a brawny half-orc moving to intercept them, a heavy hand-axe grasped in one thick fist. They must have posted some sentries after all, Garin realized. The half-orc didn't waste time on challenges. Bearing his fangs in a fierce growl, he flung himself at Garin with a roar of rage, his axe raised high. Garin quickly stepped in front of the captive and met the half-orc's rush with an arcane word and a lunge. His sword burst into emerald flame and took the half-orc in the notch of his collarbone, grating on bone as it struck deep. The pirate stumbled heavily and fell into the sword-mage. Garin shouldered him to the side, then whirled to face the big straw-haired man and the other two pursuing from the fireside. "'Ho! Oh, so you've some fight in you after all,' the big man said. "'I thought you were going to just run off there.' He had a cutlass in his hand, and he started forward with a more cautious advance than his crewmate had tried. The second man came up close behind him with a short boarding pike. The third fellow struggled to catch up. "'More are coming,' the half-elf woman said, and she was right. By the bonfire, Garin could see more of the pirates turning aside from the fire aboard the Sokol ship and moving in their direction. He didn't have time for a defensive fight. He launched an attack on the big man. The fellow parried his first thrust and blocked the slash that Garin followed with, but then Garin looped his point over the man's guard and stabbed him deeply in the meat of his sword arm. The pirate dropped his cutlass with a startled oath. Before the man could recover, Garin flung out an arm and snarled another spell, flinging up a shield of ghostly white. The glowing disc caught the man with the boarding pike as he worked around to Garin's flank and knocked him down in the sand. The fellow started to scramble to his feet, but a fist-sized rock sailed over Garin's shoulder and caught him in the mouth. He fell back again, spitting broken teeth. The third pirate looked up at Garin, realizing that neither of his two comrades was still in the fight. He was armed only with a long dagger, but he must have been daunted by Garin's longer blade, or magic, because he hesitated and then backed away. "'Over here!' he shouted. "'The girl's getting away! Here!' Garin snarled in frustration. He'd been within a few feet of escaping without notice. 
The man with the dagger realized his danger at the last moment and tried to retreat, but he lost his footing in the sand and fell. Garin silenced him with a savage kick to the jaw. Garin wheeled to face the big, yellow-haired man, just in time to duck under a wild, left-handed slash of the man's cutlass. This man was the one who'd stripped the captive and toyed with her while she was helpless. Eyes blazing with wrath, Garin slapped his cutlass out of the way and rammed the point of his backsword into the man's belly. The man howled in agony. Garin jerked back his point and finished the pirate with a cut that took off half of his face. He looked around for another foe to sate his anger, but no more were near. The half-elf winced when he met her eyes and retreated a step. Garin took a breath, mastered his fury, and lowered his sword. Before any more foes could catch up, he seized the woman's hand again and hurried her up the beach. "'You're handy with a rock, but it's time to leave,' he told her. "'We've worn out our welcome.' Together they scrambled through the brush at the edge of the beach and ran up the hillside. When Garin risked another look over his shoulder, he could see dozens of men seizing burning brands from their bonfire and starting up the hill after them. The slope was treacherous and the dark. Loose soil and rock slipped under their feet, and he had to keep an eye ahead to make sure they didn't flee into a bluff they couldn't scale, as well as watching the pirates who followed. He found their way blocked by a thick patch of brush at the foot of the cliff, and realized they were climbing up by a different way than he'd come down. He paused, trying to find his bearings, but the half-elf took one glance and pulled him toward the left. "'There's a better path over here,' she said. Garin decided to trust her judgment and followed after her. With her elf blood, she could probably see in the dark much better than he could. When they got around the thicket, he took the lead again and steered her toward the spot where he'd left his horse. They reached the boulders where Garin's horse was tethered. The animal, a big gray gelding, scented danger and pranced nervously. Garin sheathed his sword. He hated to do that with blood on the blade, but he'd just have to clean it up as best he could later, and unlooped the reins as the half-elf climbed into the saddle. Then he hauled himself up into the saddle behind her and set his heels to the horse's flanks. They pelted out of cover along the trail as the first of the pirates reached the top behind them. The sword mage risked a glance backward and saw angry corsairs running after them, brandishing torches and cutlasses. Then he leaned forward in the saddle, arms around the woman in front of him, and urged the gelding to its best speed, his horse's hoofbeats thundering in the night. Garin galloped out of the cove with the pirate's captive on his saddle and leaping red firelight behind him. Two, eleven light, the year of the ageless one, fourteen seventy nine, dr. After a hard run of a mile or so to gain distance on the pirates, Garin slowed his horse to a canter and rode for a time. When he judged that they'd put any immediate pursuit well behind them, he let the horse settle into a trot, its breath steaming in the cool night air. The night was clear and cold, but the moon was up now. Its silver light glittered on the moon sea to their right. The woman shivered in his arms, and he realized that she was clutching only a shred of her torn dress over her torso. For that matter, he was still soaked from his moonlight swim. "'I think we've outrun them for now,' he said. "'We can stop for a moment. I have a spare shirt and cloak in my gear.' She turned her head to look back at him. "'Thank you,' she said. "'I didn't want to say anything, but I'm freezing.' He reined in and dropped down out of the saddle. Then he offered a hand to help her down as well, trying, but not entirely succeeding, to keep his eyes fixed on her face. She crossed her arms over her chest with an awkward grimace, and he made himself turn his attention to the satchel behind the saddle. He rummaged through it quickly and found his spare clothing. Here, you're welcome to it. He turned away and watched the trail behind them, giving her the privacy to dress as well as she could. There was no sign of the pirates behind them. He guessed they'd covered three or four miles pretty quickly. The marauders must be at least a quarter hour behind them, if indeed they were still giving chase. He heard rustling and the sound of tearing cloth. 
Then the half-elf spoke again. I'm decently covered now, she said. Garin looked back to her. She had ripped off the ruined top of her dress and tucked his oversized shirt into what was now a very uneven-looking skirt. His cloak hung down to her ankles, and she hugged it close around her shoulders. They regarded each other for a moment. "'I'm Garin,' he told her. "'I mean you no harm. If you like, I'll see you to Hullberg and help you on your way once we get there.' "'My name is Nemessa Sokol.' She held the cloak tightly around her collar, as if she meant to hide inside it. "'We were bound for Hullberg. We were supposed to land there this afternoon.' "'You're a Sokol?' "'Yes. My father is Arandar Sokol.' She glanced over Garin's shoulder at the trail leading back along the hills toward the cove. There was a smudge of orange light flickering against the hillside. "'Is it safe to linger here?' "'No, we should keep moving,' he said. Garin didn't know any of the Sokol family personally, but he knew of them. They were from the city of Flan, a few days' sail west of Hullberg. Like many of the well-born folk around the Moon Sea, they were merchant nobles. They had interests in several cities, including Hullberg. It's a little less than twenty miles to Hullberg, by my guess. Too far to ride tonight, but I think we can put the pirates well behind us. Then, yes, I'll be happy to let you see me to Hullberg, but you won't have to go to any more trouble on my account. My family's coster has a trading concession there. I'll be fine. In that case, I suggest we ride another few miles and then get off the trail. We'll be home by noon tomorrow. Home? Nemessa looked more closely at Garin. Of course. You're Garin Hullmaster, the Harmax nephew. You're the one who fought the king in copper and killed Murrin of the Blood Skulls. We heard the story. But what in the world were you doing by that beach? You must be mad to challenge so many enemies at once. Garin allowed himself a small smile. I'll answer, but let's ride while we talk. He helped Nemessa up into the saddle again, not that she really needed the assistance, then settled himself behind her. They rode eastward along the crest of the coastal hills, following the winding trail. The moon draped the dark landscape in silver and shadow. It was clear enough that the promontories and inlets for several miles ahead were visible, and the moon sea was a great gray plain stretching out of sight on their right. With Nemessa's slim body in front of him, and her golden curls just under his nose, it did not seem like such a bad night for a ride after all. "'How did you come to find me when you did?' Nemessa asked. "'An accident.' I left Thentia early this morning and was looking for a place to make camp for the evening when I stumbled across the pirates and your ship. I was about to ride off when they brought you out and tied you up. He shrugged awkwardly, even though she couldn't see him. I couldn't leave you in their hands without at least trying to help, but I had to wait until it was dark before I could move. You saw the rest. The fire on White Wing? Yes, I'm afraid that was my doing. I figured that she was a loss already, so I might as well deny the pirates their prize while making a distraction. They rode on for a short time, and then Garin sighed. He hated to ask what he asked next, but he thought he'd better. I watched for a while, Nemessa. I didn't see any other captives. Were you the only one they spared? Yes. She looked down. There was no one else left to save. Were you— he began, and then he stopped himself. He was going to ask if she'd been traveling alone, but he knew better. A young noblewoman of a good family would have been accompanied, most likely by a maid-in-waiting or a kinsman. There was a chance that the pirates would spare well-born captives in the hopes of winning a rich ransom, but somehow he doubted that they'd intended to ransom Nemessa back to her family. And if they hadn't intended to ransom her— no one else in her party would have been worth keeping alive. He let the question die on his lips. He could only imagine what she'd seen and been through. Even if she was made of stern stuff, it would not be easy on her. After a while, he realized that she was shaking inside his oversized cloak, and she failed to stifle a sob. 
He frowned behind her, trying to decide if it was kinder to leave her to her thoughts for a time, distract her with meaningless conversation, or draw her out and let her tell her story. Half an hour ago you were thinking of her as a princess in a water-deep romance story, and you the brave knight, Garin fumed at himself. She's seen more murder and cruelty in a few short hours than most people do in a lifetime, and he'd certainly contributed his own share with his furious skirmish on the beach. All she knew of him was that he'd stolen her out of a pirate camp, savagely cutting down anyone in his path. Regardless of the reasons he gave for his actions, she had to wonder whether his motives were honorable or not. Not knowing what else to do, he squeezed her hand and said, "'It's over now, Nemessa. She nodded, but did not answer. Garin found a spot that he remembered along the track and paused to look around. They still had the trail to themselves, as far as he could tell. He spurred his horse up and over the crest of the hill. An old footpath led into the low thickets and hedgerows of a small valley where a stream descended to the sea below. They headed inland into the empty hills. If the pirates were still in pursuit, Garin figured that they'd likely follow the coastal trail. They couldn't know where Garin and Nemessa had left the trail unless they had a very good tracker with them. A long abandoned homestead stood at the head of the valley. It might have been wiser to keep on going, but he was exhausted, and the moon would be setting soon. There were dangers other than pirates abroad in the high fells at night, and Garin didn't care to meet them in the dark. He dismounted and led his horse inside the old house. There was a back door leading out to overgrown fields behind the house. If they had to, they could flee deeper into the hills. He helped Nemessa down, then busied himself with setting up a small camp. "'I think it's safe to rest a couple of hours,' he said. "'We can't ride all night.' and I'm too tired to go much farther. My apologies for the accommodations. For some reason, a lonely old ruin in the middle of nowhere doesn't seem so bad to me tonight, Nemessa answered. She found a small, rueful smile. Do you know where we are? More or less. I used to hunt up here when I was younger. Garin found some dry brush and built a small fire inside the old hearth. He stepped around the corner to change into the last of his dry clothing and spread his wet clothes out in front of the fire. Then he shared his provisions with Nemessa, and they made a supper out of a loaf of bread, a wedge of cheese, dried sausage, and apples. She ate ravenously. When Nemessa finished, she looked up at him and brushed a hand across her eyes. "'I haven't eaten since yesterday evening,' she explained. "'I understand.' "'And I don't think I've thanked you yet for saving my life.' "'Nemessa dropped her gaze. "'I don't know what moved you to risk your own life to save a stranger, "'but I'm very glad that you came along when you did. "'The things they said they would do to me, I can't even think of it. "'Do you know who they were?' Garin asked gently. "'The ship's name was Kraken Queen. "'I saw it painted on her stern.' The captain was a fierce man, maybe fifty or so, and almost as tall as you. He wore braids in his hair and beard. I never heard any of the crewmen call him anything other than captain. Garin remembered the figurehead of the tentacled mermaid. The name fit the ship. How did they catch you? They stole up on us before sunrise this morning. When the sun came up and we spotted them— they were only a couple of miles off. Master Parman tried to outrun the pirate ship, but the wind died down around noon, and after that White Wing didn't stand a chance. Nemessa hesitated, and she huddled deeper in Garin's cloak. They killed everyone else, but the pirate captain ordered his men to spare me for later. You don't have to say more. Nemessa fell silent, and Garin frowned digesting the story. White Wing made five ships he knew of that hadn't reached Hullberg in the last few months. Piracy was choking the trade of the city little by little. Something would have to be done, and soon. Well, it's over now, he told her. You're out of their reach. Try to sleep for a few hours. 
He let her have his bedroll and went to tend to his horse. He gave the animal an extra pat on the neck by way of apologizing for a hard run at the end of a long day. By the time he returned to the fireside, Nemessa was curled up on her side under his blankets and breathing deeply and slowly. He studied her face. She had wide eyes, a delicate point to her chin, and smooth skin that seemed a pale gold in the firelight, hinting at sun-elf ancestry. In sleep she looked young and innocent. It was hard to say with someone of elf descent, but he would have guessed her to be twenty-five or so. Younger than Allier, he decided. And she was fair-haired, while Allier's hair was dark as moon shadows. Of course, he'd never watched Allier sleep during the brief months that he'd loved her. Elves didn't sleep as humans, or half-elves did. Strange how two peoples could be so much alike, and yet so different. She's not Allier, Garin told himself softly. With a sigh, he turned away and looked to settle himself for a long night. Nemessa had his bedroll, so all he could do was wrap himself in his cloak. He resigned himself to a night with little rest, and found a spot where he could sit with his back to a wall and have a good view of the overgrown fields outside. The night was still and quiet. He dozed off a couple of times during the night, but no one came along to interrupt their rest. Finally, as the eastern sky began to gray, he roused himself. He didn't think Croc and Queen's men were anywhere nearby, but his trail would be easier to follow in daylight. He packed up the camp quietly, allowing Nemessa to sleep a little longer. Then he woke her. Morning is near. We should move on. Nemessa opened her eyes, looked at him, then sat up sharply with a gasp. She frowned in puzzlement. Then she remembered where she was. Sweet saloon, she murmured. For a moment I thought it was all a terrible dream. I'm afraid not, he told her. He gave her a crooked smile. I'd offer you some breakfast, but we ate everything I had with me before we went to sleep. Lunch is in Hullberg. In a few minutes he packed up the last of his gear, and they set off again. A high overcast was stealing in from the west. Rather than heading back to the coastal trail, Garin decided to put the sunrise on his right and cut northeast through the hills. It would shave a couple of miles off their journey, even if it was more rugged country, and it was also much less likely to lead them into any pirates who might still be looking for them. These hills marked the rolling fall of the land from the high moors of Thar to the Moon Sea. The folk of Hullberg called them the High Fells, and Garin knew them well. As a youth he'd explored every vale and hill for a day's ride around his home. They rode at an easy pace for several miles, slowly climbing higher into the hills and leaving the coast behind them. The higher slopes were treeless and marked by wide slashes of bare, mossy rock. "'It's so empty,' Nemessa said as they crested a ridge. "'Nobody lives here?' "'Shepherds and goat-herds sometimes bring their flocks into these hills in the summertime, but we're past that now,' Garin answered. "'A few people settled the coastal hills in the time of old Thentur, but that was two or three centuries ago. Now?' he shook his head. "'No, no one lives up here. "'Where are the mines and the forests your people cut?' Garin pointed past her at a faint gray-green range that marched across their path many miles away. "'The Galena Mountains. They lie about fifteen or twenty miles east of Hullberg. That's where you'll find the mining and timber camps. West of Hullberg there's nothing but the high fells and Thar.' He reined in and swung himself down from the saddle. "'You keep riding. I'll walk a bit.' "'I'm perfectly capable of walking a few miles,' Nemessa answered. I don't doubt it, but I'd feel better if you rode. She looked at him with a skeptical expression. You don't have to impress me with your gallantry, you know. Would it make you feel better if I said I was mindful of the horse? Not you? Nemessa laughed briefly and shook her head. She had a pleasant laugh, light and soft, much like many of the elves Garin had known in Mythdranor. He smiled and set off again, walking at her stirrup as they picked their way down a hillside. 
If he had his bearings right, they'd hit the inland trail from Thentia soon. So, what business do you have in Hullberg? It seems a fair distance from your home. I'm taking over the management of our house's trade yard. My father isn't satisfied with the return on our investments in Hullberg. He feels that it's time a Sokol stepped in to put things in order. Garin looked up at her. He wondered if she had much experience in overseeing Sokol business. Was her father seeing to her education in the affairs of House Sokol, or was she expected to take a direct hand in the business? He was more than a little responsible for the decline in Sokol profits over the last few months, since he'd played a large part in exposing the corruption of the merchant council in Hallberg, although it was Garin's own cousin Sergen who'd been behind much of that. In the aftermath of Sergen's failed attempt to seize power, Harmac Grigor had closely examined the leases and rents paid by each of the foreign merchant concessions in Hallberg. Most of the big merchant costers were now paying much more for the right to cut the Harmac's timber and mine the Harmac's hills than they had when Sergen was running things. Of course, that meant Nemesa would be on the other side of the table from him when it came time to negotiate those rights. There are still plenty of Varuna leases available, he observed. House Varuna of Molemaster had been Sergen's chief accomplice in the recent troubles. House Sokol could do worse than to bid on a few of those, since the Varunas won't be getting them back. The Varunas have made it clear to us that they'd take a very dim view of other families or costers buying up their Hallberg leases, Nemesa answered. They feel they're still the rightful holders, and they'll retaliate against any other house that takes advantage of your uncle's draconian measures. Draconian? Nemesa tilted her head. So the Varunas say, I wasn't here, so I really can't make a judgment about whether the Harmac was within his rights to expel House Varuna and confiscate their holdings. Garin snorted to himself. He didn't have any doubt of it, but of course he was a hallmaster. He decided that Nemesa wasn't in Hallberg to learn anything. She was here because her father trusted her to look after Sokol interests. Nemesa hadn't forgotten that he was a hallmaster, and despite the fact that she was riding through the middle of nowhere with a borrowed shirt and oversized cloak, she was careful to keep her thoughts to herself about her family's business. The rest of the morning passed by quietly enough. From time to time they talked of small things— Garin told Nemesa some of the stories he knew about the high fells and their brooding barrows, while Nemesa told him about events and doings in Flan. They saw no signs of Kraken Queen's crew, or any other travelers for that matter. Eventually they struck the Thenchin trail Garin was looking for, and two hours more brought them to the edge of the Winterspear Vale, a couple of miles north of Hallberg itself. As Garin had promised, they came to the burned bridge over the winter spear in the early afternoon. Hallberg itself lay south of the old bridge, a ramshackle town bustling with commerce and trade. Here, where the winter spear emptied into the moon sea, an older city had stood hundreds of years ago. The town of Hallberg was built atop its ruins. On the east bank of the river, the castle of Griffinwatch, home of the Hallmasters, overlooked the town's landward edge, guarding against attack from the wild lands of Thar. The trade yards and concessions of the foreign merchant companies stood mostly on the west bank, hard by the town's wharves. A steady stream of wagons and carts pushed out along the road leading inland, ferrying provisions and tools to the camps outside of town. The ruins of an old city wall meandered around the edge of the town, but stonemasons were at work in various spots. Harmac Grigor was pouring most of the tower's new-found wealth into repairing the old defenses. Garin stole a glance at Nemesa's face, trying to read her reaction to her first sight of the town. She frowned, perhaps taking in the unpaved roads or the smoking smelters. It's not quite as cheerless as it looks, he told her. The streets down by the bayside are a little more, well, civilized. She summoned a small smile. It's busy, she observed. That's a good sign. Besides, I've been told that the lodgings in the Sokol concession are fairly comfortable. I'll be fine. Then she nodded off to Garin's left. It looks like there was a fire. 
Garin followed her gaze. Near the spot where the Vale Road passed through the ancient walls stood a large wooden building on a footing of old stone. One corner was scorched, and a patch of the wooden shakes over that part of the building was missing. A thin plume of smoke rose from a hole in the roof. "'The troll and tankard,' he said with a frown. "'A tavern? The best ale in Holberg. They rode by slowly. A number of workmen were busy with the work of tearing down the ruined siding with hatchets and saws. Several more stood watch over the scene, each with a blue cloth tied around the arm. Garin spotted Brun Osting, the tavern-keeper, studying the scene with his thick arms folded across his chest and a fierce scowl on his bearded face. Brun had run the troll and tankard ever since his father died fighting to stop the bloody skull orcs from pillaging the town five months past. Garin detoured closer and hailed him. "'What happened here, Brun?' The tavern-keeper looked around. He was a young man of strapping build, easily two or three inches taller than Garin, and fifty pounds heavier. "'My lord Garin, and my lady,' he said, touching his knuckle to his brow. If he was surprised to see Garin riding with a pretty young woman in the front of his saddle, he didn't say anything. "'It was the Cinderfists. A gang of them tried to fire the troll during the night, but they made enough noise to rouse my brothers. We drove them off and saved most of the building.' Garin studied the damage and frowned. "'Anyone hurt?' "'The Cinderfists carried off two or three of theirs, but I don't think no one got killed. My brother Stunder took a bad cut, but he's patched up now.' Brun Austing shook his head. "'There's trouble in the making, my lord. Mark my words. The Cinderfists try burning out good Hullbergans again, and there'll be killing over it.' "'I hear you,' Garin said. Is there anything I can do to help? The hallmasters are in your family's debt. The young brewer waved his hand. It's just a few hours' work to cut some new shakes and planks, my lord. The troll wasn't that handsome to look at anyway, but I'll bet the smell of smoke's going to be in the rafters for years. Garin shook his head and rode off, allowing the brewer to get back to his morning's work. When they were out of earshot, Nemessa glanced up at him. "'Who are the Cinderfists?' she asked. "'You might call them a guild, or militia, or you might call them a gang. "'They're mostly newcomers to Hullberg, men from places like Melvaunt and Mullmaster. "'Many work in the smelters and foundries.' "'During the troubles of the past spring, Garin had spurred the common folk of Hullberg "'to band together against the mercenaries of the foreign merchants.' It hadn't taken long for the poorer foreigners to copy their example, and begin organizing their own guilds and militias to protect themselves, too. The Moon Shields, the native Hullbergen militia, were loyal to the Harmac. The Cinderfists, on the other hand, were largely dependent on foreign merchants for their livelihood. "'I can't prove anything, but I suspect House Janarsk and their Crimson Chain allies are behind them.' Hullberg is full of poor men from other cities who just want a chance to do better for themselves, but there are a few that came here for different sorts of opportunities. Have they caused a lot of trouble? Some, Garin admitted, but Brun Austing's right. There's more on the way if things keep going on as they are. They rode into the small square at the foot of the causeway leading up to Griffin Watch. Garin reined in again and looked down at Nemessa. "'Can I offer you the hospitality of Griffin Watch? "'I'm sure that we can find you something better to wear, "'or would you rather go to your family's holding now?' "'The Sokol Concession, please,' Nemessa answered. "'I have to tell our people there about White Wing "'and send word to my father right away. "'But I thank you for the offer.' "'As you wish. "'Consider it a standing invitation.' "'Garin hid his disappointment behind a small nod.' He found that he was reluctant to part company so soon. Once he escorted her to the Sokol compound, she would be back among the people and surroundings she was familiar with. He'd check on her in a few days, and if she recovered as well as he thought she might, then he'd leave her be. It would likely be for the best. Then again, he'd been haunted for almost two years now by the memories of Allier. 
Maybe some part of him was hoping that Nemessa was not interested, simply so that he could go on dreaming about the elf princess he would never see again. Or was he afraid of what Mirja Erstenwold might think if he were to start courting again? He frowned behind Nemessa, unhappy with his musings. He'd never been one to puzzle out the workings of his own heart. All he knew— was that he'd spent two years living like a cloistered monk because Allier had broken his heart, and Nemessa Sokol reminded him that he wanted to be free of her ghost. He tapped his heels to the horse's flanks. The Sokol trade yard's not far off now. Allow me to see you home. 3. Fourteen Elint, The Year of the Ageless One 1479 D.R. Rovan de Sarnel detested his human guise. He was mortified by the unkindnesses of age, the heaviness of his sagging features, the rough whiskers on his face, and the wiry gray hair on his chest and arms. Elves suffered none of those indignities, and in his natural shape Rovan was a fine example of his graceful race. He consoled himself with the thought that his disguise was only a magical glamour he could end any time he chose with a few arcane words. But the difficulty was that crafting a persona as carefully thought out as Lestanor, middle-aged, balding, with a meticulously squared beard of iron grey and a coarse, dusky complexion, required hours of painstaking work. The trouble of recreating his disguise was a strong incentive to endure his altered appearance as long as he could, and there was always the risk that he'd overlook some small detail, like the exact shape of the nose, or whether the rounded ears lay flat by the skull or stuck out like cup handles, a detail that some observant enemy might notice. Fortunately, he'd had the foresight to make Lestanor as close to his own natural height and build as possible, so that he would have one less opportunity to err. No human could really match the slender athleticism of a moon elf, but Rovan avoided trouble there simply by shaping Lestanor's build as gaunt, and by making a point of moving with a sort of exaggerated lethargy to conceal the lightness of his step. He was nothing, if not attentive to details. "'You have a sour look to you to-day, Lestanor,' said Lord Maroth Marstall. The Halbergen and his house-mage rode in the human noble's carriage, rolling through the streets of Halberg toward the castle of the Hullmasters. Marstall peered suspiciously at Rovan with weak eyes in a red, heavy-featured face. He was a thick-bodied, white-jowled man of sixty-five years or so, with a thick mane of hair and a broad white moustache that was yellowed at the edges by his ridiculous habit of pipe-smoking. The old lord wore a scarlet tunic embroidered with his family coat of arms, which featured a leaping stag amid a whole field of gold embellishments. "'What troubles you?' "'Nothing of consequence.' Rovan lied, feigning a friendly grimace. "'Something disagrees with me, my lord.' Of course, it was Marstall himself Rovan found disagreeable. The man possessed a truly spectacular combination of loud bluster, ox-like wit, and ill-informed opinion. He seemed to crash through his days like a wagon rolling down a steep hill, completely insensitive to the damage he caused. If Rovan hadn't given himself the task of elevating the man's fortunes, he might have looked on the whole affair with some small amusement. As matters stood, Rovan had spent several months now soothing feathers Marstall ruffled every time he opened his mouth, and safeguarding the buffoon who sat in the carriage next to him from even greater disasters. "'You're a scrawny fellow, and you hardly eat at all,' Marstall observed. "'I can't imagine why your stomach should trouble you. "'I think it's a lack of exercise and fresh air, and not enough wine. Two good goblets a day would serve you well.' "'The white-haired lord nodded to himself, satisfied that he had diagnosed the problem. 
"'Yes, that must be it. "'You should come hunting with me tomorrow. "'It's always a good, vigorous day.' "'Rovan sighed. "'I am afraid I have business to look after, my lord. "'But you should go ahead without me. "'As you say, the outings are good for you.' Marstall's idea of a vigorous day of hunting was to be driven up some wild field and seated in a comfortable chair while his servants did their best to drive game in his general direction. The old lord would spend the day getting drunk and loosing quarrels at anything that moved. While one might naturally assume that Marstall rarely hit anything, the man was a far better shot than he had a right to be, and he often collected a fair assortment of game. He also occasionally feathered one of his own dogs or beaters, especially late in the day after he was well in his cups. Fortunately, Hullberg had no shortage of poor foreigners anxious to earn a few coins any way they could. "'Suit yourself, then,' Marstall said with a sniff. Rovan sighed. Now the old fool was going to be sore at him. Only a month or two more, he told himself. Endure this ox-brained fool just a little longer, and through him the fall of the hullmasters will be encompassed. He flexed the cold metal of his silver hand, veiled under the illusion of human flesh and bone, and thought of Garin Hullmaster's destruction. To slay Garin for the injuries he'd inflicted would be simple justice. What Rovan craved was vengeance. No, before Garin Hullmaster died, Rovan meant for his enemy to see all that he loved torn away from him. Only then would the scales lie in balance between the two of them. For that worthy end, a few months of tedious and unpleasant work were a trifle. The carriage came to the causeway leading up to the castle of the Hullmasters and climbed up the roadway. In a few moments they rolled into the cobblestone courtyard inside Griffin Watch's front gate and halted. Liveried footmen hopped down from the carriage's running boards to open the door and set wooden steps for the passengers. Rovan climbed out and settled into the shuffling gate that was almost second nature to him now. Marstall followed him. Several other coaches were already gathered in the courtyard, and another rolled in just behind Marstall's carriage. He leaned close to Marstall and gripped the old man's arm in his hand. Silently he brought the enchantments that bound the two of them together to the forefront of his mind and bent the power of his will on their invisible connection. "'Speak only as I have instructed you.' he whispered into Marstall's ear. If you do not know how to answer a question, stay silent and give an appearance of careful thought. I will tell you what to say. The old man murmured in protest and tried to resist the enchantment's power, but his will was no match for Rovan's. The wizard crushed his brief resistance without even breaking stride. Marstall stared ahead and nodded. I understand. They entered the castle's great hall, which was already arranged for the meeting of the Harmax Council. A horseshoe-shaped table with nine chairs had been set up in the center of the drafty old hall, facing a low dais with a large, high-backed chair for the ruler of Hallberg. Rovan steered Marstall toward the old lord's seat, then sat beside him. In his guise as Lestanor, Rovan himself held the post of Master Mage of Hullberg. The former Master Mage, Ebane Ravenscar, had resigned his post shortly after House Faruna's expulsion from Hullberg and returned to his home in Mullmaster. Marstall, on Rovan's right, was head of the town's merchant council, as well as one of Hullberg's few native lords, although Rovan found Lord Marath Marstall's claim to nobility dubious at best. Most of the other councillors were already present. Rovan studied each surreptitiously. He did not believe that his magical domination of Marstall, or his own human guise, were detectable by anything less than a thorough study by one skilled in the arcane arts, as long as he made sure that Marstall continued to act in character. But the consequences of being caught in his game might be severe. He paid the closest attention to Kara Hallmaster, who sat directly across the horseshoe from him. 
She held the seat reserved for the captain of the shield sworn, commander of Hullberg's tiny army. Kara worried Rovan greatly. Despite her youth, she was quite perceptive. Kara carried a spell scar in the form of a serpent like sigil on her left forearm and possessed eyes of an eerie, luminous azure hue. In many lands, the spell scarred were looked on with distrust and resentment, but no one in Hullberg doubted Kara's loyalty or skill. She was a Hullmaster, and by all accounts a very formidable warrior, the hero of the Battle of Linden's Dyke. Rovan could never entirely convince himself that she did not see more than she let on with her spell-scarred eyes, and he did not care for that feeling at all. "'The Harmac!' called one of the shield-sworn guards in the room. All of the councillors dutifully rose to their feet and waited while Harmac Gregor Hallmaster, leaning on his cane, made his way down the grand staircase of the hall and took his seat in the large chair on the dais. Garin Hallmaster walked beside his uncle, dressed in a quilted doublet of grey and white. It did not escape Rovan's attention that the sword with the mithril rose on its pommel rode at Garin's hip. His right wrist ached with a hot white pain. Flesh and bone remembered the sharp bite of that sword. Rovan clenched his fists beneath the table. To have been maimed by the human sword mage was one thing. After all, if he'd had it in his power, Rovan would have done the same thing to Garin during that fateful duel in Myth Dranor. But the offense that truly galled Rovan was the fact that Garin's exile from the city of Song had led to his own. The exquisite Allier had not turned her heart to him, as she should have once the upstart human adventurer had been dealt with, and the coronel's guard had found reason to pry into his arcane studies after his duel with Garin. They discovered books and ritual materials they considered unseemly for a mage of Mithdranor, spurned by the woman he desired, chastised for studying dark arts. Rovan had lost more than his hand to Garin Hallmaster's blade, and he meant to settle that account before the year was out. Rovan realized that he was glaring at Garin, and quickly looked away. Garin had no reason to fear Lestanor the master mage of Hullberg and wizard to House Marstall, but if he noticed that Lestanor glared hatefully at him, he would be a fool not to wonder why. Instead, Rovan shifted his gaze to the Harmac. Grigor was a balding man of seventy-five, with weak eyes and frail health. With some care, he seated himself and leaned his cane against the side of his chair. As he sat, the councillors followed suit. "'Welcome, my friends,' Grigor said. "'You may proceed.' Garin Hallmaster walked over to one of the benches along the side of the hall and sat down alongside the scribes and clerks who were in attendance. Darren Ilker nodded and struck a small gavel to the table. "'The Harmax Council is met,' he said. He was the Keeper of Duties, the nominal head of the Council, since he directly represented the Harmac. Ilker was a newcomer to the Harmax Council, and had held his seat for only two months, since that post had formerly belonged to Sergen Hallmaster, a common-born Hallbergen who ran his counting-house with unflinching honesty, Ilker was a short, black-bearded man who wore a gold chain of office over his heart. First on the agenda, the construction of the city wall, he began. Rovan leaned back in his seat and waited, while Ilker efficiently ran through the various affairs of interest to the council. Most of the business was routine, and he paid little attention. In half an hour they covered brief reports about the state of the tower's treasury, the replacement of shield-sworn killed or crippled during the Blood Skull War, the continuing disposition of House Varuna assets, and the growing disorder between gangs of common-born Hullbergans and the poor foreigners who seemed to collect in the town's neglected districts. He sat up and listened more carefully to that last report. Kara Hallmaster described how several brawls had turned lethal in the last few ten days. 
I frankly don't know if I have enough shield sworn to keep the peace, she added. By my count, the cinder fists might number as many as a hundred men, and I'd wager they could turn out two or three times that number if they put a call out to all the foreigners in the tailings or out on the east point. "'Something must be done, Lady Cara,' said Burkle Tresterfin. A farmer of old Hulbergen stock and a captain of the spear meet, he was also new to the council. "'Cinderfists tried to burn down the troll and tanker the other day. The common folk of Hulberg are at the end of their patience. If you don't act soon, the moon shields will take matters into their own hands. It'll be a bloody riot.' "'Enough,' Harmac Grigor said. We certainly can't allow matters to go that far. Kara, find me someone who can speak for these cinder fists, and I'll promise to hear him out. If they will forswear rioting and violence, perhaps we can find some way to answer their grievances. He pressed a hand to his forehead and leaned back in his seat. We have other matters that we must discuss today. Master Ilkor, "'My nephew has news for the council.' The keeper of duties bowed slightly. "'As you wish, my lord Harmac. Lord Garin, the floor is yours.' Garin stood and walked around the table to stand in the open end of the horseshoe, clasping his hands behind his back. He looked around the table, brow creased, as if he were trying to decide where to start. Then he said, "'I'm afraid that other troubles are on our doorstep, good sirs.' Three days ago, while riding home from Thentia, I came across a pirate vessel that had captured a Sokol ship. They were drawn up in a cove a few miles east of the ruins at Gazeth. The pirates were plundering the Sokol cargo. They'd already dealt with all the crew and passengers, save one. He went on to tell a tale of spying on the pirates, giving details of the pirate ship and her crew, and then, matter-of-factly, describing his rescue of a daughter of the Sokols out from under the noses of her captors. "'I can only guess that they are lying in wait along our trade routes,' he finished. "'Any ship sailing to or from Hullberg is in danger.' "'A grim tale, indeed,' said Theron Nimstar. He was the city's high magistrate, an old servant of the Harmac with a stout body, heavy jowls, and a keen mind. "'You are to be commended for saving Lady Sokol. That was a bold stroke.' "'Most likely the pirates were all dead drunk by that point,' Rovan thought. He knew he shouldn't underestimate Garin Hullmaster's talents, but he wouldn't have been surprised if a dolt like Marath Marstall couldn't have saved the girl in those circumstances.' Well, it was no matter. Rovan had heard the rumors within hours of Garin's return, so he'd expected this report for two days now, and he was ready to reply. Keeping his gaze directed toward the sword-mage, Rovan concentrated on Marath Marstall, sitting next to him. "'Now, Marstall,' he said silently, "'speak.' "'I've something to say,' Marath Marstall rumbled. Ilker nodded to Marstall. "'The floor is yours, my lord.' The old lord rose slowly to his feet. "'Piracy in our waters is intolerable. The Merchant Council demands action to protect our trade against the depredations of pirates. The Sokol ship makes five lost in the last three months. We are being ruined by these murderous attacks. The lost cargoes are bad enough.' But need I remind the Council that dozens, no, scores, of our sailors have been slaughtered mercilessly? Marstall banged his meaty fist on the table, warming up to his customary volume. In truth, he needed little coaching from Rovan in bombast. All the elf-mage had had to do was throw the old fool an issue to fire his imagination. "'We're pouring a fortune into city walls to deter an enemy that we have already defeated, while we are being pillaged on the high seas. I know of three merchant companies that cannot afford to lose one more cargo. They'll be ruined in the next attack, and if our merchant companies fail, then they'll no longer pay the Harmac to cut his timber, they'll no longer pay the good folk of Hullberg for their work, and they'll no longer sell their wares in our streets.' 
disaster sails toward us, my lords and ladies, with cutlasses dripping blood and corpses in its wake, and yet we have done nothing. So when does the Harmac intend to take action? Ilker did not answer immediately, nor did anyone else. Perhaps they weren't sure if Marstall had meant the last question to be rhetorical or not. Rovan hid a smile. The last bit about cutlasses and corpses was pure Marstall bombast. The old man had been caught up in his own topic, as Rovan had expected he might be. Harmac Grigor sighed and looked at the old noble. "'Lord Marstall, what would you have us do? Sweep these corsairs from the moon sea and secure our livelihood. In case it escaped my lord's attention—' "'I do not command a navy,' Grigor answered. "'Then you must begin outfitting warships immediately. "'The Merchant Council insists on nothing less.' "'Navies are expensive,' Walrath Keltor objected. "'He was the Keeper of Keys, the official who looked after the Harmax treasury. "'Rovan found him a sour and querulous old man. "'We cannot simply wish one into existence, Lord Marstall. "'Nevertheless, if the Harmac will not see to the safety of our commerce, then the Merchant Council will take steps to do so under its own authority, said Marstall. It is a matter of self-defense. Grigor's eyes narrowed. Clearly he recognized the danger to his authority implicit in Marstall's threat. Only a few months ago he'd almost been unseated by the Merchant Council under the leadership of his treacherous nephew, Sergan. "'You are welcome to arm your ships as you like, and crew them with whatever guards you can afford,' he said. "'But you have no authority to act in my place, Marstall. I am charged with the defense of this realm, not you.' "'I hesitate to suggest it,' Darren Ilker said. "'But is there some arrangement that can be made? Bribing the pirates to let our ships pass unmolested might be less costly than outfitting warships to deter them.' "'That leaves a bad taste in my mouth,' Garin Hallmaster said. The sword-mage shook his head. "'Forgive me for speaking out of turn, but those arrangements have a way of growing more expensive over time, and you'd still lose ships every so often, because you can't bribe every pirate on the moon sea. "'If bribery isn't an option, then how can we best defend our sea trade?' Burkle Tresterfin asked. Can we guard the merchant coster ships with detachments of shield sworn, or do we do as Lord Marstall suggests and build warships? We don't have shield sworn enough to man every ship sailing from Hallberg, Kara Hallmaster said. She leaned back in her chair, thinking. For that matter, even if we could afford to build warships, I don't know how we could crew them. It would take at least two or three well-armed vessels to secure the waters near Hullberg. We would need several hundred sailors and soldiers. Impossible, Walrath Keltor said. We haven't the treasury. So we can't afford a navy, and we don't believe bribery is the answer. What is left to us, then? The magistrate Nimstar asked. No one spoke for a long moment. Rovan nodded to himself. Even if the Hulbergans had settled on building a navy, it would take too long and cost too much to interfere with his designs. "'There are other cities on the Moon Sea that maintain fleets,' he said into the silence. "'Perhaps we could ask Mullmaster or Hillsfar for protection?' "'That may prove more costly than building our own fleet,' Harmac Grigor said. "'If we surrender our sovereignty for the protection of a larger city, we will never recover it.' I consider that the last alternative. Rovan willed Marstall to silence. He'd intended to catch the Harmac in exactly this predicament, forcing him to choose between embarking on an expensive and most likely impractical scheme of fleet building, or weakening his authority by begging for another city's help. Either way, the Harmac opened himself to sharp criticism. The disguised elf leaned forward to speak. "'In that case, my Lord Harmac, I must add my concerns to Lord Marstall's. What do you intend to do?' Grigor Hallmaster gazed at the squares of blue sky outside the great hall's tall windows. He might have been old and frail, but he was not stupid. 
he could see the dilemma confronting him. "'It must be a fleet, then,' he finally said. "'We'll purchase a couple of suitable hulls in Hillsfar or Melvaunt, "'and bring them back to Hullberg for fitting out. "'For the crew, I suppose we'll have to hire mercenaries.' Two ships may not be enough to protect our sea trade,' Kara said. "'Even if you assume that each can remain at sea half the time, "'it's only one ship on patrol on any given day.' "'No, I expect it is not enough, Kara. "'But I hope that two warships are sufficient to serve as a deterrent,' Grigor said. "'He looked around at the assembled council members.' I hope you all understand that the tower must find funds for this somewhere. To begin with, I expect that rents must be raised on mining and logging concessions. Proceed with care, my lord Harmac, Marstall warned. It doesn't matter to the houses of the Merchant Council if they are ruined by piracy or taxation. Ruin is ruin. You demand the Harmac's protection for your shipping, but you balk at paying for the forces necessary to safeguard you? Kara snapped. You can't have it both ways, Lord Marstall. Where else should the Harmac obtain the funds to pay for a fleet, if not from the merchant costers that will profit by the protection a fleet offers? Rovan opened his mouth to counter the shield-sworn captain's point, but Garin Hullmaster shook his head and turned to address his uncle. "'Perhaps there is an alternative to a standing navy,' the sword-mage said. "'Instead of building enough warships to defend our sea trade from every possible pirate attack, "'we should search out the pirates' lair and destroy them there. "'A single expedition of one or two ships might do as much to protect our trade in a month "'as a fleet of four or five ships could do in years of patrols.' "'Yes, Lord Garin, but where would you start?' "'Darren Ilker asked. "'The sword mage shrugged. "'Crocken Queen. "'The Moon Sea isn't that large. "'She can't hide for long against a determined search. "'As for other pirates, we should invest in information. "'Spread some gold around in ports like Mulmaster or Melvaunt. "'Hire some harbor watchers, and we'll know soon enough where our enemies are hiding. "'We'll need a ship and crew,' Kara said. The Merchant Council's cargoes are at stake. They can spare some armsmen, and you can spare a few shield-sworn Kara. For the rest, I'd wager that we can find plenty of volunteers from the Moon Shields. Garin smiled. As for the ship, well, House Veruna left Sea Drake behind when they chose to relocate their operations to Mullmaster. She's in need of repairs, but she could be ready to sail within a ten-day. "'You're willing to command her, Garin?' Harmac Grigor asked. Garin thought for a moment. "'Yes, provided I get the funds I need to repair and crew the ship. I can't promise that I'll stop all the attacks. But if we catch a pirate or two, the rest might turn to easier prey.' The Harmac glanced over to Marstall. "'Lord Marstall, does the Merchant Council find Garin's proposal acceptable?' Rovan directed the old lord to strike an attitude of thoughtful deliberation, while he quickly considered the question. Garin had stumbled upon a course of action that seemed reasonable, and certainly did not require the Harmac to beg help from another city, or levy ruinous taxes against his merchants or his people. That was irksome. But if Garin's search proved fruitless, he would be disgraced and the Harmac could be attacked for failing to take effective action. It might be highly useful to allow Garin to chase his own tail around the Moon Sea for the next few ten days. In fact, Rovan could see to it that rumors were deliberately planted in out-of-the-way places just for the purpose of wasting Garin's time, and he knew something about the pirates threatening Hullberg that Garin did not know. Once he considered the suggestion— it seemed that Garin had unwittingly proposed a scheme that Rovan would have been hard-pressed to improve upon. Realizing that Marath Marstall had been thinking things over just a little too long, Rovan directed the old lord to reply, "'One ship is hardly a fleet, my lord Harmac. 
but we will withhold judgment on the merits of the plan until Garen puts an end to Croc and Queen, or we lose another ship to the depredations of those murderous sea wolves. Garen frowned, weighing the deadline Marstall had imposed on him. After all, he had no way of knowing how long he had before pirates took another Hulbergen ship. I'll do my best, Lord Marstall, he said. Darren Ilker looked around at the assembled councillors. Is there any other business before the council? he asked. No one spoke up. The keeper of duties took his gavel and rapped it sharply on the table. Then the council is adjourned. Once again, everyone stood as Harmac Grigor rose and made his way up the stairs leading from the hall. Then half a dozen low conversations started as the councillors and their various advisers and assistants began filing from the hall. Rovan watched Garin stride purposefully to the door, already speaking with Kara Hullmaster. Would it be better to help him along his way, or delay him? the elf wondered. Through the Merchant Council and Marath Marstall, he could speed his enemy's efforts to outfit his expedition and get him out of Hullberg quickly, or he could throw obstacles in Garin's path, keeping him mired in the effort to gather armsmen and supplies for a month or more. If Garin sailed off with a strong detachment of shield-sworn and Hullbergen loyalists, the Harmac's hand would be sorely weakened. That suggested several possibilities. "'The sooner the better, then,' Rovan murmured to himself. "'Eh? What did you say?' Marstall asked. "'Nothing of import, my lord,' he replied. "'I think House Marstall should generously support Garin Hallmaster's efforts to fit out his expedition.' There is not a moment to lose, after all. Marstall nodded. Of course. The pirates must be dealt with firmly and immediately. Delay is intolerable. Just so, my lord. Rovan gave Garin one more long look, wondering what the fool would do if he suspected that his old rival from Myth Dranor was standing only twenty feet away, planning the success or failure of his ill-conceived venture. Then he took Marstall by the elbow and guided the Hulbergen noble to his carriage. 4. 16 Elaint, the Year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. Two days after the meeting of the Harmax Council, Garin spent the morning on the quarter-deck of Sea Drake, watching as a crew of carpenters worked to replace the ship's mainmast. The old mast had been badly cracked in a spring gale months ago, which was one reason why House Faruna's cell swords had left Sea Drake behind when they sailed away from Hullberg. She'd been stripped of stores, canvas, rigging, and other such things, of course, but that could be remedied easily enough. Replacing a mainmast, on the other hand, was a tedious piece of work. Over the last two days, the Hullbergen woodworkers had cut away the cracked mast and built a temporary hoist to raise the new mast, a tall, straight spruce cut in the Galena foothills and seasoned for several years in a pond owned by House Marstall. Several dozen workers sweated and swore at each other as they manhandled the long, creaking lines, carefully lowering the new mast into the socket of the old one. The clatter of wheels on the cobblestones of the street drew Garin's attention. He glanced down as an open carriage halted by the gangway leading to Seadrake. A pair of armsmen, in the black and sky-blue of House Sokol, hopped down from the running boards as Nemessa Sokol descended from her seat. She looked splendid in a dress of burgundy velvet embroidered with golden flowers. To Garin's surprise, an undistinguished dwarf with a bald pate and a forked beard of iron grey climbed down from the carriage after her, dressed in common workman's garb. Nemessa glanced up and caught him watching her. She gave him a warm smile and started up the gangway with her strange companion at her side. Garin dropped down the steps leading to the main deck and went to meet her at the rail. "'I thought I might find you here.' she said. May we come aboard? Of course, but mind the work on the mast. Garin drew her past the working party and led her to a safe corner of the deck. This is an unexpected pleasure. What brings you down to Seadrake? 
"'I heard that you're looking for a sailing-master,' said Nemessa. "'I think I may have found you one. "'May I present Master Andirth Galehand? "'Master Galehand, this is Lord Garen Hullmaster.' Garen offered his hand, forearm to forearm, in the dwarf manner, and studied the fellow. Tattoos of dwarven runes spelled out indecipherable words on the dwarf's thick forearms, and like most dwarves, he didn't spare Garen the strength of his grip. "'My lord,' the dwarf said, "'Master Galehand came to House Sokol this morning, looking to sign on with us,' Nemessa said. "'I thought you might need a sailing-master for Seadrake.' "'I do. Are you certain you can spare him?' The half-elf nodded. "'We've already struck terms. But his first assignment for House Sokol is to take a post as your sailing-master if you'll have him, and I'll send along seasoned deckhands and armsmen, as many as you need, to fill out the ship's company.' Garin raised an eyebrow. "'That's very generous of House Sokol.' "'No, it's good common sense. The pirates are a problem, and Sokol ships aren't safe until they're defeated.' Nemesis' eyes flashed. "'Besides, I have a personal interest in seeing Croc and Queen dealt with. Anything House Sokol can provide is yours for the asking.' "'I've got Erstenwolds looking after our fittings and provisions, but I can certainly use your sailors and armsmen.' He turned back to the dwarf. "'Are you willing to sail under the Harmax flag, Master Galehand?' "'Aye, I've no quarrel with it.' The dwarf looked over to the crew, working on the mast, and nodded in grudging approval. "'Your carpenters seem to know what they're about. Her mast never was quite true afore. She ought to sail a sight better now.' "'You've sailed on Sea Drake before?' "'The dwarf gave him a fierce grin. "'I know this ship like me own beard. "'I was her sailing-master for five years. "'I've been wanting to see a new mainmast for a long time now. "'Sea Drake was a house Varuna ship. "'Were you a Varuna man, then?' "'Aye, but we parted ways four years ago. "'The double moon coster made me a better offer, so I jumped ship. "'I've been with them since, but now I'm needing a new billet.' "'Why'd you leave the double moon?' Garin asked. The dwarf made a sour face. "'Twasn't me notion. The double moon sacked me.' Garin glanced at Nemessa. She shrugged. He looked back to Galehand and said, "'That's not the sort of thing to inspire confidence.' "'Oh, I'm good enough at me job, Lord Hullmaster. I've sailed these waters for nigh on thirty years, half of that as a sailing-master.' "'No, the double moon decided to do without me services last month "'after I called one of the high guilders a dung-brained dunderhead "'and knocked him down.' "'Garin frowned. "'The sea-drake was in need of a sailing-master, "'but he wasn't anxious to saddle himself with a surly officer "'inclined to argue orders. "'I can see you're a plain-spoken dwarf,' he said carefully. "'What led you to do that?' "'You might recall.' "'a wicked set of thunderstorms that blew through early in Flammerule. "'We were southbound out of Melvaunt, thirty miles from Hillsfar. "'I came up on deck for me watch, "'and found that instead of turning our stern to the squall line "'and reefing the topsails, "'the high gilder had countermanded the captain "'and told the crew to crowd an all canvas and run across the wind. "'He'd some idea of trying to make Hillsfar "'before the storm caught up, I guess.' The squall line was hard on us by then, and it nearly set us on our beam ends. Galehand shook his head. After we set out a sea anchor and reefed in, I told the high gilder what I thought of him. He objected, and that's when I knocked him down. They paid me off the next day in Hillsfar. You're lucky the ship's captain didn't throw you in irons for striking one of the owners. Galehand snorted. "'Well, I think the captain would have liked to hit the High Gilder, too, truth be told.' Garin laughed. He didn't know a thing about Anderth Galehand, but the fellow had no fear of speaking his mind. And, if he was telling the truth, then it wasn't any lack of competence that had brought him to grief. "'All right, Master Galehand. You're my sailing master. I'll have the papers drawn up. Your first job will be to see to the rigging and the sail locker.' I mean to sail by the end of the ten-day, and I'll judge you by how quickly and how well you make Sea Drake ready for sea. Fair enough, Lord Hellmaster. If you can spare me for an hour, I'll fetch me kit and come back straight away. 
Very good, Master Gale Hand. The tattooed dwarf made his way back down the gangplank. Garin watched him depart, then glanced up at the sky. It was a little before noon, a fine, clear fall day with a light wind out of the west. You didn't have to bring him down here yourself, you know, he said to Nemesa. A word of introduction from you would have been fine. I suppose I'm still looking for a way to thank you for my life. Nemesa gave him a shy smile, then turned to run a hand over the gleaming wood of the ship's rail. You seem to be a man of many parts. Swordsman, wizard, and now sea captain, too. I've studied a few sword spells, I suppose, but that's all the wizardry I know. As far as sailing, well, before I came home this summer, I spent a year and a half with the red sail coster of Tantras, voyaging all over the sea of fallen stars. He laid his hand on Sea Drake's rail next to hers, and imagined that he felt the ship growing restless under his palm, like a good horse that was eager to run. Nemesa waited for him to continue, a small smile playing across her face. He found himself speaking again before he knew what he was saying. "'I have always longed to see new shores. I am not made to stand still for long, I think.' "'What drives you on?' "'It's certainly not my concern for red-sail business.' Hamel Alderhart emerged from the passage leading under the quarter-deck to the officers' cabins. The halfling wore a fine green doublet over a buff-colored shirt, with a matching cap to cover his long, russet braids. For as long as Garin had known him, Hamel had prided himself on his elegant clothing. "'Garin's not much of a merchant.' I did all the work, keeping the books and managing the buying and selling. He was really nothing more than a glorified wagon-driver. What brings you aboard, Sea Drake, my lady? Nemesa, this is my old comrade, Hamel Alderhart. We adventured together in the company of the Dragon Shield years ago, and bought owner's shares in the Red Sail Coster afterward, said Garin. He'd only stayed a short time before his wanderlust led him to Myth Draner, but Hamel had allowed him to buy back into the coster without a word of complaint when Garin returned to Tantras after his years in the coronal's service. Hamel, this is Nemesa Sokol, of House Sokol. She's come to Hullberg to take over the Sokol concession here. Hamel swept off his cap and bowed low before lifting Nemesa's fingers to his lips. I am charmed, my lady, he said. I see now why Garin took on a fleet of pirates for your honor. I would leap into a dragon's gullet for one as beautiful as you. Garin looked down to hide a smile. Hamel had never met a beautiful woman he could resist flattering, whether she stood a foot and a half taller than he or not. For her part, Nemesa laughed and blushed. I thank you for the thought, Master Alderhart, but let's hope that never becomes necessary. I am pleased to see you've rediscovered your eye for beauty, Hamel told Garin silently. He was a halfling of the ghostwise folk, and his people had the ability to speak without sound when they wanted to. If you won't court this one, I will myself. Garin ignored his friend's silent comments. Nemesa found a sailing master for us, he told Hamel. A dwarf by the name of Anderth Galehand. He was sailing master of Sea Drake for years. Good, said Hamel, but I'm surprised you'd take on a Varuna man, or dwarf. It was five years ago, and he seems to know Sea Drake. Besides, he's a dwarf, not a Malmasterite. The Varunas don't keep other folk in their confidences. Anderth was likely paid well, but he would have been given little authority or scope for action in pursuing the company's interests. That was one of House Varuna's weaknesses. They treated their hired hands like not-quite-trusted servants, and kept the best coin and real authority from all master rights with blood ties to the family. "'We still need a half-dozen sailors and a few more armsmen,' the halfling said, "'and we could use a pilot.' "'House Sokol will see to your deckhands,' Nemesa told Hamel. "'I'm certain I can find a few skilled armsmen for you, too.' "'Don't worry about a pilot,' Garin said. "'It's been a few years, but I know the moon sea well enough, "'and it seems our sailing-master does, too. "'I'll handle the navigation. "'If you get lost or run us up on a reef, "'I'll remind you that you said that,' Hamel replied. "'Oh, and one more thing. "'Initiate Mother Mara, 
sent word that she's directed a young friar named Larkin to sign on as the ship's curate. He's supposed to be here tomorrow. That's almost everyone, then, Karen said. I'm impressed, Hamel. I never would have imagined that you could gather a crew that quickly. The halfling shrugged. It wasn't my doing, Garen. When word got out that you'd be fitting out, people started lining up to sign on with you. How many will you sail with? Nemessa asked. Well, Sea Drake needs about twenty seamen to handle her comfortably, Garen answered. But we also need a large number of armsmen to deal with the pirates we hope to catch. So we'll have well over a hundred, counting the shield sworn and merchant house mercenaries. Is that enough to deal with Croc and Queen? Garen allowed himself a predatory grin. Oh, yes. If I can find her, I can finish her. It's just a matter of tracking her down. Good hunting, then. Nemessa stepped close and brushed her lips to Garen's cheek. I must be going. I still have much to put in order in our trade yard. Then she drew back, nodded to Hamel, and made her way back down the gangway to her waiting armsmen and carriage. The driver tapped his reins, and the carriage rolled away. Garin gazed after the coach. Absently, he lifted his hand to his cheek. "'I think that young woman is fond of you,' Hamel remarked. "'I suppose it's understandable. You have an unfair advantage, since you gallantly saved her from a fate worse than death. Damn the luck!' The sword-mage shook his head. "'I don't know. Even if you're right, well, how many times can I rescue her from pirates?' Hamel rolled his eyes. "'Trust me, Garin. It's a good start.' Garin tried to put Nemessa Sokol out of his mind. He looked over at the carpenters engaged with the work on the mainmast. The stepping of the mast was almost finished, but it would take hours to rig the stays, the braces, and the heavy tackle for the sails. There isn't much more we can do here. I need to check on the provisioning order at Erstenwold's. A fine suggestion, Hamel said. They paused to speak with Werthel, the ship's first mate, a wiry red-sail shipmaster of middle years from Tantras, one of a dozen red sails who'd volunteered to sail under the Harmax banner. After advising him to keep an eye open for Gale Hand, Garin and Hamel left to oversee the rest of the mast repairs and headed down the gangplank to the crowded wharves of Hullberg. Compared to some of the other cities on the Moon Sea, Hullberg was small and rustic. Laborers from a variety of foreign lands almost outnumbered the native Hullbergans. As they walked north up Plank Street, Garin and Hamel passed dwarves in their heavy boots and iron hauberks, Melvonchans and Thensians in the doublets and squared caps that were the fashion in those cities, and all sorts of clerks and scribes and armsmen in the colors of the various merchant companies who had concessions in Hullberg. In the ten years Garin had been away in the southern lands, Hullberg had filled up and overflowed. Even after five months he was still getting used to the sights and sounds of this bustling, broad-shouldered trade town that had mysteriously replaced the sleepy little town of his youth. They passed several groups of foreign laborers standing around on corners or waiting by storefronts, waiting for work, or so Garin guessed. People came to Hullaberg from all over the Moon Sea to seek their fortunes, since the timber camps and mines of the foothills offered a chance to earn a wage. They were poor, desperate men, gaunt and hollow-eyed, with tattered cloaks and threadbare clothing. Some had spent their whole lives drifting from one city to another, wandering Faerun in search of some place to call home. When they crossed Cart Street, Garin noticed a commotion to his right. A band of a dozen dirty men in ragged cloaks marched down the center of the street, pushing other passers-by aside. Most carried cudgels or short staves, with knives or short swords thrust through their belts. Their left hands were wrapped in gray strips of cloth with a broad, sooty smear across the back of the hand. Townsfolk muttered and glared at them as they shoved through the crowds, but the ruffians paid them no mind. Garin tapped Hamel's shoulder to get his attention. "'Cinder fists,' he said in a low voice. "'I don't think I've seen them in the mercantile district before. What are they doing here?' "'Looking for trouble, as far as I can tell,' Hamel answered. He looked around. 
Just as well there aren't any moon shields nearby. I think we'd have front row seats for a riot. The two paused and watched the gang members pass. Most of the other people in the street hurried on by, avoiding the eyes of the cinder fists and steering well clear of their path. Garin stood his ground, which earned him a few hostile glares from the ruffians. But he and Hamel were both well armed, and their clothes marked them as men of high station. The cinderfists either knew who Garin was, or weren't quite so bold as to accost gentlemen in the middle of Hullberg's trade district. Garin met the eyes of one cinderfist, a tall, lank-haired fellow with bad teeth and a sallow cast. The man snorted as if amused by Garin's attention, and muttered something to his comrades as he sauntered past. Several snickered. "'I don't like the look of the tall one,' Hamel said silently. "'I've got half a mind to teach him some manners.' "'Leave him be for now,' Garin answered. "'They're not breaking any law of the Harmax. Not yet, at least.' "'A technicality,' Hamel answered. But he smiled pleasantly at the ruffians and allowed them to continue on their way. The grey-cloaked men wandered on down Cart Street, leaving the two companions behind. "'You'd think a dozen fellows like that ought to have some trade to practice in the middle of the day,' Garin said. Hamel nodded. "'The Varunas employed hundreds. When the house pulled out of Holberg, they just left their woodcutters and miners and drivers and the rest to fend for themselves. No wonder some of them have fallen in with the Cinderfist gang.' "'What choice did the Harmac have? He couldn't let House Varuna stay after they helped Sergan in the attempt to unseat him.' "'No, he couldn't.' Hamel admitted. Your uncle did what Darcy Varuna forced him to do. But until some more trade costers or merchant houses take over Varuna camps, those cinderfists won't have anything to do other than stand around on street corners and trouble passers-by. That isn't so easy as it seems. Nemesa told me that House Varuna threatened retaliation against any other Moonsea companies that buy up their former rights. Garin fell silent thinking over the cinderfist situation. His friend was right about the unintended consequences of House Faruna's exile, but there was more to it than that. He'd also heard stories of cinderfists threatening or beating other foreigners in search of work, pushing them to either join their movement or leave Hullberg and search for prospects elsewhere. A thought struck him, and he looked down at Hamel. Had the Varunas threatened the red sails anywhere? Us? Hamel shook his head. No, I would have told you if I'd heard anything like that. You're a stakeholder, after all. But if you want my guess, I'd say that the Varunas have already assumed we're no friends of theirs. True enough. Garin clapped Hamel on the shoulder. They walked on another half-block and came to the sign for Erston Wold's provisioners, which hung above a large, somewhat ramshackle, old wooden building. Several clerks and customers counted, haggled, or carried goods in and out of the store. Business had been good for the Erston Wold store in the months since House Varuna's banishment from Hullmaster. No one was extorting native Hullbergen establishments any more. The wary truce between the large foreign merchant companies and native Hullbergen establishments was holding. Only now there was the cinderfist situation to complicate matters, Garin reminded himself. Garin and Hamel took the steps up to the old wooden porch and pushed their way into the store proper. A long wooden counter ran the length of the room on the right side, with a familiar clutter of stocked shelves and various pieces of tack and harness hanging on the walls. The uneven floorboards were worn to a glossy polish by decades of foot traffic, and dust motes drifted in the sunlight, slanting through the windows. Garin had always liked the place. The old wood, the fresh leather, and the pipe leaf all blended into a rich, comfortable aroma. Miriam he called. A tall, dark-haired woman, with her hair tied back in a long braid, looked up from her ledger-keeping at a small standing desk behind the counter. She wore a plain dress of blue wool and a stern expression on her face, but she smiled when she caught sight of them. She closed her ledger and came over to the countertop. "'Here to see to your order? It's not even been two days, you know.' "'The carpenters were about ready to throw Garin overboard,' Hamel answered. "'We thought it might be best to let them oversee themselves for an hour or two. 
So you decided to trouble me instead, Miria snorted. Well, you'll be glad to hear that I've almost all of your ship's goods laid aside in the storehouse. Provisions, canvas, plenty of line, bedding, lumber, casks of ale, spars, hand tools, oakum, pitch. Here, come around the counter and I'll show you. Garin and Hamel stepped around the long counter and followed Miria into the storehouse that adjoined her shop. Large doors stood open to the street outside, allowing the afternoon light to stream in. Barrels and wooden crates lay stacked up in orderly rows on the dusty old floorboards. "'I fear the Harmacks to pay dearly for all of this,' Miria said. "'To fill C. Drake's hold in the time you gave me, I had to pay half again what I should have. It was no help that all of Hallberg knew that I had to have your provisions as soon as they could be found.' "'My uncle knows you wouldn't cheat him,' Garin said." He paced down one of the aisles, glancing over the assembled material. It filled a substantial part of the Erstenwold storehouse, and Miria's clerks were wheeling in more tubs and barrels as he watched. It seemed hard to believe that it would all fit below the decks of the ship, down by the old Varuna docks, but he knew from experience that ships could carry a lot more than one might expect. "'I'm amazed you found this much in Hullberg in just the last two days. "'Is there anything important you couldn't find?' "'I've only half the canvas here that you should carry,' Miria said. "'I've sent word to provisioners in Thentia and Mulmaster, quietly, of course, "'to see if I can get my hands on more, but I doubt I'll have it before you mean to set out. "'You'll want to be careful of your sails. "'I hope your new sailing-master knows his business,' Hamel said." Garin nodded. The winter storms are still two months off. With good fortune, we won't see any bad gales until after we've had a chance to fill the sail locker. He looked over to Miria. I'll have my crew send up a working party first thing in the morning. We'll have most of this cleared out of your storehouse by supper time tomorrow. We'll be ready. Miria looked over the provisions and shook her head a little. Strange to do business with you, Garin. All the years I've known you— and I have never thought of you as the sort of man who'd take an interest in it. You always seem to be cut from a different sort of cloth. The indolent nobility? The brooding romantic? Hamel asked. I certainly don't trust him with anything important for the red sails. Garin laughed. It was true enough. My thanks, Hamel. I didn't mean I thought him too lazy for it, Miria said. Too impatient, perhaps. Too anxious to be off to the next thing, whatever that happened to be. He used to be a hard one to keep anchored for long. Four years in Myth Dranor taught me a few things, Garin said. He glanced down at the rose-shaped pommel and mithril wire of the sword hilt at his belt. He'd won it in the service of the coronel. Somehow he doubted that many of Ilseville Miratar's armathors had spent much time in storehouses such as Erstenwold's. I suppose I'm not the man I used to be. No, you're not. You're a better man. Miria gave him a lopsided smile. Salsha and I mean to see you off when you set sail. Take care of yourself while you're chasing after pirates, Garin, Hallmaster. I'm becoming used to having you around again. I will, he promised her. 5. 19 Alight, the Year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. Sea Drake sailed on the morning tide three days after Garin's visit to the Erstenwold storehouse. As promised, Miria and her daughter Salsha came down to the wharves to see them off along with a couple hundred prominent Hulbergans and curious onlookers, including Nemesis Sokol and Harmak Grigor, who was driven down from Griffin Watch in an open carriage. Garin enjoyed the fanfare until Hamel punctured his mood by pointing out that all of the Moonsea would know of Sea Drake's sailing within five days. They wouldn't be surprising any enemies for the foreseeable future. The breeze was light and fitful. The caravel nosed her way slowly past the spectacular arches guarding Hullberg's harbor. In the morning light, the soaring columns of stone seemed to glow with an emerald luminescence. As Hullberg receded behind them, the breeze freshened and Seadrake began to throw back a small wave from her bow. 
Master Gale Hand, make your course south by southwest, Garin told the dwarf. Hold that for an hour or so, and then bring her around to a northwesterly course. We're going to keep in sight of land and work westward until we pass Thencha. I doubt Croc and Queen is still on this shore, but we might as well make sure she isn't. Aye, Lord Garin, the dwarf replied. He shouted orders at the sailors on deck, followed by colorful oaths in dwarvish as the untried crew set about their work. Garin retreated to the lee side of the quarter-deck, and left Gale Hand to supervise the watch, leaning against the rail to observe the crew at work, while he considered his course. Sarth Cool Reiser climbed up onto the quarter-deck and glanced at the town, falling into the distance behind them. The tiefling was an intimidating sight, with ruddy red skin and black horns sweeping back from his forehead. At his belt hung a long scepter of iron marked with golden glyphs. Garin knew they held powerful spells of battle and ruin. Sarth was a talented sorcerer. Hardly any breeze to speak of, Sarth observed. We might as well have waited for better winds. I was anxious to begin. Garin straightened up and clasped Sarth's arm. I'm glad you decided to join us, Sarth. It's nothing, Sarth shrugged. I am happy to be of service, but I fear that I have no spells to summon a more favorable wind. Five months ago, Sarth had emerged as one of the heroes of the Battle of Linden's Dyke. The people of Hullberg knew he'd battled furiously on their behalf, and few held his devilish appearance against him. From what little Garin had gathered of Sarth's travels and adventures before his arrival in Hullberg, that was an unusual circumstance for the tiefling to find himself in. The wind suits me well enough for now. No one else is sailing any faster than we are today, Garin replied. With the wind out of the west, they'd need to tack back and forth across it to beat their way westward. But since you mentioned spells— do you have any means for divining the location of Croc and Queen? Not without some tangible connection to the ship. Find me something, or someone, that was actually part of the ship, and I might be able to discern the direction and distance to her. What about Nemesa Sokol? Should we go back to Hullberg for her? I spoke with her already. She was held on White Wing, and didn't set foot on the pirate vessel, and even if she had— it might not have left a strong enough psychic impression. It takes time for such a link to form and grow strong, and Nemesa was only in the pirate's keeping for a few hours. I suppose that would have been too easy, Garin said. Well, we might find something you can use at the cove where White Wing was sacked. It took Sea Drake most of the day to work her way along the deserted coastlands between Hullberg and Thentia. Garin remained on deck, learning the feel and sounds of the ship, watching the crew handle the sails, and watching the sailing master and the other officers handle the crew. Two hours before sunset, Sea Drake rounded the last cape, and came within sight of White Wing's burned skeleton. There was no sign of the pirate ship. Damn, Garin muttered to himself. He hadn't really expected to find Croc and Queen here after eight days, but it certainly would have been convenient. He looked over to Worthel, who'd replaced Gale Hand on watch. "'Drop anchor here and lower a boat, Master Worthel. I'm going to have a look ashore.' "'Aye, Lord Garin,' Worthel said. He frowned under his broad mustache of red-streaked grey. "'But I don't think there's much to see there. She's burned down to her keel.' A quarter hour later, Garin, Sarth, Hamel, and Kara waded ashore from the ship's boat. They inspected the burned wreck of White Wing, and the scattered remains of the Sokol ship's cargo still strewn across the pebbled shore. Kara carefully studied the tracks and refuse left behind by the pirate crew, pacing back and forth across the cove as she followed the story she read there. Garin knew of no better tracker on the north side of the Moon Sea, and he waited for her to finish. If there was anything to be found in the cove, she would find it. After a time, Kara brushed her hands off against the male aprons of her armor and rejoined him. 
Her eyes gleamed with the uncanny azure of her spell scar in the fading light of the day. What do you make of it? Hamel asked her. They left five or six days ago, Kara answered. I make their numbers at eighty or ninety, mostly humans with a few orcs and ogres. Most of the crew slept on the beach for the two or three days they stayed here. That was not unusual. Most captains, pirate or merchant, preferred to make camp ashore if conditions permitted. As long as the crew posted a few sentries, it was undoubtedly safer than continuing to sail through the hours of darkness, and most vessels plying the waters of the Moon Sea or the Sea of Fallen Stars offered very little in the way of accommodations for their crews. "'Did you find anything that might have belonged to Kraken Queen?' "'Sarth asked. "'A scrap of canvas, some discarded rope, an empty water-cask?' "'Not very much, I'm afraid,' Kara answered. "'She held up a battered old wooden baton about two feet in length, a belaying pin. "'I did find this, near where they had their ship drawn up. "'It's the best I could do for something that was part of the pirate ship. "'But there are several fresh graves over there in the brush above the high-water mark.' "'Garin nodded.' I killed at least two men when I fought my way out of the camp. He didn't think he'd mortally wounded anyone else, but perhaps the pirate captain had decided to settle some question of discipline during Croc and Queen's stay in the cove. The bodies might serve Sarth's requirement, but he kept that thought to himself. They were too near the high fells and the domain of the Lich Isperus to unearth corpses, regardless of what they intended to do with the remains. "'Better to leave the pirates dead in peace. "'Let me have a look,' Sarth held out his hand for the pin and examined it closely. "'The tiefling murmured the words of a spell and then closed his eyes in concentration. "'After a moment he snorted and shook his head. "'It belonged to Kraken Queen, but the aura is weak or the ship is far away,' he said. "'I cannot discern her direction.' It was worth a try, Garin said. He sighed and looked out over the purple-hued waters lapping against the pebbled shore. Very well, then. We'll have to search out Croc and Queen the hard way. We'll stay here for the night and begin in the morning. Over the next five days, Garin steered Sea Drake westward along the Moon Sea's northern coast, past Thentia and Melvaunt, as far as the river Stogenau and the small city of Flan, with no luck. The weather worsened as cool grey skies settled in with sheets of cold rain every night. By day, Sea Drake crashed through heavy swells, throwing white spray over the bow and running across the wind with a strong heel to her decks. They crossed the Moon Sea to the southern shore near Hillsfar and spent another five days working eastward as they searched the numberless islets and forested coves that crowded the shore between that city and the river Lys. Still they had no sign of the ship they sought, and Garin decided that his quarry was not in the southern Moon Sea either. That left only the two far corners of the Moon Sea unvisited. The West End by the River Tesh and the Galinar, the wild eastern reaches of the Moon Sea, where the mountains ringing Vasa met the coast in mile after mile of spectacular cliffs. But Garin hesitated before ordering Galehand to set his course for either end. Both were desolate and unsettled, with no merchant shipping to speak of. Pirates would find no prey no safe harbors, and no markets for their stolen goods at either end of the Moon Sea. Garin worried at the puzzle for most of a rain-soaked afternoon, then decided to call at the port of Mullmaster before he settled on his next move. If he heard nothing of Croc and Queen in the crowded city, he'd venture into the desolate Galinar. It was only a few hours' sail from the list to Mullmaster— Sea Drake sculled slowly into Mullmaster's narrow, fortified harbor at the end of the cool, rain-misted autumn day. Beetling ramparts and dark towers loomed over the harbor. Mullmaster climbed steeply toward the barren mountains at its back, a sprawling, grim-faced city. Under the city's ruling nobles, or blades, as they styled themselves, Mullmaster was a city where those with gold did anything they wanted, 
and those who didn't have gold did anything they could to get it. The harbor was crowded with round ships and galleys from many different cities and trading houses, but Croc and Queen was not among them. I never much cared for Mullmaster, Hamel remarked as Gale Hand steered the ship toward an open anchorage. The first time I came here, I had to bribe someone just to find out the proper way to bribe someone. Hardly a friendly or forthcoming people, these Mullmasterites. That's been my experience of Mullmaster. "'Garin agreed. "'Kara nodded toward the stone keys "'as they came abreast of them. "'Several merchant ships rocked gently alongside, "'their decks illuminated with lanterns. "'Even at the end of the day, "'porters still worked to unload one of the ships, "'carrying casks and bundles "'up out of her hold in a steady stream. "'The Varuna Yards,' Kara said. "'She looked at Garin. "'Sea Drake may be recognized here, you know.' Garin nodded. He was a little nervous about bringing the ship into House Varuna's home waters, too. I doubt the Varunas would try to seize Sea Drake by force, he said. We have enough fighting power on board to resist a merchant company's armsmen. True, but the Varunas might convince a magistrate or the High Blade to order the ship impounded. We can't outfight Mullmaster's navy or escape the port if they raise the harbor chain behind us. "'We'll choose an inconspicuous mooring,' Garin decided. "'Master Galehand, steer for that one there. "'It's not very close to shore. "'With darkness falling, any Varuna retainers ashore "'who might recognize Sea Drake "'wouldn't see much more than one more dark hull "'riding at anchor out in the harbor. "'Aye, Lord Garin,' the dwarf took the helm himself "'and steered for the spot Garin had pointed out. Sea Drake was no galley. She was slow and ungainly under oars. Garin couldn't shake the impression that the whole city was silently watching their tedious progress to the empty mooring spot he'd selected. Finally, Gale Hand brought the ship to a stop and ordered the crew to drop anchor. Master Gale Hand, put the longboat in the water, Garin said. Keep the crew at the sweeps and be ready to slip the cable and make for the open sea if anything goes amiss. Hamel and I are going ashore to see what we can learn. Kara, take command here. Kara nodded. What of me? Sarth asked. I'd like you to come with Hamel and me, Garin told the tiefling. Your talents may prove useful ashore. Half an hour later, six of Sea Drake's sailors rowed the ship's boat up to the quay along the south side of the harbor and tied up. Garin, Hamel, and Sarth clambered out of the boat and climbed the short flight of stone steps leading up to the street by the harbor side. Choosing a direction more or less at random, Garin set off into the dank, foggy streets. It was still early enough that they passed many people, most of them laborers and workmen still engaged in the business of the day, but they also encountered men and women dressed for the evening's revels and the occasional patrol of watchful soldiers. They visited several different trade yards and counting houses near the waterfront, asking about Croc and Queen, and spreading coin discreetly to help loosen tongues. Few of the Malmasterites seemed inclined to be helpful, but in a wine shop across from the city's chief customs house, Hamel discovered a handful of touts and clerks from the Moon Sea's larger trading houses, drinking after a long day in the merchant yards. The halfling brought a dour, grey-haired man in a house Janersk tunic to the table where Garin and Sarth sat, and set a flagon of good Symbian wine in front of him. "'This is Master Narm, a senior clerk who works for House Janarsk,' Hamel said. "'He's on the Janarsk wharves pretty much every day, and deals with the Melmasterite harbor masters. He's not averse to supplementing his salary by answering a few harmless questions.' Narm shrugged. "'The Janarsks care not, so long as I keep their business to myself. I'll not speak of Janarsk cargoes.' Most likely that meant that Narm wouldn't speak of Janars' cargoes without a more substantial bribe. But that didn't bother Garin. He didn't really care what House Janarsk was sending into or out of Mulmaster. "'I understand,' he said. "'Have you ever seen a good-sized war galley? A ship with a black hull and the figurehead of a mermaid with a croken's tentacles on her bow? In the harbor here?' 
The Janarisk man shook his head. No, no such ships called in Mullmaster so long as I've been posted here, and that's two years now. But I've heard a tale about a ship like that. She's a pirate. Garin allowed himself a small sigh of relief. He'd been a little afraid that Croc and Queen might be anchoring openly in Malmaster and sailing under a letter of mark from the High Blade. If the pirates harrying Hallberg's shipping were under the Mullmaster's protection, that would have been a daunting challenge, to say the least. Hallberg had no hope of forcing the rulers of the larger city to give up the practice. "'Go on,' he said. "'A merchant I did business with was ruined by a ship with a crocken figurehead. He owns a couple of cogs that ply the route between Hillsfar and Mullmaster, importing Dale Land's grain, cheese, fruit, and such. A decent trade for a small ship-owner. But his biggest cog was taken by two pirate ships a few miles off the lists back before midsummer. Both pirates flew the same banner, a black field with a crescent moon and a cutlass. Narm lowered his voice. The banner of the Black Moon Brotherhood. The Black Moon Brotherhood? Sarth asked. I'm afraid that it's little more than a story to frighten children into good behavior, Garin answered. There have always been rumors of a pirate league in the Moon Sea. At any time pirates appear in these waters, people begin to tell those stories again. Narm scowled. It might have been little more than a fable a year or two ago, but it's true enough now. I spoke with a man who survived the attack, an armsman paid to defend the cog, and he told me what he saw. Pirates don't often leave witnesses behind, Hamel observed. The armsman went over the side during the fight, but was lucky enough to find a bit of flotsam to cling to until another ship picked him up. Norm shrugged. "'Believe me or not, as you will, the shipowner's cog was certainly taken. Of that I have no doubt. I don't doubt you about the pirate attack on the cog. It's the Pirate League I wonder about,' Garin rubbed his jaw, thinking. "'You're certain you haven't seen the black galley with the crocken maid under her bowsprit here? You haven't heard anyone speaking of a ship named Crocken Queen?' "'No, she's never called in Mullmaster.' The clerk shook his head. He hesitated a moment, then offered, "'However, I might know of someone who would know more about such matters.' Garin nodded to Hamel, who paid off the man with a half-dozen gold crowns. Narm quickly scooped the coins into his pouch. "'Sometimes we find it useful to avoid the formalities of customs,' he said in a low voice. There's a man named Harrisk who helps us arrange matters. You can find him in the storehouse across from the bitter end, a tap house on the southwest wharves. Be warned that he's not above robbing a couple of strangers and dumping their bodies in the harbor. The clerk gave the three companions a shallow bow and withdrew. Garin waited until the man was out of earshot and leaned in close to speak to Sarth and Hamel. "'What do you make of it?' he asked them. "'We could seek out the armsman who survived the attack,' Sarth said. "'I doubt that it's worth the effort,' Hamel said. "'After all, Garin's seen Croc and Queen. "'What else would we learn from the armsman?' "'I don't recall a standard on Croc and Queen when I saw her,' said Garin. "'But my attention was fixed on Nemesa Sokol and the danger she was in. "'I might have missed it.' Hamel smirked at him. "'You mean you were distracted by the beautiful, half-naked woman tied up on the beach? Honestly, Garin, a hero of your quality should be able to keep his mind on business.' Garin remembered Nemesa's bare shoulders and the feel of her slim body before him in the saddle. He quickly pushed the idle thought aside. "'I'll ask Nemesa if she recalls a moon and cutlass standard the next time we call at Hallberg,' he said." If Norm's second-hand story was accurate, then Sea Drake might be hunting a flotilla instead of a single ship. And the fact that Norm had told them about an attack on a Mulman ship suggested corsairs who were preying on any moon sea traffic they happened across, instead of waylaying Hullberg's trade alone. "'I say we pay a visit to this Harrisk,' 
and see what he can tell us about Black Moon pirates. They left the wine shop and headed back down toward the wharves, where the tap houses and taverns were filled with a rougher crowd. It's possible that we've just missed Croc and Queen so far, Hamel pointed out as the three companions strolled down the center of the street, avoiding the filthy gutters. If she was on the north shore, while we were on the south shore, we could easily have passed her by. For that matter, she might be lurking near Hullberg again by now. Sarth snorted. Best not to dwell on that possibility. We could chase the pirate ship around the moon sea for ten days, if that's the case. They made their way toward the poorer side of the city, passing a series of progressively more disreputable and dangerous establishments. The night grew clammy and cool, and a foul-smelling fog settled over the city's waterside districts. It took them the better part of an hour to find the bitter end. From the darkened street outside, they heard the muffled sound of voices, the clinking of tin cups, and the occasional shout or harsh bark of laughter. Across the street, a dilapidated storehouse loomed in the fog. Sarth frowned. After hours of searching, I believe we have found the foulest establishment in this dismal city. Our prospects can only improve after this. Garin raised an eyebrow. Was that a jest from the straight-laced tiefling? He wouldn't have expected it from Sarth. If we learn nothing new here, we'll give up for the night, he said. Come on, we might as well get it over with. He went to the storehouse door and knocked sharply. There was no answer at first, but then voices muttered and floorboards creaked inside. Someone drew back a bolt with a rasp of metal, and Garin found himself looking at a pair of sullen mulmasterites in dirty workman's garb, standing in a small clear space at the front of cluttered stacks of crates and casks. Both men wore long knives at their belts. "'What do you want?' one growled. "'We're here to speak with Harrisk. Is he here?' The two men looked at each other, then stepped back from the door. "'He's here. Come in.' The three companions entered. Their sullen guides led them through the leaning stacks of cargo to a clear space near the back of the storehouse, where a small crowd of dirty humans and half-orcs lounged on rough-hewn benches or sat on old barrels. The ruffians glared at the three of them suspiciously. In the middle of the room stood a ham-fisted, round-bodied, black-bearded man who wore an ill-fitting jerkin of leather studded with steel rivets. "'Well, well,' the fat man rumbled. His voice carried the thick, throaty accent of Damara, or Vasa. "'A human, a halfling, and a devilkin walk into a room. I'm waiting for the rest of the joke.' "'Are you Harrisk?' Hamel asked. "'We have a business proposition for you.' Harrisk spread his hands. "'I am listening,' Garin spoke next. We're looking for a ship that sails under a black banner, a banner with a crossed crescent moon and cutlass design. Have you ever seen such a ship or such a banner? I might have, Harrisk answered. What's it to you? We'll pay well for news of her whereabouts, Garin answered. Ah, so you are a man of means, Harrisk observed. His eyes dotted to the ruffians lounging behind Garin. Garin whirled and reached for his sword, just in time. Without a word, the smugglers waiting in the storehouse threw themselves at the three companions, producing knives and cudgels hidden under their cloaks and tunics. For a furious instant, Garin feared that they might be overwhelmed. He dodged back from a knife slash, parried the fall of a club with his blade, then slashed the truncheon out of his enemy's hand with a cut that also removed two fingers. Behind him, Hamel put a man on the floor with a cut to the hamstring, then threw himself at the shins of another ruffian to send him crashing to the floor. Garin knocked that one unconscious with a kick to the face while he was on the ground. Then a brilliant blue flare seared the room, and lightning crackled across the space. Several of the ruffians shrieked and fell convulsing. As quickly as it had started, the brief assault fell to pieces. Sarth held up his rod that was glowing with a dangerous blue light. "'I do not care to be accosted by the likes of you,' he snarled. 
The ruffians, still on their feet, stared at him, then bolted for the door. Garin turned back to Harisk and found the fellow halfway out a small concealed door. He lunged after him and dragged him back into the room, throwing him into his seat. Then he tapped his sword point on the man's chest. Now, where were you going? he asked. The fat man glared at him. You'll be sorry for this, he said. I have powerful friends in this city. They'll see to you soon enough. I don't much care about your friends, Garin replied. He reached down and seized Harrisk by the collar, giving him a good shake. Now, tell me, what do you know about the Black Moon? To the Nine Hills with you. Garin was out of patience. Some of the ruffians might already be on their way to summon more help, or even find the local watch, and he had no particular desire to explain himself to the law-keepers and mullmaster. He cracked the flat of his blade across Harrisk's left ear, a stinging blow that elicited a howl of pain and raised a bright welt on the side of Harrisk's face. "'Mind your manners,' he said. "'Now tell me, have you seen a ship with that banner? Where did you see her?' "'Zentil Keep,' the man replied. "'Damn it all, she was in Zentil Keep. Now leave me be.' "'You're lying.' No one goes to Zentil Keep. It's a monster-haunted ruin. Sirik, take my tongue if I am lying, the man snarled. Outlaws and smugglers from the cities nearby hide in the ruins along the Tesh. No one troubles them, and there's always a ship or two there looking for a few hands. The sword mage narrowed his eyes, studying Harrisk, who sat glaring at him with a hand clapped up against his ear. If he'd been in the ruffian's place— Zentil Keep was exactly the place he might have told his interrogator to go. The ruins happened to lie all the way at the other end of the Moon Sea, and they were infested with monsters. But Zentil Keep was about the only place in the western Moon Sea that he hadn't looked already. Merchant ships had no reason to go any farther west than Hillsfar and Flan, so he'd turned Sea Drake back to the east without working his way another hundred miles into the prevailing wind to search deserted coasts and ruined cities. The prospects for a pirate lair in the ruins seemed almost as dim as those for a base in the Galinar. But Garin had heard stories that brigands and such outlaws occasionally laired in Zentil Keep. It was at least plausible that pirate ships might lurk there, too. "'I believe he's telling the truth,' Hamel said to him. Garin knew that the talent of the ghostwise for speaking mind to mind didn't allow Hamel to read the thoughts of others, but it did mean that the halfling had a better sense of truthfulness than most. "'I think so, too,' he answered Hamel. To Harris, he said, "'If I find that you've lied to me, I will come back for you,' he jerked his head towards Sarth. "'My friend the sorcerer here will invert you with his magic. "'You'll walk on your tongue and carry your eyes on your arse. "'So you'd better hope that we find what we're looking for in Zentil Keep.' "'Sarth gave Garin a startled look, but Harrisk didn't see it. "'He was cringing. "'I've told you what I know,' he said. "'The sword mage looked at his companions and nodded toward the door.' They filed into the fog-bound street outside. None of the men who'd fled the storehouse were in the vicinity. Sarth's magic had well and truly put them to flight. "'So it's off to Zentil Keep, then?' Hamel asked in a low voice. "'So it seems,' Garin answered. A shrill whistle rang through the night, piercing the fog. Apparently some of the ruffians had run straight for the watch to report dangerous sorcery on the loose— Garin winced, then exchanged looks with Sarth and Hamel. "'Let's be on our way. I think we've worn out our welcome in Mulmaster.' 6. 29 Elint, the Year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. "'A foul night,' Sergan Hallmaster muttered. From the gate of the Five Crown Coster's trade yard, he frowned at the murk gathering around the street lamps outside. He detested the evening fog of Melvaunt. 
On days when the brisk western wind failed, the stink of the city's smelters and cook fires and sewers covered the town like a great foul blanket. He'd been careful to purchase a villa that overlooked the city from the heights of the headland west of the harbor, a neighborhood that was distinctly upwind of the town itself, at least most of the time, but his storehouses were located in the heart of the commercial districts, and it seemed that if the air started to grow still and foul, it always started here. "'Is everything well, my lord?' asked his chief armsman, Kurth. The cell sword hovered close by, Sergan. Magical tattoos covered the man's brow, part of the elaborate enchantments that made him absolutely incapable of turning against his master. The precaution had cost Sergan a fortune, but he had too many enemies to worry about the loyalty of his bodyguards. They were well compensated for agreeing to undergo the necessary rituals. "'Well enough!' "'So long as one doesn't mind smelling like the harbor for the rest of the evening,' Sergan answered. "'He was a fastidious man, and he took great care in maintaining his wardrobe. "'Tonight he wore a lavender tabard over a shirt of black silk, "'with a broad belt and high boots of expensive Sembian leather. "'A wide-brimmed hat with a rakish tilt matched his tabard.' He was just about to retreat inside the dubious comforts of his storehouse when he heard the muffled clip-clop of hooves on slick cobblestones and the creaking of wooden wheels. "'Wagon's coming, my lord,' Kurt said. Sergan smiled in a distinctly predatory fashion, pleased that his late vigil would be rewarded after all. "'About time. Kurt, turn out your men to lend a hand. Quick and quiet now.' "'As you wish, my lord,' the armsman Kurth answered. He raised a knuckle to his scarred forehead and turned to rasp orders to the other guards waiting nearby. Sergan stood aside from the doorway as his armsmen unbarred the gate leading into the narrow alleyway between his storehouses and hurried out to guide several large wagons inside. This was not the sort of work he liked to give his highly paid guards, but he was certain of their loyalty— Unfortunately, the small army of clerks, scribes, and porters, who worked in the Five Crowns trade yard during the customary hours of business, was not under any sort of magical compulsion to serve with unquestioned loyalty. Oh, some of them were trustworthy enough, but Sergan knew that clerks and porters tended to gossip with their colleagues in other trading houses when the day was done. When he caught Five Crowns men making that mistake— he punished them severely, but it was impossible to stop all such talk. Better to keep the night's work to those he could trust to keep it to themselves. Sergan unlocked a door leading to a rarely used storeroom. "'In here,' he told his men. The drivers of the wagons weren't in his employ, but they knew better than to ask questions or look too closely at the cargo they were hired to carry." They set their brakes and climbed down to undo the ties that held each wagon's canvas cover in place. Beneath the canvas, the wagons were laden with heavy crates, casks, barrels, and chests. Each had been seared with the black mark of the Five Crowns brand, conveniently covering the former owner's marks. Over the next ten day or so, Sergan would arrange to dispose of the stolen cargo a few parcels at a time which would turn a tidy little profit for his merchant company. It irked him that he had to attend to such details, but that was the nature of his circumstances. As much as he affected the habits of the nobility, he was simply one more merchant in Melvaunt, and his fortune was not so substantial or secure that he could leave it in the hands of underlings. A few months ago he'd entertained dreams of making himself lord over Hullberg, but his so-called family had somehow survived his carefully planned acquisition of power, largely through the interference of his thrice-damned step-cousin, Garen Hullmaster. Instead of ruling from the throne of Griffinwatch, he was reduced to skulking about in dark storehouses in the middle of the night with spellbound cell-swords, the only minions he could trust. Kurth interrupted his brooding. "'That's all of it, my lord.' the tattooed swordsman said. The wagon-master is asking after his coin. 
He is, is he? Sergan answered. He looked into the storeroom, studying the merchandise with a practiced eye. He'd been expecting at least another wagonful or two, but apparently it wasn't coming tonight. With a shrug, he closed and locked the storeroom. Very well, then. Bring him into my office. While Kurth went to fetch the wagon master, Sergan unlocked his office and counted out the gold coins of Melvaunt. Anvils, they were called, from his strong box. By the time he finished, his swordsman was back, standing at the side of a portly halfling dressed in a thick quilted tunic. The halfling doffed his cap and bobbed his head. "'Good evening, my lord,' he said. "'Is everything to your satisfaction?' "'I suppose. Were you seen?' "'Not by the shore, my lord. No one was about. I think the fog drove most folk indoors tonight. We made the usual arrangements at the city gate and had no trouble.' "'I was expecting more merchandise,' the driver nodded. "'The man who met us said you would be, my lord. "'He gave me this to give to you.' "'He handed Sergan a small envelope sealed with a blank daub of wax. "'Sergan took the letter, broke the seal, and read it. "'It was short and to the point. "'We must meet. "'Expect me at two bells. "'Take the usual precautions. "'K.' Sergan tugged at his goatee, wondering what new development this signaled. Well, he would find out soon enough. It was already an hour past midnight. One bell, as they said in Melvaunt. So he needed to conclude his business and return home. "'Your payment,' he said, handing the halfling a small pouch. "'I've counted out ten anvils since your load was lighter than I'd been led to believe.' The wagon-driver winced. But he did not complain. It was hard, but fair, and he knew that he'd get no more from Sergan this evening. "'Thank you, my lord,' he said. He bowed and withdrew. "'Kurth, have my carriage brought up immediately,' Sergan told his bodyguard. "'We've got company coming. Have your men lock up here.' In a matter of minutes, Sergan and Kurth clattered away from the Five Crowns storehouses in a swift black carriage, driving back up to the hillside where Sergan's villa overlooked the harbor. The guttering street lamps painted the murk hanging over the city a dull red-orange color, but as the carriage climbed, the thick stink lessened perceptibly. Soon enough, the carriage clattered past the comfortable houses of the wealthy, each surrounded by its own wall, and some guarded by watchmen with pikes. Near the top of the hill, they reached Sergan's estate and turned into the long, gated driveway. "'Order the servants to their quarters and douse the street lamps,' Sergan told Kurth. "'I'll be waiting in the study.' "'I understand, my lord,' the mercenary said. The carriage stopped by the manor's door. Sergan allowed his footman to open the carriage door for him. As he climbed the steps to the manor's foyer, a valet took his cloak, and the doorman held the door for him. He might not have a noble title, but he certainly could afford the trappings of nobility. While Kurth spoke with the servants and saw to the arrangements outside, Sergan headed back to his study, a large room with broad windows overlooking the harbor. He drew the curtains closed, and then poured himself a glass of good dwarven brandy from a service he kept near his desk. Taking a seat by the room's fireplace, he listened to the faint sounds of the household staff receding, and watched as one by one the lights were turned down low outside. His visitor valued discretion, after all. Sergan waited no more than a quarter hour in the dark study before he heard footsteps in the hallway outside. He set down his brandy and stood as Kurth opened the door to admit a tall, cloaked figure. The armsman looked at Sergan. Sergan nodded to him, and Kurth stepped outside and closed the door, leaving him alone with his visitor. The man undid the fastenings of his heavy cloak and tossed it carelessly onto the nearest sofa. "'This is a fine house, my boy,' he said. "'But living here is making you soft. Mark my words.' "'It's all for show,' Sergan answered. "'Hello, father,' he stepped forward for a quick embrace and a hearty thump on the back, 
Kamoth Castlemar was a lean, well-weathered man of fifty-five years, a little taller than his son. A gray-streaked beard of black framed his square face, and his eyes smoldered beneath craggy brows. He wore a knee-length black coat with gold embroidery at the cuff and collar, and a fine saber rode at his hip in a scabbard of termitian leather. Once upon a time he'd been the scion of a minor noble family of Hillsfar, but he'd put his home behind him at an early age, seeking better opportunities. Fifteen years ago, Kamoth married Tarina Hullmaster, the sister of the Harmac, and brought Sergen, his son by his first wife, a woman Sergen hardly remembered, to Griffin Watch to live with Tarina's family. But Kamoth was a restless man, an ambitious man, and he soon began to plot against his brother-in-law, Harmac Grigor. When those plots were uncovered, Kamoth had been forced to flee Hullberg and seek his fortune elsewhere. He'd left Sergen to be raised by the family of his stepmother. Sergen had hated him for that for a long time, but Kamoth was his father for better or worse. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, he'd taught Sergen everything he'd needed to know about how to look out for himself. Kamoth thumped his back one more time and stepped back. "'I don't suppose you have something worth drinking in here?' he asked. Sergen nodded at the brandy service. "'Good dwarven brandy!' the older lord snorted. "'Well, perhaps living soft has its advantages.' He poured himself a tall glass and actually took a moment to inhale the aroma. "'Did that fat little halfling get my cargo to your storehouse?' "'He did, although it was only three and a half wagons worth,' Sergen replied. "'Was that all of it?' "'I lost almost a third of the cargo after I beached the Sokol ship,' Kamoth said. He scowled fiercely. "'Some madman spied out my landing and crept down after dark to set fire to my prize. What's more, he cut the Sokol lass free of her bonds and fought his way out of my camp while my lads were busy fighting the fire. Killed two men and crippled another.' Sergen grimaced. "'Your madman was named Garen Hullmaster. "'Garen? He was the one that fired my prize?' Kamoth turned away with a muttered oath. "'He glared into the fireplace for a long moment "'before he composed himself and turned back to Sergen. "'All right, then. "'How did you find out about Garen's little visit to my encampment?' "'Garen told his uncle about it the hour he returned to Hullberg.' "'Gregor called the Harmax Council together to discuss the matter, "'and my ally on the Council heard Garen's story for himself. "'He keeps me informed of the Council's business. "'I heard the tale several days ago.' Kamoth looked past Sergen, his eyes fixed on old memories. "'Burn off, son,' he murmured. "'I saw him from a distance before he fled the beach, "'fighting his way past my lads.' I thought he seemed familiar, and now I know why. He shook his head and seated himself in one of the chairs by the fireplace. Nine years now that Burnoff Hullmaster's been dead, and his wander-footed son shows up to ruin the best part of a prize I took with my own two hands. Damn that man! Even from the grave he's finding ways to hinder me. The fire ruined that much of the Sokol cargo? "'No, not that. The lass! She was a splendid sight, my boy. I had designs upon her, I did.' Sergen grimaced. Kamoth was a man of violent appetites. When he said he had designs on a woman, those designs often ended in the most heinous sort of murder. It was one of the reasons his father had never bothered to establish himself in civilized society again after fleeing Hullberg years ago.' His proclivities would have soon enough earned him a death sentence in all but the most lawless of settings. Sergen considered himself a pragmatic, unsentimental man, and he did not shy from the idea of taking what he wanted, but he'd never been able to understand the demonic urges that moved Kamoth. At its best, Kamoth's cruelty was simply wasteful. 
At its worst, it was the very soul of wickedness, something so spiteful and nihilistic that even Sergen shrank from it. "'I'm sure she was,' he temporized. "'How in the world did Garin know to lie in wait for me on that deserted shore?' Kamoth mused aloud. "'I didn't know myself where I'd put in until I saw the cove and decided it would serve.' "'Sheer accident. According to what my man on the council heard, Garin was off visiting his mother in Thentia. He was on his way home to Hullberg when he stumbled across your camp, a day or two to either side, and he never would have seen you. By all the misfortunes of Beshaba, what did I do to deserve that?' If ill fortune followed the guilty, Sergen thought, then his father had certainly earned his share and more. He decided not to voice that sentiment. He hesitated for a moment. Then he said, "'I am afraid there is something more to Garin's involvement. The Harmax Council ordered Garin to fit out a warship to deal with Croc and Queen. Garin is likely at sea by now, searching for you. "'By all nine of the screaming hells!' Kamoth leaned forward, his eyes fierce. "'Warship? What warship?' "'Apparently the Varunas left a serviceable caravel named Sea Drake behind when they abandoned the city. They've got a large detachment of shield-sworn and mercenaries aboard.' Sergen smiled. "'They believe it will be easier to track you to your lair.' than to patrol the sea lanes near Hullberg, awaiting the next attack. The pirate lord stifled a snort of derision. Grigor Hullmaster thinks one impressed ship is a match for the Black Moon Brotherhood? I should go burn Hullberg to teach the Harmac some respect. Sergen shrugged. So far, events were proceeding more or less as he'd expected. His father's pirate flotilla— had virtually strangled trade going to Hullberg by sea over the summer, creating no small amount of difficulties for the Hullmasters. He'd originally planned for Kamoth's corsairs to slowly tighten their grip over the next few months, bringing the Harmac to his knees. "'We expected that the Hullmasters would take steps to protect their shipping,' he said. "'They have no choice.' If Grigor does nothing, the merchant council has to act in his place. I expected that they'd arm their merchantmen, perhaps send a few soldiers to sea, or maybe strike a deal with Hillsfar or Mullmaster for protection, Kamos said. I didn't think they'd fit out a warship so quickly. Why in the world did House Varuna leave anything that useful behind? She couldn't sail. And they didn't have enough hands for the oars. Sergen frowned. He'd spent his last few days in Hullberg, hiding in the Varuna compound, and he remembered the Mulmasterites' retreat all too well. I told them to burn anything they couldn't carry off, but Darcy chose not to listen to me. She thought she'd be able to convince the high blade of Mulmaster to demand the return of the storehouses and sea drake from the Harmac. Kamoth waved his hand. "'Bah! If you can't protect your own, you deserve to lose it. I don't blame the High Blade for ignoring her complaints. So what do we do about Garin and his ship? Let him chase his own tail all around the Moon Sea, as far as I care, or set a trap for him.' Kamoth grinned fiercely and set a hand to the pommel of his dagger. "'Yes!' I like the thought of that. The day I see the son of Burnoff Hullmaster dead on the point of my blade would be a fine day indeed. Other than the fact that Sergen hoped to be the one holding the blade, he approved of his father's sentiment. If my source is correct, there are close to a hundred of Hullberg's soldiers and militia aboard Sea Drake, along with Garin and Kara Hullmaster. Garin is little more than a reckless adventurer, but he is a formidable swordsman, and Kara is far and away the best commander in the Harmac's service. Can you defeat him? So many, eh? Then I'd need two ships or a ruse of some kind. Kamath frowned. 
his eyes fixed on some distant vision of mayhem as he considered the problem. Damn, but it might be better with three ships at that. I know Garin can fight, and those shield sworn will be tough bastards. It makes you wonder who's left in Hullberg. Sergan looked sharply at his father and laughed. A bold idea had just occurred to him. In fact, that is exactly what I'm wondering. With both Garin and Kara away from Hullberg, and a ship full of shield sworn absent from the town's defenders, I think a bold stroke might be called for. The pirate lord raised his eyebrows and sat back in his chair. Raid the town? Now that is a bold idea, my boy. If I summon the Black Moon together, we could land better than six hundred men. Would that be enough to take Hullberg? Take it? No, you'd never be able to fight your way into all the merchant compounds or storm Griffin watch. But, with even a little bit of surprise, you could pillage the harbor district and fire as much of the town as you liked. That would, in fact, serve Sergan's plans even better than slowly choking off the town's trade. The Harmac's weakness in the wake of such an attack would demand action, and it would wound Garin to the heart if Hullberg suffered while he was wandering aimlessly hundreds of miles away. Sergan had much to repay Garin after the sword mage's interference in his plans. A bold stroke, nonetheless, Kamoth mused. Ah, the stories they tell about the Black Moon Brotherhood after a feat like that. I like the thought of it, my boy. You might be worth something after all. Sergan allowed himself a small smile. It wasn't often that he found a way to earn his father's approbation. Kamoth was quick to praise one of his cutthroats, or laugh at the coarse humor his crewmen enjoyed, but Sergan had always had to come up with something exceptional to earn that fierce grin. He took a deep sip of the brandy and said, "'In that case, when does the Black Moon sail against Hullberg?' Seven, twenty-nine Elint, the year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. A cold, steady rain fell as Garin and Sarth rowed Sea Drake's skiff toward the broken towers of the ruined city. Hamel sat in the stern of the small boat, his hand on the rudder. It was a dark and dreary night, the sort of weather that would persist over the moon sea lands until the bitter winds of winter arrived sometime in early nightfall. The steady hiss of rain falling into the sea masked the creaking of the oars in their locks and the soft slap of water under the small boat's hull. They'd only been rowing for half an hour, but they were already soaked. Garin didn't mind. The foul weather meant that fewer unfriendly eyes would be watching them. Sea Drake was a mile behind them, invisible in the darkness. She showed no lights, since Garin hoped that their landing in Zental Keep would go unnoticed. As an additional precaution, they wore the same sort of common garb that any deckhands might wear on a sodden moon-sea evening. Instead of a fine jacket and jaunty cap, Hamel glowered under a drenched hood. Garin had left his fine elven backsword in his cabin on Sea Drake, and carried a plain cutlass instead, while Sarth had used his magic to disguise himself as a sellsword of Teshan descent, with a thick black mustache and dark, fierce eyes under a heavy brow. Hamel surveyed the crumbling buildings of the ruined city with a dubious expression. That looks like the sort of place you venture into when you've a mind to feed yourself to some horrible monster, he said. Are you sure of this plan, Garin? Sure of it? No, but I think it's worth a try. Garin paused to glance over his shoulder as the city's ramshackle docks drew closer. Zental Keep sprawled on either side of the mouth of the river Tash. In better times it had been the busiest harbor on the Moon Sea, on both banks of the river, as well as some of the lakefront, too, had been lined with broad stone keys that could accommodate scores of ships at a time. 
He would have liked to bring Sea Drake into the Tesh and drop anchor in the river mouth, but he guessed that the sort of brigands and outlaws he was looking for would have vanished into the rain and rubble at the first sight of a hostile warship. We'll find the sort of cutthroats we're looking for soon enough. Or they'll find us. Sarth frowned as he pulled at his oar. Are you not concerned that the sort of villains we seek might rob and murder three strangers the moment they catch sight of us? A fate easily avoided. We have to appear too poor to rob and too dangerous to pick a fight with. Garin smiled humorlessly. Trust me, we should fit right in. Hamel looked past his larger companions and shifted in his seat. We're getting close. Steer for the docks on the north bank here. Or do you want to tie up on the other side of the river? The first spot you see. If the fellow in Mullmaster was right, there may be a ship or two moored up the Tesh, and I don't want to run into them. Garin paused in his rowing and turned around to get a better look at the looming shadows around him. A hundred years ago, Zental Keep had been the most powerful city in the Moon Sea lands. Its soldiers held the Tesh Vale, the mighty citadel of the Raven in the Dragonspine Mountains, and the ruins of Eulash. Hillsfar they subdued in Mithdranner's War of Restoration. Gold flowed into Zental Keep's coffers from a dozen far lands, intimidated by Zentarim sellswords or inveigled by Zentarim spies. But the Zents, for all their ruthlessness and might, had inevitably aroused the wrath of an enemy beyond their strength. The unliving archwizards of the newly reborn Empire of Netheril did not look kindly on such an aggressive neighbor, and they would turned their fearsome sorcery against Zental Keep. In the years before the Spell Plague, the Netherese raised the city and scattered its lords, its priests, and its wizards to the four winds. Zentarim expatriates dotted the lands of the inner sea, but their native city was now a shadow-haunted ruin that all decent folk gave a wide berth. Except, of course, for Garin and his companions. Garin's eye fell on a dark key that seemed like a safe spot to leave their boat. "'There, that will do,' he said. He and Sarth resumed pulling, and in a few minutes the skiff bumped up alongside the old landing. Hamel scrambled out and looped the skiff's bowline around a rusted bollard. Then the sword-mage and the tiefling followed. Garin paused on the cobblestone street to gain his bearings, hand on his sword-hilt. The old buildings loomed over him, most standing five or six stories in height, and crowded shoulder to shoulder like tired soldiers standing in ranks. Dark doorways and empty windows looked down over the street. It was said that the curse of the Netherese arch-wizards still lingered over the city, some nameless doom waiting to swallow anyone so foolish as to venture into the darkest shadows. Garin had no idea if that was true or not, but he sensed brooding menace just beyond his sight. "'This is an accursed place,' Sarth said. "'Terrible spells were spoken here.' "'We'll keep to the river bank. The stories I've heard about this place claim that whatever lingers here doesn't like the water, or that the Tesh has washed away some of the curse.' Garin said. Either way, I don't think it would be a good idea to explore any of these buildings. Hamel stopped and looked up at him. It's also a bad idea to leave a fire untended, speak a demon's name, or run while you've got a knife in your hand. Is there anything else we should go over? Sarth snorted through his mustache. Garin sighed. I've known you to ignore common sense once or twice, he said to Hamel. I remember sometimes with the dragon shields when you leaped before you looked. They left the skiff tied up by the quay, since there were no ships visible at the river mouth, and Garin didn't see or hear anything to suggest that other folk might be around. He decided to follow the riverside street westward, deeper into the city. They gave the old buildings on their right a wide berth, staying out in the open street. After a half-mile or so, they passed the remains of one of the city's great bridges, now little more than a series of six stone piers in the river. 
Beyond the bridge piers, several ships were moored to the old quays, a couple of small coasters that were likely smugglers of some sort, a round-hulled cog, and a half-galley with a long, slender hull. A few dim lanterns illuminated the streets by the riverside, and the distant strains of voices and faint music carried over the water. Garin and his friends exchanged looks. Then they continued. Along the river banks, above the first of the bridges, a dismal little town of sorts had grown up in the city ruins. Although the looming stone buildings here were still mostly abandoned, the lower floors of a dozen or so in the immediate area had evidently been reoccupied. Lanterns hanging from posts outside marked the locations of taverns, fest halls, boarding houses, provisioners, fences, armorers, sailmakers, and others who did business with the sort of brigands and pirates who lurked in the ruins. Despite the late hour, dozens of men and a few women loitered out in the street, staggered drunkenly from one place to the next, or simply lay sprawled on the cobblestones wherever they'd fallen asleep or passed out. More than a few seemed to be half-orcs, goblins, hobgoblins, and other such creatures, but the humans seemed to pay them no special attention. "'We'll try the taverns first and keep our ears open,' Garin said. "'Let's get the mood of the place before we start asking dangerous questions.' They headed for the first tap-house they saw. A crude signboard hung above the door, showing the image of two busty mermaids. Directly under the sign, a grey-bearded sailor slumbered in the street. Garin stepped over him and pushed open the door. Inside, raucous sailors crowded a small room that looked like it might once have been a well-off merchant's parlour. Simple tables and benches replaced all of the old furnishings, and an overturned skiff served as the unlikely bar. In one corner, a man in a patched cape strummed at a lute, but no one was paying him much attention. They were watching a contest of knife-throwing, with the target hanging close by the door. As Garin ducked through the door, a small dagger thunked into the wood not far from his face. Drunken sailors and their rented lovers roared with laughter as he flinched aside. "'I think you've found what you're looking for,' Hamel said. "'What a charming place!' Garin gave the knife-thrower a hard look and made his way over to the bar. Hamel and Sarth followed, while the game resumed behind them. The barkeep was a balding dwarf with a striking scar across his mouth that notched his beard. He looked up at Garin with a yellow-toothed grin. "'Don't think I've seen ye before,' he said. "'Are ye, lads, from the Impulturian merchant lying on t'other side of the river?' Garin was momentarily tempted to say yes, just to satisfy the fellow's curiosity, but of course he had no idea whether any of the other crewmen were in the room. He decided that it would be best to say as little as possible. "'No, we're new in town. What do you have to drink?' "'I've got a keg of hills far as own moon sea stout tapped, "'and I'll draw ye a mug for half a silver talent, "'or I could find ye a bottle of southern wine, "'though that'll cost ye dear. "'It's hard to come by.' "'The stout, then,' Garin told him. "'He fished two silver coins out of the purse at his belt "'and handed mugs to Sarth and Hamel. "'His companions found stools fashioned from old barrels "'sawn in half around a battered old capstan, "'salvaged from some wreck or another, "'and settled in to nurse their ale and observe the crowd. "'Garin lingered to speak with the barkeep "'and motioned for him to stay a moment. "'What more are ye wantin?' the dwarf asked. "'The warship out in the river. Who is she?' "'That would be Moonshark.' "'Is she a black moonship?' "'Why, are you looking for a billet?' "'We might be,' Garin shrugged and glanced at the patrons of the tap-house. "'Are any of these fellows moonshark crewmen?' "'Don't think so,' the dwarf answered. He took up a rag and started wiping down the bar. Garin decided to leave him to his work instead of pressing the question. He joined Hamel and Sarth at their table. They drank around, listening to the people around them. Garin and Hamel made a point of keeping up an animated discussion about various taverns in the cities of the vast, providing Sarth with the opportunity to study their neighbors surreptitiously. 
The tavern-goers included seamen from the ships hidden in Zentil Keep's ruined harbor, sellswords on hard times, and brigands and outlaws who preferred the company of others of their kind. After half an hour, Garin leaned in to speak to Sarth and Hamel. "'I think we've heard everything we're going to,' he said. "'Let's see if we can find some of Moonshark's crewmen on the street. We might find one that's talkative when drunk.' "'A good idea,' Sarth agreed. The three of them drained their mugs, then filed out into the dark street outside. The hour was growing late, but there was little sign of it in the pirate den. The faint strains of music still echoed across the water, broken by the occasional sound of breaking glass or a shouted oath. They headed up river toward the next island of lantern light they could make out. A door on their right burst open and a party of boisterous men flooded out into the street. Garin halted to let them pass. But one of the men, actually a bandy-legged half-orc, with one tusk at the corner of his mouth, turned and met his eyes. A dark scowl came over the half-orc's features. "'No, what do you think you're looking at, you goat-buggering bastard?' he demanded. Garin bit back a retort and nodded down the street with more friendliness than he felt. "'Just on my way to the next tap room. Don't mind me.' "'I'll oh, mind whatever I decide to mind,' the half-orc growled. The fellow's companions, five of them, moved to surround Garin and his comrades. They were a dirty, ill-favored lot, dressed in ill-fitting leather, and armed with cutlasses or cudgels at their belts. At least a couple of them seemed unsteady on their feet, more than a little in their cups, but the sallow half-orc was unfortunately not one of them. "'I don't think I've seen you lot round here before. You ain't in any crew I know. That means you're mine.' "'It seems we've seen this more than once,' Hamel remarked. The halfling shifted a half-step behind Garin, hiding his hands from view." Garin glanced over his shoulder at Sarth and gave the tiefling a subtle shake of the head. "'No magic,' he mumbled under his breath. Sarth scowled, but he nodded. It would be hard to masquerade as common sellswords if thunderclaps and blasts of fire erupted in the street. Then he looked back at the half-orc, glaring at him. He doubted it would work, but he had to try. "'We've got no cause to quarrel,' he said. "'We'll go our way, and you can go yours.' The half-orc spat something in orcish and swept out his cutlass. Garin had no idea what he'd said, but as far as he could tell, negotiations were at an end, and he drew his own cutlass an instant later, nearly sticking the blade in the scabbard, because the shape and weight were different from the fine elven steel he was accustomed to. The other brigands followed suit. The sound of steel rasping on leather filled the air followed an instant later by the ring of steel on steel. Garin blocked the half-orc's first vicious cut by passing it over his head, then stepped close to smash the heavy handguard into the side of the half-orc's head. The half-orc staggered back, and Garin immediately turned and leaped at the man to his right. They hacked at each other for three quick passes of steel. Then Garin slashed the cutlass out of his hand with a nasty cut to the forearm. The cutlass dropped to the cobblestones with a shrill ring, and when the brigand doubled over, holding his arm, Garin surged forward and planted a boot in the center of the man's belt. With a strong shove of his leg, he sent the wounded brigand stumbling over the side of the quay and into the water. Sarth blocked the cudgel of the man attacking him with a two-foot iron baton, actually his magical rod, disguised by his illusion magic. Then the tiefling bludgeoned his foe to the ground with a rain of blows to the head and shoulders. Meanwhile, Hamel efficiently hamstrung the swordsman, moving in to attack Sarth from the side, and kicked the man unconscious when he fell to the cobblestones. "'Behind you!' he called to Garin. Garin turned and found the half-orc rushing in again despite the vicious clout he'd taken. But the fellow was unsteady on his legs, and the sword-mage easily twisted aside from a clumsy thrust. This time Garin hammered the pommel of the cutlass to the nape of the half-orc's neck as he stumbled past, and stretched him out senseless or dead on the street. 
He leaped over the half-orc to smash the flat of the cutlass against the skull of a brigand, stabbing furiously at Sarth. The man crumpled to the ground. Sarth dealt him a heavy clout as he fell, for good measure. The tiefling looked up at Garin and scowled. "'My way is easier,' he muttered. "'And louder,' Garin reminded him. He straightened up and looked around, just in time to see Hamel test the balance of the dagger in his hand and let fly at the last brigand who had turned to flee. The blade turned over three times before the pommel cracked the fellow on the back of the head and knocked him to the cobblestones. Silence fell over the scene, and Garin realized all of the brigands were on the ground or in the river. Several bystanders stood nearby, including one tall, strongly built woman with a shaven head, who had her fingers wrapped around the hilt of her own sword. Hamel looked at the bald woman. "'You want a part of this, too?' he demanded. The woman let go of her sword and held up her hand. She was no beauty. Her shoulders were almost as broad as Garin's own, and her face was square with blunt features. Garin could easily have mistaken her for a man— if not for the heroic expanse of her bosom and the fine point to her chin. "'Not I, friend. I'm just an interested spectator,' she said. She looked down at the thugs on the ground and twisted her mouth into a hard smile. "'Consider me impressed. You handled those wretches easily enough, although I can't imagine why you saw fit to leave them alive.' "'We're new in town,' Garin answered warily. "'I have no idea who these fellows belong to.' It didn't seem wise to kill them without knowing who might take offense. "'You're a man of uncommon wisdom, then,' the woman nodded toward a ramshackle establishment on the other side of the river. "'Those fellows work for Rabadar. He's the half-orc that runs the bar, fest hall, and gaming hall over yonder. They're in the habit of rolling drunks and stragglers. You'll want to watch your backs if you stay here long. Sooner or later, Rabadar's boys will want to even up the score.' "'Thanks for the warning.' Hamel answered. I'm in the habit of watching my back anyway. Indeed. The woman hesitated, studying the three companions for a moment. Then she spoke again. By any chance, are you three looking for billets? I could use a few more sharp fellows who can fight like you can, and have a good share of common sense, too. What sort of billets? Garin asked. Deckhands on Moonshark. She's the half-galley tied up by the bridge. A good ship, and swift. My name is Sorcel. I'm her first mate. Garin glanced toward the shadowed outline of Sorcel's ship, to hide his quick grin. It seemed that fortune had smiled on him. To conceal his interest, he rubbed at his jaw as if in thought. As I said, we're new in town. We intended to weigh a few opportunities before making any decisions. Sorcel gave a short laugh. You won't find many better opportunities, no matter how long you stay moored here. We sail under the Black Moon's flag, my friends. Things are going well for us these days. A deckhand's share will make a wealthy man of you after three prizes, maybe just one or two if they're rich, and for men of ability there's even more to be had. Garin made a show of thinking over Sorcel's offer, while he considered his next step. He'd hoped to catch a rumor of the Black Moon by visiting Zentul Keep, but it seemed he'd caught a pirate ship. Now that he confirmed that the Black Moon Brotherhood had more than one ship at their command, he found himself wondering how many more vessels belonged to the pirate flotilla and where they might be found. He had the woman he wanted to talk to right here in front of him. The question was how to engage her without making Sorcel suspicious. "'Tell her we're interested in signing on,' Hamel said silently. "'It can't hurt to see what more she'll tell us.' "'That's an interesting offer,' Garin said slowly. "'But, truth be told, we'd sort of hoped to sign on with Croc and Queen.' The bald mate looked at him oddly. "'Really? Why?' Hamel glanced up at him. "'You put your foot in it now. Why, indeed, Garin?' Garin affected a small shrug, thinking furiously. "'I haven't heard of Moonshark before. But I know Croc and Queen took a Sokol cog just a couple of ten days ago, and it wasn't her first. Sorcel shrugged. "'Well, you'll have a long wait if you hope to catch Croc and Queen in port. But she's a Black Moon ship also, and we see her from time to time. 
If you can convince the captain to let you cross deck, you might get your wish. Moonshark's your best bet for now. All right, then. I guess we're in, Garin said. When do we sail and where are we bound? Good, the mate said. We're sailing tomorrow morning. As far as where we're going, that's the captain's business for now, and none of yours until we're at sea. Come on with me, and I'll introduce you to him. Sorcel indicated the shadowed key with a wave of her well-muscled arm, and they set off toward the slender warship lying by the ruined bridge. Garin studied the ship as they approached. Moonshark was a half-galley, built for sailing instead of rowing. She was smaller than Croc and Queen, a two-master instead of a three-master, but she looked like she'd be swift and handy under oars or sail. Garin decided that Sea Drake would have a hard time catching her on the open sea unless she gained the weather gauge on the pirate. Sorcel led them up the narrow gangplank and gruffly acknowledged the greeting of the deck watch, a pair of dispirited-looking men who evidently wished they were free to spend the night in the ruined port's taverns. The mate went aft to a companionway beneath the quarter-deck and knocked. Captain, she called in a low voice, new hands. What have you got there, Sorcel? The voice was not quite human wetter and more throaty, with a hint of a growl deep in the chest. A tall but curiously hunched figure appeared in the small companionway, ducking beneath the doorway as it stepped onto the main deck. The creature stood almost seven feet tall, despite its posture, and as it moved into the lantern light by the head of the gangplank, Garin saw that it was a knoll, a savage beast-man with a hyena-like muzzle and a short coat of mangy yellow-gray fur. It wore a shirt of black mail and carried a curving scimitar at its belt. Three hands, as say they want to sign on, Captain Narsk,' the bald woman answered. "'They handled a gang of Rabadar's lads well enough, and I thought you might want to meet them.' "'Rabadar's men aren't worth a cup of warm piss. Still, we need the crew, don't we, Sorcel? The knoll, Narsk, Garin reminded himself, said. The mate remained silent, and Narsk paced closer, looking over the three companions. The sword mage did his best to look surly, violent, and desperate without challenging the knoll by holding his gaze too long. Narsk twisted his lips away from his fangs and then looked down at Hamel. The other two might do, but I don't need a little rat like this one on my ship. I need fighters. Hamel planted his feet and looked up at the knoll. I'll try any man on this ship, you included, Captain. The knoll scowled at that, but Sorcel spoke up. "'He can fight, Captain. I watched him hamstring one man and kick him unconscious just as neat as you please, and then knock out a second man with the pommel of a thrown dagger. He's worth a share.' Oh, really? Narsk looked down at Hamel and smiled unpleasantly. "'Well, we'll find out soon enough. If he's not as good as you think, the rest of the crew'll kill him within three days, or my name's not Narsk. Are you still willing to sign on with Moonshark, little one? I can look after myself. It's your neck. Narsk pointed one clawed finger at Hamel. I won't spare a word to save your worthless life if you are wrong. What are your terms, Captain? Garin asked. The crew divides half the value of any prize we take, one share each. The three of you make fifty-five hands. You can sleep wherever you find space, and you'll be fed twice a day. There's no other pay. I'll keep your shares in the ship's chest until you decide to leave, and then I'll count you out if you want. The knoll grinned. Better that way. Less thieving and killing among the crew. Hard terms, Hamel said to Garin. 
he doesn't care whether his crew likes him much. They seemed more or less in line with what Garin would have expected of a pirate captain. What are the rules of the Brotherhood? he asked. There aren't many, Narsk answered. Sorso can explain them. All you need to know is that you'd better do what I say, or what Sorso says in my place, or you'll be damned sorry you didn't. I wouldn't expect otherwise. All right, Captain, I'm willing. When do we sail? Tomorrow at sunrise, Narsk said. You'll be pulling oars with the rest of the crew. Then if we're sailing tomorrow morning, I've a mind to say my farewells to the ladies of the port before we cast off, Hamel said. He winked at Garin and gave the knoll a sly grin. When do we have to be back on board? For a moment, Garin was afraid that Narsk was going to tell them that they were finished with their port call and had to remain aboard. After all, why give them a chance to change their minds? But a sly look stole over the knoll's face, and he bared his fangs in what Garin supposed was meant to be a friendly grin. Go, say your farewells, then, Garin relaxed. He judged the knoll well. Sailors with full purses were all too likely to jump ship at the first opportunity, but penniless sailors were more or less at the captain's mercy. Narsk was all too happy to let his three new hands spend their last remaining coin ashore, since that would put them well and truly in his power when they straggled back aboard Moonshark. Chances were he had no intention of paying them at all, or at least not until it suited him to do so. "'Back, my son up, or I'll leave you,' the knoll warned. Then he ducked back through the small door leading to the aft cabin, shutting it behind him. Sorcel looked over the three companions and shrugged. "'Well, you heard the captain,' she said. "'You can go back ashore, or I can show you where to sling your hammocks now. But I'll warn you that the best spots are taken.' "'The night's still young,' Garin answered. We'll be back before dawn. Then he trotted back down the Kang plank, with Sarth and Hamel a few steps behind. He turned back toward the yellow lanterns, marking the location of the taverns along the ruined quay, and walked away from Moonshark without a backward glance. Well, what now? Sarth asked quietly. I think that a bold opportunity is before us, Hamel replied. The question is, should we take it? "'Do you mean to attack Moonshark before she sails?' Sarth asked. Garin thought he knew what Hamel had in mind. "'Not exactly. What do you think about becoming pirates for a while?' Sarth stopped in mid-stride and fixed his dark eyes on Garin. "'It strikes me as pure madness,' he said. "'Do you have any idea how hard it will be to keep our identities a secret in the close confines of a ship, filled with enemies? "'You may be able to pass yourselves off as deckhands, but I know nothing about ships.' "'I prefer to think of it as audacity, not madness,' Hamel said. "'In any event, I have a hard time imagining a better way to spy out the plots of the pirate captains, "'or to find out where the Black Moon ships are lairing. Garin chewed on his tongue for a moment, thinking it over. He'd gone along with Sorcel's offer simply because that seemed a plausible cover for approaching the pirates. Nothing more than a ruse to ferret out some rumors of Hulberg's enemies. A couple of miles away, under the clouded moon sea night, Sea Drake waited. He and his companions could slip out of Zental Keep and bring the ship into position to catch Moonshark in the morning. But Moonshark wasn't the prize he was after. He wanted Crocken Queen, and his intuition warned him that she might prove an elusive quarry. All he had to do was board Moonshark before dawn, and Narsk's ship would take him exactly where he wanted to go. Once he spied out Crocken Queen's lair, he could slip away to summon Sea Drake and bag the Black Moon Brotherhood with a single efficient stroke. With his arcane magic, and Sarth's, at their disposal, abandoning Narsk's ship should be simple enough. "'I don't ask either of you to come with me,' he told Hamel and Sarth. 
but I intend to sail with Moonshark in the morning. See Drake's in Kara's command. I want her to take the ship back toward Hullberg and protect shipping as best she can until I return or send word. I'm with you, Hamel said. The halfling looked up at him with a fierce grin. You'll need someone to watch your back. Sarth sighed and looked up at the dark skies overhead. I, too, he said. There is an excellent chance that you will have to fight your way off that ship. If so, my magic may be of some small use, but I am going to be a very inept deckhand. Hamel and I can help you with that, Garin told him. Besides, there will be plenty of men on that ship who know just as little as you do. Narsk needs fighters even more than he needs sailors. Very well, Sar said. He frowned unhappily. I will trust your judgment. Good. That brings up two more things. First, Sarth, you have a spell of flying. Can you return to see Drake, explain to Kara what we're doing, and come back swiftly? Sarth nodded. Of course, but we should get out of sight before I take to the air. The place where we left the skiff should do. I don't think many of the people here are in the habit of roaming the ruins at night. What else? Hamel asked. Garin smiled. He knew it was a foolish thing, but it amused him nonetheless. We'll need to come up with good pirate names. 8. Thirty Aligned, The Year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. Moonshark sailed at dawn, as Narsk had promised, before the lower limb of the sun had cleared the horizon. The half-galley hauled in her lines and sculled slowly eastward with the current of the tash. By daylight, the taverns and dens huddled in the ruins of Zental Keep struck Garin as squalid and small. None of the people living there showed themselves as the pirate ship set sail. As he bent his back to one of the oars and pulled, Garin began to second-guess his strategy. The moment the ship got under way— Narsk and Sorsil dropped any pretense of civility. The burly first mate armed herself with a small cudgel and roamed the main deck freely, employing the weapon against anyone who seemed to be shirking. Narsk prowled the quarter-deck, snarling savagely as he issued his orders. Worse yet, Garin's new shipmate seemed a vicious lot. Most of the crewmen were humans from a wide variety of lands— but some were dwarves, some were half-orcs, some were goblins or kin to goblins, and there was even one ogre, a strapping, dim-witted creature called Kron, who manned one of the ship's oars by himself. They wore threadbare tunics, scraps of armor, tattered cloaks, and sodden hoods or misshapen hats. Garin caught more than a few, studying him and his friends with calculating looks. Some grinned threateningly at him when he met their gaze. If there weren't a dozen ready to slit his throat for a silver talent, he would have been astonished. "'Pull, you sorry bastards!' Sorcel roared. "'The captain doesn't want to bob around in the river all damned day. The sooner we cross the bar, the sooner we'll raise sail. Now pull like you mean it!' The man sitting beside Garin at the oar bench chuckled to himself. He was a weather-beaten old shaw, with a face like seamed leather and a topknot of grey-streaked black hair. "'Every time we leave port, it is the same,' he said between strokes. "'Pull harder, pull faster. But do not worry, stranger. Narsk knows that the crew does not like to row, and he'll take the oars in soon enough.' "'You've sailed with Narsk a long time?' Garin asked. I joined Moonshark three years ago. Zaroon was the captain then, and Moonshark hunted the sea of fallen stars. The Shao gave Garin a bitter smile. Zaroon was a good captain, but he was not a good judge of men, or knolls. He signed on Narsk in Impilter as we sailed west toward the Dragon Reach, and within the month he was dead, and Narsk was captain. That was a year ago now. Garin looked up at the quarter-deck, where the knoll paced. Did Narsk challenge Zaroon, or just murder him? 
Challenge, of course. That is the Black Moon way. But you should know, stranger, that a captain is within his rights to order a challenger killed. If the crew thinks the challenger is not fit to seize the ship, they'll deal with him. No, one should be sure that the crew will stand aside before one challenges the captain. I see. Garin wasn't surprised to learn that the Black Moon pirates chose their leaders in such a manner, or that the challenge process didn't offer any guarantees to the challenger. Many outlaw gangs and brigand companies worked in much the same way. The captain could count on the protection of the crew against many challenges, but only so long as he held their confidence. Has Narsk faced many challenges? Some, the Shao gave Garin a sly look. You speak like a man who has an interest in becoming captain, Garin snorted. I don't think so. Narsk doesn't scare me, but the rest of you do. The Shao laughed aloud, attracting the attention of Sorcel. The mate growled and struck him across the shoulders, then gave Garin a clout as well. "'Enjoying the morning, lads?' she snarled. "'Now pull!' Garin saw stars. He started to surge up from his bench, but he stopped himself short. It was far too early to think about fighting anyone, and he knew that the mate had meant the blow as a sharp warning and nothing more. Instead, the sword mage clenched his jaw and chose to endure the blow with a hard look at the mate. Hamel and Sarth, sitting at the bench in front of him, hesitated half a moment in their sweep, and Hamel glanced back to meet his eyes. "'Are you certain you want to continue?' he asked silently. "'We can dispatch a few of these villains and make our escape any time you like.' Garin shook his head slightly, and went back to his rowing as Sorcel moved on to shout at a different crewman. He was here to learn more about the Black Moon Corsairs, and if he drew blade the first time he met with something he didn't like, he would never get far. Hamel shrugged and returned his attention to his own oar. "'You were wise to hold your anger,' the Shao said in a low voice. "'If you had struck back at Sorcel, Narsk would have ordered her to beat you or kill you.' He paused and then added, "'I am Tao Zhe. I am the ship's cook.' "'Call me Aram. Those two ahead of us are Vor and Dagger.' Garin nodded at Sarth and Hamel. "'What else should I know about sailing under the black moon? "'It would be wise to find a fist soon.' A fist? A band, a gang. They call them fists here, the Shao answered. One man alone is in for a difficult time aboard a Black Moon ship. Your shipmates will rob you, bully you, give you the worst jobs to do. The best protection you have is a strong fist. If your fist is strong enough, even the first mate and the captain must think twice before dealing harshly with you. After all, you might challenge the captain, and if your fist is very strong, the crew will stand aside. I see that you have a small fist already, you and your comrades here. But that is not enough. No one has reason to be wary of such a small fist. How many fists are there on Moonshark? Garin asked. Four that matter. Skamang and his Impulturians, the Dwarves and Teshans, the Malmasterites, they follow Kefin, the second mate, and the Goblins and their kin. Remember, if you pick a fight, you're taking on the whole of your foe's fist. Up oars, Sorso shouted. Garin and Tao Zhe pushed down on their end of the heavy oar, raising its blade up out of the water, as the other pairs of oarsmen along the ship's side did the same. The mate waited a moment to make sure that all of the rowers had obeyed, then called, Take in and secure your oars. They pulled the oars inboard and set them in chocks bolted to the deck, making them fast with iron pins that held the oars in place. The rest of the crew stood up and pushed their way clear of the oar sweeps. Sorcel ordered crew to set Moonshark's sails. "'I must go and see to our stores before I prepare the midday meal,' Tao Shi said. He studied Garin for a moment. "'You may not need any advice from me, but I offer it anyway.' Sorcel is no one's friend, and watch your back around Scamang there. The cook nodded at a tall, stoop-shouldered Northman, with blue whorls tattooed on his face. He's got a fist that not even Sorcel wants to cross, and he's the one man on this ship, other than Narsk, that you do not want for an enemy. I'll remember what you've told me, Garin answered. 
The cook nodded and went forward to the ship's galley. Garin went to lend a hand with the job of raising sail. Some galleys carried masts that could be unstepped and laid down flat inside the hull. But Moonshark was made for sailing first. Her two masts were fixed in place and carried a typical fore-and-aft rig. The pirate crew managed the task with a fair bit of fumbling and plenty of cudgel blows from the first mate. Many of the deckhands were no more familiar with the work of sailing a ship than Sarth was. Moonshark might be able to outsail a round-bellied cog, or outrow a coaster in a light wind, but her crew needed more practice to handle her well under sail. Garin decided that Narsk had manned her with whatever fighters and outlaws he could scrape together in the most wretched tap-rooms of the Moon Sea, whether they knew a thing about sailing or not. They passed the rest of the day working through the dozens of tasks that kept a deckhand busy. Garin quietly related to Sarth and Hamel everything Tao Zhe had told him, and the three made a point of watching out for each other. The weather was fair and cool, with a steady light wind out of the west that drove Moonshark at a slow-footed, rolling pace. The pirate ship carried many more deckhands than she needed. The sailing watch could have been handled by four or five men, but a big crew was needed for rowing and fighting. Consequently, most of the crew worked little while the ship was under sail and undertook routine tasks only when unable to pass them off to some more luckless hand. For example, the three new hands signed in Zental Keep. The sullen Northman, Skamang, held court by the foremast for most of the day, surrounded by his fist of seven or eight deckhands who did nothing at all the whole day, as far as Garin could tell. At one point, Skamang called Garin over when Garin was carrying fresh water from the ship's casks up to the galley for Tao Zhe. Ho oh, there, no man, he said in a rasping voice. What do you call yourself? Garin sat down his yoked buckets with care before answering. Aram, I heard that you and your friends cut up a couple of Robodar's lads back at the keep. Is that right? That's what happened. Skamang smiled without humor. Six of them, they say. You, the seasick sellsword with the mustache and the little fellow. I find that hard to believe. The three of you must be some fighters. Garin shrugged. Ask Sorsil if you don't believe me. She watched the whole thing. He picked up his yoke and continued on his way. He could hope that Skameng would decide that he and his friends were likely more trouble than they were worth, but somehow he doubted they'd be that lucky. He didn't need Tao Zhe's warning to sense that the tattooed Northman intended trouble for them sooner or later. The rest of the day passed peacefully enough, and the night as well. Late in the afternoon of their second day out, Moonshark came in sight of a group of black, jagged rocks jutting up out of the moon sea. Garin recognized them. They were spear-like towers of changeland known as Umberlee's Talons, and they served as a useful landmark to ships navigating in the western reaches of the moon sea. Most ships gave them a wide berth. Not only did the jagged rocks offer plenty of chances to rip out a ship's bottom, but the place had an evil reputation. They were haunted, or cursed, or concealed the lair of a mighty sea monster, or some combination of the three, depending on which tavern tale one favored. Narsk steered a course straight toward the menacing islets, and none of the other deckhands seemed very concerned when he did so. Sarth stood by the rail next to Garin, gazing at the sinister rocks. Hamel was below, sleeping after staying up most of the night on watch. Some of the rocks rose well over two hundred feet out of the water, but no seabirds hovered around them or roosted on their steep sides. "'Is this the secret Black Moon Refuge?' the tiefling asked in a low voice. "'I doubt it,' Garin answered. The talons are well known in these waters. If there was anything here but empty rocks, I think the story would have got out. Could there be some hidden anchorage here? Something hiding in plain sight? Your guess is as good as mine. The sword mage shrugged. He peered more closely at the talons as Moonshark drew near. If there was some sort of stronghold or secret harbor hidden in their midst, he couldn't see it. 
Soon enough, Sorcel ordered the sails to be taken in and called the crew to the ship's oars. She prowled the narrow walkway between the oar benches, truncheon in hand, while Narsk carefully piloted the ship between the looming rocks to a reach of clear water he liked. They dropped anchor and settled in to wait. At sunset the wind shifted to the east and strengthened. Moonshark rocked at her anchor, and the breeze moaned eerily as it blew through the sharp edges of the rocks looming overhead. Sarth and Garin exchanged looks. There was some subtle sorcery in the air, a breath of the supernatural, and both the sorcerer and the sword-mage could taste it on the wind. "'Something is approaching,' Sarth said. "'The high captain's on his way?' said a dwarf sitting on the capstan nearby. His name was Merklemore, and he smoked a simple clay pipe. He'd struck Garin as the sort to keep to himself in the few brief hours he'd been around the fellow. This is where we meet him. The wind always seems to turn when he's near. Sarth looked at the dwarf. Why, here, is there some harbor nearby? Merklemore shook his head. None to speak of. No, as I've heard it told, there's a black isle that only the high captain knows how to find. This easterly wind is the wind he needs to put to sea. A black island? Garin asked. Clearly the black moon ships had some way of staying out of sight when they wanted to. He was fairly sure he would have found something other than a single half-galley lurking in the ruins of Zental Keep if the black moon kept to the known harbors of the moon sea but he'd never heard of anything like a black island in the moon sea. The dwarf shrugged. I've no seen it myself, mind ye, but that's the tale that's told. Ship abeam to starboard, called the lookout by the bow. Garin turned to look over the starboard rail, expecting to see a distant glimmer of sail on the horizon. Instead, he blinked as the long black hull of a half-galley slid through the talons not more than four hundred yards distant. Now where in the world did she come from? he muttered to himself. He'd been looking in that direction only a few moments ago, and he would have sworn that no ship could have slipped so close to Moonshark without his noticing. Its approach might have been screened by one of the larger talons, but somehow he didn't think so. "'It's Crock and Queen,' the lookout called again. "'I can make out her figurehead.' Merklemore smiled and tapped the ashes out of his pipe. "'See, the high captain, as I told ye.' Garin leaned over the rail, staring into the gloaming. Sure enough, the mermaid-like device with the twining tentacles in place of its fishy tail glimmered in the light of the rising moon. "'This is an interesting development,' he murmured to Sarth. Now we know what Narsk was waiting for. The knoll climbed up from his cabin to the quarter-deck. Put the longboat in water, Sorcel, he snarled. He turned to pace the quarter-deck, eyes narrowed as he stared at Croc and Queen lying amid the talons. Aye, Captain, Sorcel answered. She turned and snarled at every hand who happened to be on deck at the moment. "'You heard the captain, you miserable dogs. "'Quickly now, or I'll peel the hide off the lot of you.' Garin moved over to the ship's boat, stowed across her midsection on a raised deck. He wasn't particularly worried about Sorcel's threats. But if Narsk wanted to go over to Croc and Queen, he wanted to go too. There was a chance that someone from the other pirate ship might recognize him from the skirmish on the beach, but the last time they'd seen him, it was by firelight.' and he hadn't been dressed like a common seaman with a thickly stubbled chin, and he sincerely doubted that any of the deckhands on the other ship would be expecting to see him again in the crew of another Black Moon ship. Several other crewmen joined him by the boat, and together they lifted it from its frame, turned it right side up, and maneuvered it to the rail to fix hoisting lines at its bow and stern. They lowered the boat to the water under Sorcel's watchful eye. All right. "'I need oarsmen,' the mate said. Garin made sure he was standing in plain sight, and a moment later Sorcel singled him out. "'You there!' The sword-mage feigned a grimace of annoyance, but swung his leg over the rail and dropped down the shallow rungs, bolted to the ship's side, to take up one of the oars. 
More of his shipmates followed. He glanced up at the rail, now rocking over his head, and caught Hamel looking at him. "'Good thinking, Garin,' the halfling told him. "'But pull down your hood. You look like you're up to something.' Garin reluctantly pulled his hood back down to his shoulders and waited by his oar. A moment later, Narsk clambered down the ladder and took the steersman's seat himself. He was wearing a heavy black coat and a large, wide-brimmed hat that seemed oddly out of place atop his bestial features. "'Hush off, and let's go,' the knoll ordered. The boat crew cast off the lines, pushed away from Moonshark, then fell into a strong rowing rhythm as Narsk steered them toward the other ship. The talons seemed to catch the light chop of the surrounding waters and reflect them in confused eddies. Garin decided that he wouldn't want to bring a ship too close to the towering rocks. They reached Crocken Queen and caught a line tossed down from the rail. The crew of the other ship crowded around the rail, calling down offers to trade or good-natured jibes at Moonshark's expense. As they bumped alongside the larger ship's hull, Narsk growled, "'Wait for me!' "'Oh, there, Narsk! You're the first to arrive!' "'I know that voice,' Garin realized. He twisted around on his bench and peered up at the quarter-deck of Croc and Queen. There stood the captain of the other ship, a lean man of middle years with a grey-streaked beard of black around his craggy face, and a big scarlet cloak bedecked with gold braid. Kamoth, he whispered. I don't believe it. Kamoth Castlemar was supposed to be dead. The last Garin had heard, he'd gone down with a pirate galley cornered and sunk by Mulman warships years ago. But there was no doubt of it. The captain of Crocken Queen was the same man who'd married Garin's aunt, Tarina, fifteen years ago, and brought his son Sergan to live in Griffin Watch with the Hullmasters. A gentleman of fortune, as he'd called himself then, Kamoth was the scion of minor nobility in the city of Hillsfar, a reasonable match for the sister of the Harmac. But only two years later, Garin's father discovered Kamoth engaged in all manner of foul plotting against Harmac Grigor and drove the traitor into exile. Kamoth had left his teenage son Sergan behind. By chance or design, Garin had never determined. But Harmac Grigor had decided that the boy was not to be held responsible for the crimes of his father and raised Sergan as a member of his own family. "'What's the matter with ye?' Merklemore growled at Garin. The dwarf had the seat next to Garin's. "'That one's as mad as a man shown. He'd just as soon kill ye as look at ye. Meet his eye, and he's like to think ye mean to challenge him.' Garin shook his head and turned his face away. He doubted that Kamoth would recognize him. He'd been a lad of seventeen years the last time Kamoth had seen him. The strangest part of it was that he'd always liked Kamoth. During the brief time he'd spent in Hullberg, Garin hadn't seen anything other than the man's bluff good cheer and roguish charm. It was only much later that he'd discovered how thoroughly he and the rest of his family had been taken in. "'Who is he?' he asked the dwarf. "'That's the high captain of the Black Moon,' Merklemore answered. "'All the other captains, including our own Narsk, sail at his word. Kamoth, his name is.' Crocken Queen is his. Garin risked another look. Narsk and Kamoth were deep in conversation, the knoll towering over the pirate lord, but bobbing and nodding his head in response to Kamoth's words. Kamoth turned aside, calling for someone near him, and Sergan Hallmaster stepped into view, a leather letter case in his hands, and handed the packet to Kamoth to give to the knoll. Sergan glanced out toward Moonshark and down to the longboat, bobbing at the side of the pirate lord's ship. At the last moment, Garin averted his eyes and turned his back to the quarter-deck. Kamoth was unlikely to recognize him, but Sergan knew him very well indeed. A momentary hint of recognition, a single suspicion, could set a hundred blades at Garin's throat. Not knowing what else to do, Garin kept his face turned toward Moonshark, looking away from the quarter-deck, and imagined Sergan's eyes boring into his back. 
a black smile of satisfaction twisting Sergan's haughty expression, the first snort of derisive laughter. Well, now I know why the Black Moon pirates have been seeking out Hullberg's shipping, he thought furiously. Sergan enlisted his father's pirate fleet to continue his effort to unseat the Hullmasters. Or was it the other way around? Had Kamoth directed Sergan's plots and betrayals all along? A sudden clatter on the ladder steps climbing the ship's side caught Garin's attention. He glanced up, expecting to see pirates scrambling down to seize him where he sat. But instead it was simply Narsk returning to the longboat. The knoll tucked the mysterious letter-case into his coat pocket and seated himself by the rudder. Sergan was nowhere in sight, but Kamoth still leaned over the rail. Seven nights, Narsk, he called. Don't get caught up in any other sport between now and then. Moonshark will not be late, high captain, the knoll answered. He waved at the oarsmen, and Garin started pulling with the rest, keeping his eyes in the longboat's bottom. Garin did not look up again until Crocken Queen was a good hundred yards astern. He could still make out Kamoth's scarlet cloak on the quarter-deck, and thought he saw Sergan's black coat close by. He heaved a breath of relief, and put his back into the sweeps. For the moment it seemed that he was safe, and neither of the two traitors suspected that a hullmaster had been bobbing up and down in a small boat not twenty-five feet from their quarter-deck. He'd hoped to find a way to eavesdrop on Narsk and Kamoth, but for the moment he was glad to have avoided discovery. "'Pull, you dogs!' Narsk snapped. "'I mean to be underway in half an hour, and I'll flog the first ten men I see if we aren't!' Garin joined the other oarsmen as they threw themselves into their work. His hands throbbed and his shoulders ached, but he smiled to himself when his eye fell on the leather letter-case sitting in Narsk's coat pocket. He might not have missed his opportunity to eavesdrop after all if he could only examine Narsk's letter. All he had to do was find a chance to break into the knoll's cabin and steal it without getting caught. 9. Thirty Elint, the Year of the Ageless One, 1479, D.R. Evening was descending over Hallberg as Miria locked up Erstenwold's provisioners and prepared to go home for the evening. It had been a slow day, but right before closing time, a farmer from the Winterspear Vale had shown up with a whole wagon load of cheese, bacon, smoked hams, and other foodstuffs to sell. By the time she'd finished with their business and had overseen the unloading of the wagon, it was an hour past the time that she normally locked up. Most of Hallberg's shopkeepers lived above or behind their places of business, but the Erstenwolds were a family that had been in Hallberg for a long time, and Mirja's house was a comfortable cottage surrounded by a small apple orchard on the river's west bank, a little less than a mile distant. Anxious to start for home, she went to the store's back door, the one that led out into the alleyway behind Plank Street, and looked up and down the narrow way for any sign of Salsha. Salsha, she called into the gloaming. Her daughter was nowhere in sight, but Miriam knew that she was rarely out of earshot. She could remember her own mother calling for her at the end of the day when she was a child, and supposed that she probably sounded a lot like that to Salsha's ears. A mother's voice carried a long way, as she recalled. "'Salsha, it's time to go home.' She heard nothing at first, and peered up and down the alleyway behind the storehouse. She rarely stayed at the shop this late into the evening, and the shadows were long and dark in Hullberg streets. The buildings surrounding Erstenwolds did not seem so friendly or familiar as night descended over the town. During the day these streets were busy with scores of neighbors that Miria knew well, the cooper across the alley, the tinsmith next to him, old Mother Gresha and her laundry tub two doors down, and Auntie Tilsey, who sold scores of simple meals to the town's porters and drivers, every day from her kitchen around the corner from that. 
all of them doted on Sasha, and were happy to let her pester them during the day, but they were all closing up or indoors now. After sunset, Holberg's tap houses and taverns filled up, and instead of watchful neighbors, the streets would be left to strangers, searching for a place to drink themselves into a stupor. Miria frowned at that thought and raised her voice. Selsha, where are you? I'm coming, Mama. Selsha appeared at the end of the alleyway and ran to the door. She was a slip of a girl, just nine years old, with wide blue eyes that had a way of disarming Miria's most furious moments, and with silky black hair just like her own. Where were you? Did you not hear me calling? Miria scolded her. She bustled Selsha into the store and pulled the door closed behind her. I was worried about you, Selsha. I'm sorry, Mama, Selsha replied. Then she held out her hand. But look, I found something. Miria looked down into her daughter's hand. It was an amulet of some kind on a silver chain. She could see at once that it was valuable, and she reached down to gently lift it from Sasha's grasp. What is this? she murmured, and she looked closer. The amulet was formed in the shape of a sunburst, but the rays were jet, and in the center gleamed a jawless skull of silver. She stared at it in growing horror realizing that what she held in her hand was a holy symbol of Sirik, the Black Sun, the god of lies and murder. With a small cry, she let it drop to the floor. "'What? What is it?' Selsha asked. "'Something that we are not to handle lightly,' Miria answered. She rubbed her hand briskly against her skirt, unable to stop herself. "'Selsha, where did you find this?' Selsha looked down, and her lip started to quiver. Miria realized that her own sudden alarm had frightened the girl. "'I'm sorry, Mama. I'm sorry. I didn't mean I didn't know.' Miria took a deep breath and kneeled down by Sasha, wrapping her arms around her daughter and stroking her hair. "'No, no, Sasha. All is well,' she said softly. "'I am not angry with you. I was only surprised. Now tell me, how did you find the amulet?' "'Kinda and I were playing in the empty storehouse on Fish Street. "'I know we're not supposed to, but no one was around. "'Anyway, I found it on the floor. "'See, the chain's broken. "'I think someone dropped it and didn't even know. "'Kinda and I were looking at it when we heard some men come in. "'They sounded angry, and we were afraid we would get into trouble, "'so we hid until they left. "'Did the men see you?' "'The girl shook her head.' Miria picked up the amulet from the floor, suppressing a shudder of distaste. Do you think they were looking for this? This time, Sasha nodded slowly. I heard one man say he thought it might have fallen through the floorboards, and the other man told him to go get a crowbar so they could pry up the floor and look for it. You shouldn't have been in someone else's storehouse, abandoned or not, and well you know it. She gave Selsha a stern look and stood up, slipping the amulet into a pocket of her dress as she turned away, thinking about what to do with the thing. A token of Sirik was not prohibited by any law she knew of, nor was it an evil thing in and of itself. The Black Sun was not a god that she cared to honor, but then again few people truly revered such things as murder or strife. Most people either gave Sirik his due, in order to avert his attention, or looked past the darker aspects of his doctrines, and instead saw him as a deity of ambition and determination, the sort of god who encouraged his followers in their desire to fight their way up, out of their circumstances, no matter what it took. The poor foreigners who huddled in miserable neighborhoods, such as the tailings, sometimes turned to grim gods like Sirik out of simple desperation. Miria couldn't blame them for being attracted by promises of prosperity and success. Of course, she didn't doubt that there were truly malicious followers of the Black Sun in those same neighborhoods. Slavers, thieves, and robbers of all sorts looked to Sirik for favor, too, and there were plenty of those in the tailings. But what Selsha had found wasn't simply a charm or token. It was a holy symbol of the sort a high-ranking priest might carry. She could sense the enchantment of the thing. It was precious to somebody. Now, what should we do with it? 
she muttered to herself. She certainly didn't want to keep it. She could have Selsha put it back where she found it, but if Selsha was right, the men she'd overheard were already looking for it, and Miria was not about to send her daughter into the hands of someone who might be a zealous follower of Sirik. Either she'd have to take it back herself, or she'd have to throw it away somewhere. Someone knocked sharply on the alley door. Miria started and looked at the door. Only a neighbor would come by that door, and her neighbors were all at their supper tables by now. The knock came again. "'Who is it, Mama? Selcha asked in a small voice. "'I've no idea.' Miria frowned at the door and smoothed the front of her dress. "'This is ridiculous,' she told herself. "'It's probably Tilsey come to borrow some flour.' Still, her intuition told her that wasn't so. She set a hand on Selcha's shoulder. "'Stay here, dear. I'll see who it is.' She went to the door, calmed herself for a moment, then lifted the bar and pulled the door open a foot or so. "'Yes,' she said. Outside in the alley stood a pale, fair-haired man in a laborer's garb. Streaks of gray marked his temples and the neatly trimmed square of beard under his chin. He stood with a strange, distracted smile on his face, but his eyes were dark and intense. "'Ah, you must be Mistress Erstenwold,' he said. "'I'm afraid we're closed for the evening. "'If you come back tomorrow, I'm not here on business,' the man said. "'He held up a hand to forestall her protest. "'She noticed a fine gold ring on his little finger, "'and the smoothness of his palm found herself doubting very much "'whether he was as poor as his clothing suggested. "'I understand.' "'that you have a young daughter who might have been playing out in the neighborhood today. "'A dark-haired girl, perhaps ten years of age. Is that so?' "'A cold stab of fear sank into Miria's heart. "'I, it is,' she said slowly. "'Then perhaps she might have found something I lost, "'something rather valuable to me. "'By any chance have you seen a silver amulet?' It would be marked with the emblem of a silver skull, the man affected a shrug. A keepsake, but one I would very much like to find. Miria kept her face neutral. She was sorely tempted to deny it outright, but a small voice warned her that the stranger wouldn't be at her door unless he had a very strong suspicion about the amulet's location already. Priests sometimes knew finding spells of different sorts, and he might have already divined where his holy symbol was. She wished a couple of her clerks were still on the premises. She did not like being alone with this man at her door. The stranger took her hesitation for confusion. "'Perhaps you could call your daughter to the door? I'd like to ask her about it, just in case, you understand.' As little as she liked the half-smile on his face, or the strange intensity of his eyes, she liked the idea of this man speaking to Salsha much less. She reached into her pocket before she even realized what she was doing, and held the amulet out to him. "'There'll be no need for that,' she said. "'She found this in the alley a little ways from here. Is it yours?' The pale man gently took it out of her hand and glanced at it. He smiled broadly and inclined his head, but his eyes remained cold, almost serpentine. "'Why, it is indeed,' he said. "'Now, I wonder how it came to be lying out in the alleyway. Doesn't that seem strange? It looks like the chain has a broken link.' "'It does.' The man carefully gathered up the silver skull and slipped it into his pocket. She noticed a gray smudge across the back of his hand as he did so, and her eyes narrowed. It seemed to her very much like the sort of smudge that someone who marked his fist with soot might have on the back of his hand. Either her visitor was one of the cinder fists, which seemed unlikely, since he did not strike her as a man who'd seen the inside of a foundry, or had shoveled coal into a furnace, or he at least wanted people to believe that he was. Then the man leaned to one side, looking past Miria into the hallway behind her. "'And look, that must be your daughter.' 
Miria glanced behind her and realized that Selsha was standing just a few feet behind her, staring at the pale man. Her daughter must have come out from the store's front room while Miria was speaking with the stranger. She looked back quickly to the man, but he just smiled again, a smile that still did not reach his eyes, and said, "'What a lovely child! You are quite fortunate, Mistress Erstenwold, quite fortunate indeed.' "'Thank you,' said Miria, her voice thick. She did not know what else to say. The idea of this man making small talk with her about her daughter chilled her to the marrow. "'You should speak to her about picking up things she finds in alleys, though. "'Good evening, Mistress Erstenwold.' The man nodded to her and strode off into the gathering shadows. Miria shut the door firmly and shot the bolt— then she hurried Selsha home, starting at every shadow along the way. The next day passed without event, but at noon of the day after that, Miria thought she saw the hooded man watching Selsha when she came back to Erstenwold's after playing with her friends in the morning. She stepped out into the alleyway and looked again, but the man was nowhere in sight. The encounter was unsettling enough that she dwelled on it all day long. She moved through the rest of her day in a distracted, pensive mood, her mind turning over the implications. She'd seen the man's face, and she knew him for a servant of Cyric. If he wanted to be sure of keeping his identity a secret, he would have to make sure she did not speak of it again. Perhaps he was simply allowing her to see him to intimidate her. Or, it was possible, he contemplated more stringent measures to keep his secret. By the middle of the afternoon, she called Salsha back inside, and told her that she had to remain inside in the Erstenwold store and storehouse until she told her otherwise. The next morning she slipped away from Erstenwold's for an hour, hurrying up to Griffinwatch to speak to the Shieldsworn. Garin and Kara were both away at sea, but her brother Jared— had served as the captain of the Harmac's soldiers for years before his death, and they'd thought the world of him. She met with Sergeant Colton and told her story, but the veteran had little he could offer her. "'We've not found out much at all about who runs the Cinderfists,' he told her. "'They're a close-mouthed lot, they are, mostly men from Impilter, and they know their own. There's not a single native-born Halbergen who works in the foundries.' I might have guessed that an outlander priest of Cyric is mixed up in it. So you've no idea who he is or what he might be up to? she asked. Colton shook his head. You know as much as we do, Mistress Erstenwold. I can make sure the shield sworn check on Erstenwold's regularly, at least for a few days. If you see the fellow you spoke with lurking nearby, I'd appreciate it if you pointed him out to the Harmax men. You're the only native-born Hulbergen who knows his face, as far as I can tell. Miria frowned at that thought. It might be very important to the stranger to remain unknown, and she could think of only one way that a man in his position might make sure of his anonymity. She found herself wishing that Garin was in town. It wasn't in her nature to play the damsel in distress— but in the months since Garin had returned to Hullberg, they'd slowly fumbled their way to something like friendship again, and perhaps a troubling flicker of something more than that. When it came to Garin Hullmaster, she was not necessarily the master of her own heart. She knew herself well enough to keep any such nonsense at a very safe distance indeed, but she also knew that Garin would turn the tailings upside down, to ferret out the hooded man, if he found out that someone had threatened her, or Selsha. In any event, Garin was away on Sea Drake, chasing after pirates, and that left matters squarely in her own lap. Colton took her silence for a reproach. The blunt-faced sergeant sighed. "'We're stretched thin, Mistress Erstenwold. You know that.' There's nothing the shield sworn wouldn't do for you or your daughter, for Captain Jared's sake, if nothing else. But if you're worried, you might also speak to the moon shields. They don't like the cinderfists much at all. I'm sure that Brun Austin can make sure a couple of his lads are close at hand whenever the shield sworn aren't. 
Thank you, Sergeant Colton. I might at that. Miria took her leave and drove back down to Erstenwold's, wrapped in her thoughts as her wagon rattled through the rough cobblestone streets. She hoped that the shield sworn would know who the hooded man was, but clearly that wasn't the case. That didn't mean there weren't people in Hallberg who might know more. There was one other place she could turn to, but that was a bridge she'd burned a long time ago. Miria reined in the two-horse team just a few dozen yards short of the lower bridge at the end of East Street, and sat there thinking things through. Then she tapped her switch to the horses and turned left, climbing up Hill Street instead of crossing the Winter Spear and heading back toward Erstenwold's. Hullberg's East Hill was a strange mix of old and new. Much of its seaward face had been ruined during the spell plague of a century ago, replaced by the jumble of soaring green stone known as the Arches. On its western side, a poor, working-class neighborhood clustered hard by East Street and the Winter Spear. Around the point to the east, the homes became little more than shanties housing the hundreds of men who toiled in the smelters and foundries a mile downwind of Hullberg proper. But the higher elevations of the East Hill, above the crowded neighborhood overlooking the Winter Spear, were the places where Hullberg's wealthy lived in grand old houses and gated manors. Miria drove her team to a fine old house hidden behind a screen of low, wind-twisted cedars. She set the brake, slid down from the wagon's seat, then climbed a short flight of stone steps to the house's front door and knocked firmly before she could change her mind. Nothing happened for a long moment, and Miria began to wonder if anyone was home. But then the door opened, and a young woman with long black hair and a plain dress of gray wool looked out. Yes, she said. I'm here to call on Mistress Senefir, Miria said. My name is Miria Erstenwold. I'm not expected. The servant studied her for a moment before answering. "'Wait here. I will see if the mistress is available.' She disappeared back into the shadows of the house. The front room was dark, with heavy drapes drawn over the windows, while Miria waited on the porch. Then the servant returned and offered a slight bow. "'She will see you. Follow me, if you please.' The servant showed Miria to a sitting-room, as dark as the foyer and Miria took a seat on a plush couch. She did not have long to wait. Just a moment later, a woman in an elegant purple gown glided into the room, her hands folded at her waist. She was perhaps forty-five years of age, but her hair was still a soft brown, untouched by gray, and her face was smooth. Only the shadow of frown lines at the corners of her mouth and a cool, commanding sternness to her dark gaze hinted at her age. She looked at Miria with a small smile, then said, "'Well, well, Miria Erstenwold, you haven't stopped by my home in years and years. I confess I am surprised to see you here.' Miria rose and bowed her head. "'Mistress Senefir, thank you for seeing me.' "'Not at all!' "'We have missed you, my dear. "'Tell me, how is young Selsha?' "'Very well. "'She just passed her ninth birthday.' "'Indeed,' Senefir raised an eyebrow. "'What have you told her about her father?' "'Miria kept a neutral expression on her face, "'but flinched inwardly. "'There were a few things in her life that she truly regretted, "'but what she had done to the man who'd fathered Selsha "'was one of them. "'Senefir knew that, of course.' She was the one who had arranged the whole thing, drawing Miria deeper and deeper into her snares, at a time when Miria had been younger, more foolish, anxious to find approval in her eyes. It was a mistake to come here, she told herself. Senefir had not forgotten any of her old cruelty, but to flee now would gain Miria nothing. Instead, she made herself answer the question with iron truthfulness. I told her that I knew him only for a short time, and that he died soon after she was born. I'll tell her no more than that for now. Poor Miria, you were always so strong, so clever, and so much was asked of you. 
Senefir offered her a small smile. "'The lady chose a difficult path for you. I know it. But you must understand that you will find no easing of your pain as long as you refuse to go as you have been called. Circe's lies in surrender to the lady's will. It is never too late to return to the path awaiting you. I've not forgotten it, Mistress Senefir, for now I choose to go my own way. The day will come when no other comfort avails you, my child. The lady knows her own, and once you have been in her embrace, you will always be hers. We will await your return. Senefir folded her hands in her lap. Now, I doubt that you came to my house to seek the lady's comfort. You want something of the sisterhood. Myria grimaced. Senefir had never been stupid, either. Well, I... "'though I hope that you'll see it to be in your own interest, too. "'No justification is necessary, my child. "'I have not forgotten your devotion to the lady, "'even if you have for a time. "'How may I be of service to you?' "'Miria smoothed her skirt. "'She had never been one to fence at words. "'The worst of it was that some long-buried part of her "'ached to answer Senefir's words of forgiveness, "'to return to the sisterhood she had left "'and make amends for the faithlessness of the intervening years. "'She fixed her mind firmly on the task ahead "'and ignored her old guilt. "'I found out a servant of Cyric a few days ago, "'a pale man in a hood, masquerading as a common laborer. "'He knows that I know his secret.' I need to learn his name and what purpose he has in Hullberg. And you thought we might know something about him? Senefir reached over to the table next to her and poured herself a cup of tea. My dear, we have nothing to do with the Black Sun's minions. I know, but there's not much that happens in Hullberg that the Sisterhood doesn't see. If the servants of Cyric are preaching to the poor folk of the tailings, or stirring up trouble with the cinder fists, the Sisterhood would know of it. And if you did learn this man's name, what would you do? See to it that the Harmac knew it, too. I see. Senefir sipped at her tea. It is no secret that Garen Hullmaster is close to you. I imagine that a word whispered in his ear would reach the Harmac soon enough. For that matter, I would be surprised if Garin did not act on such information himself. He is not one to hesitate over such matters. But how do you see this as a concern for the Sisterhood? It seems to me that the Cinderfists are exactly the sort of trouble a servant of Cyric would foment among the poor outlanders of the town. Miria paused, choosing her next words carefully. I'd imagine that the hooded priest teaches the folk of the tailings to rebel against their circumstances, to fight against their sorrows. Where would those folk turn if he were to leave? More than a few might seek comfort in the lady's embrace, mightn't they? Senefir gazed thoughtfully at Miria. It pleases me to hear you speak so, Miria. I'm weary of the troubles plaguing my home, Mistress Senefir. Someone is stoking the fires, and I want an end to it. Miria didn't doubt that there would be trouble of a different sort if the Lady of Sorrows came to hold the hearts of Hullberg's poorest folk, but at least the Sisterhood wouldn't incite riots and rebellion in the streets. Besides, she was sure that she was not saying anything that hadn't occurred to Mistress Senefir already. The Sisterhood would approve, Senefir said. She took another sip from her cup and set it down in its saucer. Very well, we have heard something of this. As you guess, a few of our sisters are newcomers to Hullberg. They hear things from the other outlanders that the native-born do not. I think that one of them might know the man you encountered. I do not know who he is, but she might. Go to the Three Crowns and ask for Ingra. Thank you, Mistress Senefir. It is nothing, dear Miria, but you must go in secret. Ingra will help another sister, but only if no one sees her to do so. I understand. Miria stood and inclined her head to Senefir, who returned a gracious nod. I hope you will visit again soon, Miria. I know in my heart that the lady's full purpose for you is still to be revealed. 
Senefir stood and watched as the servant returned to show Myria to the door. After the gloom of Senefir's house, the overcast day seemed clean and whole to Myria. She drew a deep breath and climbed back up to the seat of her wagon. She thought now that it would have been better if she hadn't come, but she'd done it, and there was nothing to be gained by second-guessing her decision now. The only question was whether she'd find an answer at the three crowns worth the price of reminding Senefir and the sisterhood that she remembered them. 10. To Marpanoth, the year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. Narsk set his course eastward from the meeting at the Talons, swinging far out to sea around Hillsfar, then closing on the Moon Sea's southern coastline once the well-defended port was a good thirty or forty miles astern. Moonshark ran under a full spread of canvas by day, making good time. By night, Narsk ordered Sorsel to take in sail and slow their pace, which was not unusual for ships sailing the Moon Sea. For the most part, the great lake was deep and uncluttered by islands or reefs, so most captains kept some sail on during all but the darkest of nights. It proved much harder to find an opportunity to slip into Narsk's cabin than Garin would have imagined. The chief difficulty was that Narsk rarely left his cabin and did not linger for long on the deck when he did. The knoll took all his meals in his room and issued most of his orders through Sorsel. Garin had several ideas in mind for actually slipping inside without being seen, if Narsk would simply vacate his cabin for a decent amount of time. If nothing else, he knew a spell of teleportation he could use from the usually empty storeroom under the captain's cabin. He considered trying to surprise and overpower the knoll by teleporting into the cabin without warning. But he couldn't be certain that he could do it in absolute silence and slip away again unseen. That meant he and his friends might have to deal with the rest of Moonshark's crew, and Garin didn't care for the odds if it came to that. While waiting and watching for the chance to move, Garin and his friends settled into the ship's routine. The weather turned cold and damp on their second night from the Talons, and the ship slipped through intermittent showers as she continued eastward. As the newest hands on board, they were assigned to the mid-watch under the second mate, a portly Malmasterite named Keffen. That meant they had to stand watch in the middle of the night and catch what little sleep they could before and after. At least Keffen was more or less indifferent to the three of them, so long as they didn't bungle the few adjustments to the sails he saw fit to make during the night. The second mate drank steadily from a large leather flask he kept hidden under his cloak throughout the watch without showing any sign of growing drunk and ignored the deckhands otherwise. During their second mid-watch with Keffen, the rains were especially persistent. After several hours of standing lookout and scrambling aloft when the second mate ordered them to, all three companions were soaked, shivering, and generally miserable. "'I am not enjoying this,' Sarth muttered to Garin as they went back below. "'Truly, is this necessary?' "'We'll give it two or three more days,' Garin replied under his breath. Something may turn up, and I'd still like to know what Kamoth is planning. The tiefling grimaced under his magical guise. Very well, but I will think twice before I accompany you on your next ill-considered venture. Later that morning, Garin was hard at work splicing an old, well-worn line, a particularly tedious and exacting job that the tattooed Northman Skamang had foisted off on him. When the cry of Sail Ho! Fine on the port beam, came from the lookout aloft. He stood and shaded his eyes with his hand, looking for the other ship. This time it was indeed a fair distance off, easily seven or eight miles, and all that could be seen of it was the mast. Sorsel summoned Narsk to the quarter-deck, and the two conferred quickly before the knoll ordered the helmsman to turn and sent the watch aloft to crowd on more sail. The wind favored Moonshark. 
By good fortune, the pirate galley was well positioned to run down her quarry with the morning sun at her back, and a freshening crosswind that let Narsk aim the galley's bow a little ahead of the other ship. Garin glanced at the sky. It was overcast, but no storms or squalls seemed likely to appear, and they were at least thirty or forty miles from any sort of harbor. Unless the cog was faster than she looked, he guessed they'd catch her in a couple of hours. Most of the crew was gathered along the rail, gazing greedily at the other ship. Some were already picking out weapons for the anticipated boarding. Hamel and Sarth climbed up from the galley, where they'd been sent to help Tao Zhe with his scullery work. The halfling looked around at the pirate crew, then up at Garin. "'What's going on?' "'Narsk's sighted prey,' Garin said in a low voice. He pointed. "'We're trying to chase down that cog there.' "'Well, there it is,' Hamel murmured after peering over the rail. "'What do we do if Narsk catches her?' he asked. Do we go along with the rest of the crew and keep to our ruse, or do we interfere and keep Narsk from taking that ship? Garin looked down at his friend, brow creased in worry. I don't know, he said. He should have anticipated they might find themselves in this very situation. He didn't doubt the three of them could find a way to fight ineffectively, or hang back from the worst of what was coming. But their shipmates might notice— and that would do very little to advance their standing in the crew. More to the point, it would hardly absolve the three of them of responsibility for not thwarting a pirate attack that they were in position to foil. But it was hard to see how that wouldn't give away their ploy and bring their effort to infiltrate the Black Moon to an end. Sarth glanced at Hamel. The ghost-wise halfling was evidently repeating his question for the tiefling. Sarth looked around to see if any of the crew were in earshot, and leaned on the rail beside Garin. "'A difficult decision,' he said. "'I am not sure how to counsel you, Garin, but I suppose you could consider the matter in this way. What would have happened if we weren't aboard? It seems that Moonshark would catch the merchant and take her without our help. Our participation wouldn't change what fate had already intended for that ship. For that matter, it might not be in our power to prevent an attack. There are only three of us, after all. If we can't prevent Narsk from taking that ship, then we might as well maintain the ruse. What we learn here may save other lives on some other day. I hear you. Garin answered. But, as it turns out, we are aboard, and nothing is fated at the moment. Besides, we'd have the advantage of surprise, and your magic as well. If we deal with a few key crewmen right at the outset, the rest might lose their nerve. I think I'm with Sarth on this, Hamel said softly. I'm not anxious to pick a fight with fifty enemies for the sake of total strangers, but we might be able to interfere in another way. If the ship were to lose a sail, or the rudder were to fail— "'It will mean a fight if we're caught at it,' Sarth answered. Garin thought of what Nemessa had told him about the fate of White Wing's crew. If they stood aside or went along because the merchant was doomed anyway, they'd still be a party to the worst sort of murder. They might be able to defeat Moonshark's crew by killing Narsk, Sorcel, and perhaps Skamang or Keffen quickly, but it was probably more likely that any such mad assault would succeed only in getting all three of them killed, and he was not any more eager than Hamel to lose his life for a handful of strangers. If we can keep Narsk and the rest of the cutthroats on this ship from murdering the crew and passengers of some hapless ship, I think we have to try, he said. Hamel's suggestion has merit. We'll just have to make sure no one notices. Over the next hour, Moonshark steadily closed on the cog. Garin was surprised to see that the merchant ship didn't try to flee, but instead kept to her original course. Either she hadn't noticed the pirate galley on her beam, which seemed more and more unlikely, or the captain blithely assumed that he sailed in friendly waters. He supposed it was possible that the merchant captain had already determined for himself that there was no escape, and therefore hoped 
to bluff his way out of an attack by a simple show of boldness, but that struck him as even more unlikely. As the pirate galley slowly overtook the merchant Cog, Garin and his comrades began to plan their act of sabotage. They were well along in their planning, and the Cog was a little less than a mile off, when Sorcel shouted down at the main deck from her position by the helm, "'Back to your stations!' the first mate called. "'Go on, you dogs! There's nothing for us here!' Garin and his companions exchanged looks, then turned to the quarter-deck. Narsk gripped the rail, glaring at the cog with his fangs bared. Then he snarled something to Sorcel and stormed off the quarter-deck, disappearing into his cabin once more. Sorcel took one more look at the cog, then ordered the helmsman to turn away. Moonshark turned smartly to starboard and cut across the wake of the ship, a mile astern of her, now running downwind. "'What in the world?' Garin asked aloud. "'What was that about?' He heard a few murmurs from other crew, too, likely expressing the same sentiment. "'Narsk gave up the pursuit,' Sarth observed. "'Why would he do that?' "'Look,' Hamel said. "'The merchants raised a pennant.' Garin turned back to the cog, now falling astern. A pennant floated in the breeze from the ship's mainmast. He was sure it hadn't been there a few minutes ago, so the cog's captain must have just ordered it flown. It was a quartered flag of red and gold, and Garin knew it well. "'That's a house Marstall ship,' he said. "'Marstall? As in the Marstalls of Hullberg?' Sarth asked. "'Yes,' Garin replied. "'That double-dealing bastard. "'He's paid off the Black Moon to leave his ships alone, "'and he was the one who argued for the Harmac to do something about piracy.' "'Badgering the Harmac to do something "'likely kept other merchant companies from making a deal with the pirates,' Hamel said. "'Lord Marstall's a sly old fox, if that's the case. "'I never would have thought he had it in him.' "'Nor would I.' Garin said. He frowned, trying to figure out what to make of it. Then the pirates crowded along the rail, drifted back to their duties, and the ship returned to its routine. The crew's disappointment at being turned away from a prize in their grasp likely accounted for what happened that evening. Moonshark was too small to have anything like a mess deck. The galley was located in the forecastle and Tao Zhe, the cook, ladled the evening stew into whatever cup or bowl each man brought to him. After receiving warm food and a hunk of coarse bread, the deckhands retreated to whatever corner of the main deck they could find that offered shelter from the weather and a good place to sit and eat. Garin, Hamel, and Sarth had just settled down to their unappetizing meals when several crewmen belonging to Skamang's fist sauntered up to them. A round-bellied Chessington named Parike, who shaved his head and wore large gold earrings, led the band. "'Get up, new fish,' he snarled. "'That's our place you're in.' "'It looks like Skamang's decided to try us out,' Hamel observed. With a sigh, he carefully set his dinner on the deck. "'It suits me well enough,' Garin answered Parike. It would have been easier to defer and avoid what was coming, but he suspected that he'd be at Skamang's beck and call for the rest of the voyage if he did. Standing up to Parike now, and showing a quick and violent temper, might save him no end of trouble later, as well as furthering their ruse. Besides, he was in a foul temper, and he didn't like the look of the fellow. "'Go find a different place,' Parike grinned. "'So!' "'You're too good to take your supper somewhere else,' he said. He slapped Garin's dinner tin out of his hands, spilling the stew. "'You can't eat it off the deck, then. What do you think about that new fish?' Without a moment's thought, Garin seized his dinner tin from the deck and leaped to his feet. He didn't have to feign his anger. Before he could think better of it, he threw the tin and the remaining stew in Perike's face. Parike recoiled, belatedly raising his arms to defend himself, but Garin planted his boot at the Chessington's belt buckle and propelled him back across the deck. The pirate stumbled to the deck and rolled, fetching up against the opposite gunwale. "'I think I'll knock out your damned teeth, that's what I think,' Garin snarled at him. 
He took two steps toward Perike, intending to administer the beating of a lifetime to the Chessington, but heavy footsteps to his right caught his attention. The ogre Kron stood close by, glaring down at him with his piggish little eyes. Behind him, the tattooed Northman Skamang sat watching with a small smile on his face. Kron spoke in a rumbling voice. No headed Perike, he said. That mean any Skamang's fist can hid you. Kron belong Skamang's fist. Kron hid you. The ogre lashed out with one enormous fist, mashing it straight down as if he meant to drive a nail into the deck. Garin leaped backward out of the way, not with any particular grace. His old mentor Dariad would have winced. He'd always said that Garin had the slow-footedness of any big human. The elf blade singer could have evaded Kron's fist with half a step and a twist of his shoulders. Hamel could have, too. But Garin's off-balance jump was enough to get him out from under Kron's blow. The ogre bellowed in annoyance and sprang after him. Garin skirted around the mainmast to put it between him and his foe, buying himself a moment to think. Sarth and Hamel surged to their feet and moved forward to join the fray, while the rest of Perike's little gang dropped their own suppers to the deck and stood their ground. But Merklemore, the dwarf, moved between them and held up his hand. "'None of that now,' he shouted. "'Your man laid hands on one of Scumming's fist, and Scumming's fist chose one of their own to answer him. It's the way it's done. Take another step.' and it's a matter for the captain to settle. "'I will not stand aside and watch that ogre bludgeon my friend,' Sarth snarled. "'You will, if you know what's good for him and for you,' the dwarf answered. Two men fight. It's between them. Any more join in, and the captain has to put a stop to it.' "'Stand your ground,' Garin shouted at Sarth. "'Keep it between Kron and me.' Garin had faced ogres before." They were immensely strong and big enough to shrug off wounds that would have incapacitated a human opponent, but they were slow and lacked skill, relying entirely on their size and strength. With a sword in his hand, he wouldn't have shied from a duel against Kron, but he had only his bare hands for this fight. He circled the mainmast again. Kron went low and lunged forward, and this time the ogre managed to catch hold of Garin's ankle. He yanked Garin's foot out from under him and dragged the sword mage across the deck, raising one meaty fist to crush Garin while he had hold of him. Garin tried to wrench his foot out of the ogre's grasp and failed. In desperation he used the ogre's grip to anchor his left leg while he scissored up with his right. He caught the ogre on the point of his heavy jaw with a strong kick, spoiling Kron's aim. Kron's fist mostly missed him as it crashed into his ribs, batting him down to the deck again. Garin's breath left him in a whooshing exhalation, and he gasped for air. But before Kron could finish him with a solid punch, he drove his right heel into the meaty paw gripping his ankle and bent the ogre's thumb in a direction it was not supposed to go. Kron howled, and Garin scrambled free, still trying to find his breath. "'Keep after him, Kron!' Perike cried. "'You almost had him there!' "'Don't let the ogre grab you like that!' Hamel shouted at Garin. "'Never would have thought of that!' Garin wheezed. Kron lunged for him again, and this time he threw himself under the ogre's long arms and drove his head into Kron's gut. The ogre lost his breath this time, and before he recovered, Garin threw several wild uppercuts under Kron's chin. It was like punching a bull. The ogre's head barely moved. The blows had little effect other than enraging Kron, and Garin quickly backed away again as Kron swung wildly and stumbled to one knee. A reckless idea struck Garin, and he paused just in front of the mainmast as the ogre wound up for another punch. This time the sword mage stayed still until the very last instant before dropping to the deck under the punch. Instead of pulping Garin's head like a melon, Kron drove his fist into the mainmast. The whole mast shuddered, but not even an ogre could damage it with a punch. He howled and clutched his mashed knuckles. Ron 
Cool you for thud, the ogre roared. Garin rolled away across the deck and regained his feet. But Kron seized a heavy block and chain from its place by the mainmast, wielding the wooden pulley like a crude flail. He lashed out furiously at Garin, each whistling blow smashing splinters from the deck or crashing against mast and gunwale. Corsairs gathered around to watch the brawl, yelped in alarm and scrambled back out of the way, although one unfortunate fellow caught the heavy block high on his shoulder on Kron's backswing and was knocked spinning to the deck. Garin wheeled from side to side, searching for a weapon of his own. He didn't know what the Black Moon had to say about weapons in a brawl, but he'd have to deal with that later. First, he had to avoid getting killed. "'Dagger coming!' Hamel warned him. Garin looked back over to his friend, just in time to catch the heavy poniard Hamel tossed to him. It was not much of a defense against Kron's overwhelming strength and reach, but the feel of steel in his hand was reassuring. He realized that, oddly enough, he was now in the exact position Hamel was whenever the two of them sparred. He was facing a bigger, stronger, slower opponent with much greater reach and that meant he had to get in close without getting killed. What would Hamel do in this sort of fight, he wondered. The answer came to him quickly. He'd watched Hamel fight enough times to guess how his friend might handle a big, clumsy foe. A smile flickered across his face as he ducked under another swing of the block and circled to his right, moving next to the mainmast again. "'Come on, Kron! Can't you hit me?' he taunted. The ogre howled in fury and lashed out again, but Garin ducked to the other side of the mast. The block and chain wrapped around the mainmast, momentarily entangled, and he made his move. He dashed forward up under Kron's guard and slashed the ogre several times across the belly and chest, holding back from mortal thrust simply because he didn't know what would happen if he actually killed his opponent. When Kron threw up his left arm to shove Garin away, he laid open the ogre's forearm from wrist to elbow. Blood splattered the deck, and the ogre cried out in pain. Then he let go of the block and chain, and fell back on his broad bottom, shielding himself with his arms. Garin stepped closer to strike again, but Narsk suddenly appeared on the main deck, brandishing a mace with a spiked head. "'Damn the lot of you!' "'What is going on here?' the knoll roared. Garin quickly backed away from his foe. "'The new man shoved me to the deck and cut up Kron when he stood up for me,' Parik said quickly. "'He would have killed Kron, Captain.' "'Skamang's man started it,' Hamel retorted. "'He knocked Aram's dinner to the deck, looking for a fight. "'He's damned lucky Aram didn't kill him for it.' "'He's lying! The halfling's a liar!' several of Skamang's supporters shouted. Hamel surged forward to answer them, but Sarth restrained him. The knoll captain snarled in anger. He might not have had any reason to care what happened to his new crewmen, but at least he seemed to know Skamang, Kron, and their gang well enough to guess what had happened.' He stalked over to where Kron crouched groaning on the deck, hands clamped around his midsection. "'Who drew the first weapon?' the knoll demanded. The ogre looked up at Narsk. "'Kron didn't do nothing, Captain. The new fella just went mad. He cut it, Kron. That's the truth.' Narsk swore and wheeled back on Garin, his mace clenched in his hairy paw. He loomed over Garin, his canine fangs bared. "'And I suppose you'll tell me you were willing to fight the ogre with your empty hands until he armed himself?' Garin met his gaze without flinching. "'None of this was my idea, Captain. The ogre took the block off the mainmast. I had to defend myself.' Sorcel cleared her throat and looked over to the dwarf Merkelmoor, who sat on a cask, watching the whole scene. "'Did you see what happened, Dwarf?' she demanded. Merkelmoor shrugged. "'A Reich picked a fight with Aram, and when Aram took him up on it, he had Kron to step in for him. I'm guessing that Kron's no so happy with the whole business now.' He paused and then added, "'Kron was the first to arm himself.' Narsk turned away, still muttering to himself. 
Garin watched him carefully, the poniard still in his hand, steeling himself in case the knoll turned back and swung at him. He'd kill Narsk if he had to, and damn the consequences. But the knoll looked down at Kron instead. You're beaten, you fat oaf. Is this done, or do you and Aram go on until one of you is dead? It seems to me that won't be Aram. It's over, Captain, Skamang said. The Northman gave the ogre a stern look. Kron won't trouble him again. Is that so, Kron? Narsk asked. The ogre looked at Skamang, then nodded. Kron, say it done. Then get up and get someone to stitch you back together, the knoll snarled. He looked at the assembled deckhands and waved his hand angrily. Back! to work, all of you. Kron slowly got up, still bleeding profusely. He gave Garin one sullen, hate-filled glare, then shuffled back towards Skamang and his gang. Garin watched him just in case he had any thought of a sudden rush, and only rejoined Sarth and Hamel when he felt safe in turning his back on his adversary. He handed the poniard back to the halfling. My thanks, he said. Hamel glanced toward the ogre on the other side of the deck. "'You'd better keep it. I've got a couple of spares.' Sarth looked closely at Garin. "'How badly are you hurt? Do you need help?' Garin felt his ribs with a wince. "'I'm well enough,' he managed. He discovered that he ached all over, in fact. His ribs, his left ankle, his right foot from kicking the ogre's thick jaw, even his back from being thrown— or throwing himself on the deck. If you're so concerned, next time I'll allow you to fight the ogre. That seems to be the way it's done. The sorcerer surprised him with a sudden laugh. I will bear that in mind, he said, but I doubt you'll be troubled for a while. You bested Kron, and that should earn you no small respect from the rest of the crew. Narsk, too, Hamel said in a low voice. He nodded at the quarter-deck, where the knoll paced. His red eyes, narrowed with thought, were fixed on Garin. Narsk watched them a moment longer. Then he descended from the quarter-deck and ducked into his cabin again. "'He suspects something,' said Sarth. Garin gazed at the cabin door. He still needed to find out what it was that Kamoth had given Narsk, and they were another day closer to whatever event the pirate lord had in mind.' We can't do much about it, he answered. He picked up his dinner tin from the deck, trying not to wince as his injured ribs protested. Come on, I want to see if Tao Zhe has anything left in the galley, since Perrik and Kron spoiled my supper. Eleven. For Marpanoth, the year of the Ageless One. 1479 D.R. Garin soon learned how much he'd risen in the estimation of the rest of the crew. Early the next morning, as he once again aided Tao Zhe with the scullery work, Merkelmore wandered over and took a seat on a hatch cover, watching him scrub. The dour dwarf studied him for a long time without speaking, busying himself by scraping out the caked soot from a worn old pipe. "'If you're interested in the pots, you can find yourself a brush and pitch in,' Garin finally said. Merklemore made no move to help him, but gave him a humorless smile. "'That was a fine brawl yesterday,' he said. "'No one's ever bested Kron when naught but bare hands. Never thought I'd see it happen, neither.' "'It might have gone the other way if Dagger hadn't thrown me his knife.' "'I—' "'But you held your own until the ogre gave your friend a reason to help,' Merklemore leaned forward. "'You're a stout fighter, no doubt of it, and maybe the other two as well. "'But three's not enough to watch each other's backs. "'You'll be needin' more allies, Aram.' Garin stopped scrubbing and straightened up. "'There were three more dwarves on board. "'Merklemore and Fellows formed a tight, close-mouthed gang, "'watching out for each other.' and he'd seen that several of the human crewmen, mostly Teshans, men and women of the Moonsea lands, stayed close to the dwarves. Merklemore's gang numbered eight or nine crewmen, then, 
and the addition of Garin and his companions would strengthen it significantly. Allies we're happy to have, he said after a moment's thought, but we're not looking for a master. I'm my own man. I hear you, the dwarf allowed. I speak from a fist more often than not, and I'm no petty king like Skamang. I'll not try to tell you what to do. An ally's good enough for me. Keep an eye out for me, lads, and we'll do the same for you. Done, Garin told him. He'd have to talk it over with Hamel and Sarth, but Merklemore was exactly the sort of ally the three of them were looking for. The dwarf nodded in approval and ambled off. On the evening of the fifth, two days after Garin's duel with the Kron, Moonshark rode into the walled harbor of Mullmaster a little before sunset. The reek of scores of forges and foundries hung in the steep streets and clung to the rooftops. Like most of the other Moon Sea settlements, Mullmaster was a city that thrived on iron work and the mining of precious metals from the mountains nearby. A different collection of merchant ships rocked softly in the swell, but otherwise little had changed in the harbor since Garin's previous visit aboard Sea Drake. Mullmaster again, Hamel noted as they pulled their oar at a quarter beat. Well, now we know that at least one Black Moon ship calls here. One of those fellows we talked to a few days ago lied to us. Possibly, Garin said. But it might be true that Crocken Queen herself hasn't been here. Maybe Kamos sends other ships to run his errands in the larger ports. It came as no surprise to Garin that no alarm attended the arrival of Moonshark in the city's harbor. A harbor master approached in a rowboat and hailed the ship as the galley glided into the city's narrow bay. Narsk remained out of sight, but Sorsil spoke with the man and passed him a small bribe. With that business concluded, the harbor master directed Moonshark to a vacant spot along the city's stone quay and departed. Sorsil took the helm herself and steered the Corsair ship expertly to the quay, where the deckhands made her fast to the pier with four heavy lines. As soon as the ship was tied up, Narsk emerged from his cabin, dressed in a heavy hooded cloak that shadowed his bestial features. A small number of the so-called savage races could be found in any large city in Faerun, but most of those would be goblins or orcs. A knoll couldn't help but attract attention. He picked out several deckhands of Skamang's fist as the men were securing the ship, and growled, "'You three, arm yourselves and come with me. I have business ashore. Sorcel, let no one else leave the ship before I return. I will not be long.' "'I, Captain,' the mate replied. She took up a post by the gangplank as Narsk and his guards swept down the ramp and headed off into the town. Garin watched the knoll disappear into the narrow streets as Hamel and Sarth worked to secure the ship's oars. "'I think this is my opportunity,' he said to his companions. "'If I'm ever going to get a look inside Narsk's cabin, now is the time.' "'Agreed,' Hamel said. The plan we talked about? Garin nodded. We'd better move fast. I don't think Narsk will be away from the ship for long. Hamel climbed up to the quarter-deck and began to occupy himself by coiling lines there. His real job was to serve as the lookout, and warn Garin if anyone was coming. Garin and Sarth headed below to the midship's crew quarters, and from there worked their way aft to the storeroom directly beneath Narsk's cabin. Sarth closed the door behind them and set his back to it. He was also a lookout. Garin needed the storeroom to stay empty, and it was Sarth's job to make sure that no other crew member wandered in at some inopportune time. "'You understand that we may have to fight our way off the ship if this goes poorly?' the tiefling asked. "'I know it,' Garin answered. Still, this was the first chance he'd seen in days to find out what was in the letter pouch that Sergen had handed to Narsk. He only hoped that the knoll hadn't taken it with him when he went ashore. Before he could begin to second-guess the plan, he focused his mind into the still, silent readiness he'd learned under the leaves of Mithdranor. He brought to the forefront of his thoughts the mystic words of the teleportation spell, sensing the power locked within the arcane syllables. 
He drew Hamel's poniard with his right hand and held it at the ready, just in case he was about to find himself in the middle of a fight. Then the sword mage hurled the force of his will into the arcane syllables fixed in his mind as he spoke a single word in Elvish. Syrok! There was a dizzying instant of darkness, a sense of bitter cold, and Garin found himself standing in the cabin directly above the place where he'd been standing in the storeroom. He turned quickly, dagger held before him, but there was no one else in the room. Narsk's cabin was empty for the moment. With a small sigh of relief, he sheathed the poniard and studied his surroundings more carefully. The cabin was dark and cluttered, and a heavy animal smell lingered in the air. Garin wrinkled his nose in distaste. Narsk was none too tidy in his living arrangements. He realized that he'd need a little light to see by, so he took a copper coin out of his pocket and quietly murmured the words of a light spell. The coin began to glow with a bright, warm light. Garin quickly wrapped it in a bit of scrap cloth to mute its brightness as much as he could. He didn't want it shining from the row of windows across the stern end of the cabin. By the dim light, he studied his surroundings. Discarded clothing lay strewn where Narsk had dropped it, plates with the half-eaten remains of old suppers, and an assortment of odd baubles, gold goblets, pearl-handled cutlery, small idols, and other such things likely gleaned from the pillage of a dozen ships, lay scattered about, along with what seemed to be half an armory's worth of weapons. Now, where did Narsk put that pouch? Garin asked softly. He moved over to the small desk in the cabin and searched through the old charts and cargo manifests strewn there. Just like the baubles of gold and gems that were lying around the cabin, they'd probably been seized from Moonshark's prizes, too. Finding nothing there, Garin rifled through the desk drawers. Then he moved to the bookshelves. Hard to believe that Narsk was literate. He'd never heard of a knoll who could read, but found nothing there. With a sinking feeling, he realized he'd have to seriously search the cabin. It took him a quarter hour, but he finally found the leather pouch underneath Narsk's mattress, hoping that the master of the ship was going to be tied up in his business ashore for a while longer. Garin sat down at the desk and carefully drew out the pouch's contents. Two letters on parchment, one short, the other long. He looked at the short letter first. It read, Narsk, proceed to Mullmaster, making port no later than the fifth of Marpanoth. Go to the concession of the Red Wizards and ask for Eomold. Tell Eomold that you have come for the starry compass and that the High Captain will arrange payment as is customary. Eomold will explain the device's operation to you. Install the compass and proceed to the rendezvous. If the Red Wizards desire immediate payment, pay them whatever they ask for the compass. I will compensate you. If the starry compass is not available, or you run into some other difficulty, then do not linger in Mullmaster. You must be at the rendezvous without fail. Kamoth. Starry compass? What is that? Garin wondered. Some sort of magical device, it seemed. The Red Wizards were known as purveyors of enchanted items. Their fortress-like concessions were scattered throughout the cities of the Inner Sea, forbidding places where the mysterious expatriates of old Thay wove their sinister spells for anyone who could afford their services. In any event, that was likely what Narsk was doing this very moment ashore. Garin set that letter aside and picked up the second letter. He just unfolded it when he heard Hamel's voice in his mind. Narsk is returning, Garin. You'd better hurry up in there. Damn it all, Garin muttered to himself. Quickly, he skimmed the second letter. Narsk. No later than three hours after sunset on the 7th of Marpanoth, bring Moonshark to a point three miles south of the ruins of Sea Wave, on the shoreline twenty-five miles west of Hullberg. There will be a large bonfire ashore to aid in navigating to the rendezvous. Do not arrive too early, since we do not want the fleet to be spotted as it assembles. Stand off well out to sea until after dark if you need to. 
Once the black moon is gathered together, we will proceed to Hullberg and attack the city in the early hours of the 8th. Your assignment is to land Moonshark's crew on the wharves by the House Sokol concession. This is the westernmost of the merchant trade yards in the city, hard by the bluffs of Keldon Head. Wyvern will make her landing on the double moon wharves immediately to your right. Your crew is to burn the council hall, where Hullberg's merchant council meets. After that, they are free to slay, pillage, or burn as they please. There will be black moon men posted in front of places that are not to be harmed. Make sure that your crew knows to listen to any man wearing a black armband. The rest of the town and its folk are yours to do with as you please. All Black Moon ships will withdraw together at sunrise, unless the High Captain personally instructs you otherwise. Make sure your crew understands that stragglers will be left behind. If you are in possession of the Starry Compass, you will accompany Croc and Queen to Nesholdar. It is the Eleventh Islet. Otherwise, you are to make for the River Lys and the Inner Sea. No pirate has ever assembled a five-ship raid in the Moon Sea. Strike hard, strike fast, and the Harmax men will never know what hit them. Kemoth. Merciful ill matter, Garin breathed. The Black Moon intended to attack Hullberg, and only four days from now. With five ships, they could easily carry five or six hundred men. Given the advantage of surprise, they could cause unimaginable damage. Somehow, he had to find a way to warn Harmac Grigor. The Corsairs expected to strike a sleeping town without any idea that danger approached from the sea. But if the Harmac called out the spear meat and mustered the merchant company armsmen to meet the pirate attack on the wharves, Hullberg might drive off the Black Moon with little harm. Garin, Narsk is coming up the gangplank, Hamel shouted in his mind. You have to get out of there now. Garin stuffed the two letters back into the pouch, and then put the pouch back under the mattress where he'd found it. He could hear Narsk's snarling voice just outside the cabin door. He took one quick look around the cabin to make sure he hadn't left anything obviously out of place, then jammed the coin with a light spell back into his pocket and cleared his mind. The key rattled in the lock as he closed his eyes and whispered, Cyrock! There was an instant of icy blackness, and then he stumbled as he appeared in the darkness of the hold beneath Narsk's cabin. Sarth reached out to catch him by the arm and steady him. "'I'm here, Garin,' the tiefling whispered. "'Did you find Kamoth's instructions?' "'I did.' Garin started to say more, but then he heard the door in the cabin above creak open, and Narsk's footsteps overhead. The knoll's harness jingled and he heard the muffled sounds of something heavy tossed onto the bunk, followed by a cloak dropped to the floor. Then Narsk paused and snarled low in his throat, like an angry wolf. Quick footsteps crisscrossed the cabin several times, then he heard the knoll hurry back out to the deck. "'Did you leave something behind?' Sarth asked Garin. "'I don't think so, but I must have left something out of place,' he grimaced. "'It couldn't be helped now.' All they could do was rejoin the crew and try to behave innocently. They picked up casks of salted pork from the storeroom and carried them through the midship's crew quarters, where they passed several of their crewmates, forward to the galley. Tao Zhe was not there. Garin breathed a sigh of relief. He hadn't really come up with a good reason why he and Sarth would bring the Shao cook something he hadn't asked for yet, but— they had to have some reason for being in the storeroom under the captain's quarters. They climbed back up onto the main deck and found Hamel waiting for them there. Trouble, Hamel said quietly. I think Narsk has got your scent. My scent? Garin looked back toward the captain's cabin. Narsk was standing just outside the door, sniffing the air. Garin had no idea how keen a knoll's sense of smell was, but given Narsk's hyena-like muzzle, he had to believe it was sharper than his own. The question was, did he have enough of Garin's scent to identify him or not? "'If you found what you needed in Narsk's cabin, this may be the right time to jump ship,' Sarth murmured. "'What more do we have to gain by remaining on board?' Garin thought quickly. He needed to find a way to warn Hullberg about what was coming. 
That was the foremost consideration. He'd like to find out more about the starry compass and what it was for, or continue his corsair career and see what more he could learn about the Black Moon Brotherhood, but those were secondary goals. He looked over to Hamel and asked, "'Did Narsk bring anything aboard when he returned? Maybe a parcel of some kind?' "'Yes, something about the size of a hat-box. I thought it strange that he carried it instead of giving it to one of the men who went with him. Why? What is it?' "'I think it's something called a starry compass. It may be important.' Garin turned to Sarth next. "'Do you know any sending spells?' he asked. "'I do not have my tomes with me.' the tiefling answered. They are still aboard Sea Drake. Then we have to remain aboard Moon Shark. The Black Moon ships are gathering to attack Hullaberg two days from now. We won't find any vessel that will get us to Hullaberg faster than that. Somehow we will have to find a way to warn the Harmac that the Black Moon is coming. Hamel winced. That's not much of a warning. Won't we get to Hullaberg at the same time that the other Black Moon ships do? "'We might find some way to warn Hullberg of our presence,' Garin said. "'If nothing else, Sarth might be able to go ahead and provide at least a few minutes' warning.' "'In that event, it seems that we're continuing as corsairs for a little longer,' Sarth said. "'And that means we have to throw off Narsk's suspicions. "'We have to hide your scent somehow, Garin. "'How, I don't know.' "'Sorcerer, assemble the crew!' "'Narsk shouted. "'I want every hand before the mainmast, now!' "'I, Captain,' the first mate replied. "'She started bellowing for the deckhands to muster on the main deck. "'Garin stood petrified for a moment. "'He was certain that he needed to stay on board, "'but if Narsk could tell, he'd been in his cabin. "'Quickly, Garin,' Hamel said. "'Go below to Sarth's locker, change into his spare clothes, "'and dump what you're wearing over the side.' It may reduce your scent. It was worth a try. Garin retreated into the galley, and from there went below decks to the midship's crew quarters. His fellow deckhands were complaining as they clambered out of their bunks and made their way up to the main deck. No one paid much attention to him. He found Sarth's locker, grabbed a tunic and a pair of breeches, and returned to the galley. He stripped, splashed himself with water from the large cask there, and scrubbed briefly with a handful of scouring sand Tao Zhe kept in a bucket, and dressed in Sarth's clothing. He crept back up to the main deck, where most of the ship's company was assembled, and threw his own clothes over the side before he went to join the rest of the deckhands. Sorcel spied him trying to slip into the rear of the assembled crew. The fierce first mate stepped over and struck him across the arm with her truncheon. Laggard, she snapped. Next time, don't be the last man to muster. Garin saw stars. Holding his arm, he glared after Sorcel, but the first mate had already moved on. Maybe it would have been better to jump ship in Mullmaster after all, he thought. Before he could rethink his plan, Narsk moved slowly into the middle of the deckhands. Keep silent and hold still, the knoll growled. He went from person to person, towering over most of them, his red eyes gleaming ferally in the lantern light. He sniffed audibly from time to time, pausing in front of some, and then moving on. Garin tried to will himself to calmness. If he allowed himself to start sweating, he would lose the temporary benefit of donning Sarth's clothing. But he kept his hand close to the hilt of the poniard Hamel had given him, just in case. Narsk reached him and sniffed several times. Garin met his eyes without flinching. Narsk didn't expect him to act like he was afraid, so he didn't. The knoll narrowed his eyes and asked, "'Where were you, Aram?' "'In the galley. I wanted something to eat.' The knoll studied him for a moment longer, then moved on. Garin kept himself from sighing in relief. When the knoll finished with the crew— he paced back toward the quarter-deck, muttering to himself. Garin noticed his fellow deckhands exchanging puzzled looks. No doubt they were wondering what in the world Narsk was looking for, but they kept their thoughts to themselves. He looked over to Hamel and Sarth and found them looking back at him. That had been too close. Sorcel, make ready to sail!' Narsk snarled at his first mate. 
We are leaving now. A mutter ran through the crew, and Sorcel looked as if she intended to protest before thinking better of it. Few ships left harbor after dark. In the first place, it was usually better to have daylight for the careful piloting necessary to navigate close to shore. But more importantly, crews expected opportunities to go ashore and spend their hard-earned coin on whores and drink. Moonshark's crew was chafing for the chance to escape the ship for a time, and Narsk was denying them their sport. Of course, they didn't know what Garin knew. The Knoll captain had an appointment to keep in the waters near Hullberg in just two days' time. In a quarter hour, Sorcel gave the order to cast off, and the crew manned the rowing benches again. The waning moon peeked through a high overcast as they rowed quietly out of Mullmaster's harbor. For once the first mate didn't snarl and shout at the deckhands at their oars. They rowed until they were a good two miles clear of the harbor mouth. Then Sorcel ordered the crew to ship and stow oars. "'Stay at your benches and shut your mouths,' she told the deckhands. "'The captain wants to speak.' Narsk stood on the short ladder leading to the quarter-deck. The knoll bared his fangs in what passed for a smile on his canine visage. "'It's time to tell you where we sail,' he said. "'At sunset, the day after tomorrow, we'll be three miles off the ruins of Sea Wave. There we'll meet Kraken Queen, Wyvern, Daring, and Sea Wolf. All five Black Moon ships assembled together in a single fleet. Together we'll set our course eastward and attack the town of Hullberg in the dark watches of the night.' The deckhands around Garin raised a hearty cheer at that. Somewhat belatedly, Garin remembered to join in, thrusting his fist into the air. Narsk continued, "'We're to burn the city's council hall, and then we're free to do as we please. I mean to fill the hold with loot and captives. Every dog among you will be rich.' If you're ready to take what you want from those fat, stupid tongues, folk, they brought together another cheer. Narsk grinned again. The Halbergans won't want to be parted from their treasures, he said. Once they realize what's happening, they'll try to fight us off. So stay away from the drink, go in groups of five or more, and kill anyone you come across. We can loot and drink all we want after the fighting's done. But we've a battle to win first. Umberly, help the dog who comes back to my ship without blood on his sword. The pirate crew roared their approval again. The knoll laughed savagely. The night after next, Hullberg won't forget the name of Moonshark for many a year. That, I promise you. He waved his hairy paw in salute, then dropped down the last few steps of the ladder and left Sorsel to dismiss the crew. Hamel twisted in his bench to look back at Garin. Well, there it is, the halfling said silently. How are we going to stop this, Garin? The sword-mage looked at the pirates swarming over the deck, already boasting to each other about what they were going to do in Hullberg. He frowned and met Hamel's eyes, the only way that the halfling could hear his thoughts in return. "'I don't see any way around it,' he answered. "'Tomorrow night we'll have to get to Hullberg, if we have to seize the ship and sail her there ourselves.' Twelve, five Marpanoth, the year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. The night air was cool and damp around Rovan de Sarnel, as he flew above the roofs of Hullberg's wretched tailings. He remained in the guise of Lestanor, the Termitian mage who advised Lord Marath Marstall, and, as he arrowed through the dark sky, a long, hooded brown cassock fluttered behind him. Ironically, he'd invested enough time and effort into cultivating Lestanner's place in this miserable human town that he couldn't allow Lestanner to be seen going from the Marstall Villa to the place he was going. 
Therefore, he'd made use of a spell of flying, to leave his quarters in Marath Marstall's house unseen by any on the ground, and intended to return the same way later. Few folk were out and about at this hour, and he was fairly certain that no one would notice a silent, dark shape overhead, not when the guttering yellow street lamps scattered here and there through the streets below obscured sight of what moved overhead. Rovan crisscrossed the tailings for a moment, just to be sure of his bearings, then he descended toward the building he sought. Without a sound, he dropped down out of the night sky into the lightless alleyway behind the ramshackle inn and tap house he was looking for. He looked around carefully, aware that robbers and thieves sometimes lurked in this very alleyway to prey upon the drunken patrons of the tap house. For now, it seemed that he had the alley to himself. The reek of garbage and emptied chamber pots was thick in his nostrils, and he scowled. Humans, the poor ones, anyway, were a filthy race, at least by the standards he was accustomed to. Elves would never have permitted such a thing in one of their cities. Not for the first time, Rovan cursed the misfortunes that had joined his fate to crude, boorish, stinking humans, rather than the cultured Tel Kessir, among whom he belonged. It would have been better to raise a lonely tower in some remote wilderness and live as a recluse than to accept permanent exile among the towns and cities of humankind. Once he brought about Garen Hallmaster's downfall, he might choose that very course of action. With a sigh, he picked his way out of the alleyway, turned to his left, and made his way into the inn's front door. Above the door, a battered old wooden signboard showed a faded painting of three golden crowns above crossed swords. Rovan glanced up and down the street, then went inside. The tap room adjoined the foyer, and through the heavy wooden beams of the open doorway he could see dozens of humans engaged in drinking themselves into a stupor with the worst sort of swill he could imagine. Some looked up as he entered, but he was well hidden in his voluminous cloak. Only a shadowed wedge of coarse brown skin showed beneath the cowl, along with a wiry gray beard cut in the distinctively squared-off style favored in Termish. Rovan found one of the serving-maids hurrying past, and stopped her with a touch of his hand. "'A friend expects me,' he said in a low voice. "'It would be a private room.' "'Where does he wait?' The serving-maid looked up at him, and a shadow of fear flickered over her face. She quickly brought her knuckle to her forehead and averted her eyes. "'If you please, this way, my lord,' she said. She led him back through the tap-house to a small dining-room behind the common room, knocked, then let Rovan into the room. Inside, a pale human with a patch of yellow-gray beard under his mouth, waited by one end of the table, dressed in the tunic of a workman. "'Your guest is here, my lord,' the serving-maid said. "'Excellent,' the pale man replied. "'Bring us a flagon of your very best wine, my dear. None of that swill you normally serve, mind you. We are gentlemen of discriminating tastes.' "'As you wish, my lord.' The servant bobbed her head and withdrew. Rovan stepped into the room, pulling the sliding door closed behind him. "'Could you have found a more squalid tavern for our meeting, Valdarsal?' "'I know it's not much, but they know me here,' the pale man replied. He offered a humorless smile. "'The proprietor impresses me with the zeal of his service to the Black Sun.' "'Inspired by his example, or perhaps simply fearful of losing their employment, "'his people do Cyric's work readily enough. "'They understand my requirements, and they are careful to meet them. "'And speaking of my requirements,' Rovan reached into his cassock "'and drew out a small leather pouch that jingled softly.' He set it on the table and slid it over to the syracist priest, who weighed it in his hand, then tugged the drawstring open to peer inside. 
The mage was all but certain that Valdarsal was, in fact, already in the pay of some other power with an interest in Hullberg, but he was prepared to pretend otherwise if the Syracist thought it important. Besides, what did he care about Marstall's money? "'It is the customary sum,' Rovan told him. "'Count it, if you like.' "'I will later,' Valdarsal answered. He tied the pouch closed and slipped it under his own tunic. "'My thanks, good mage. "'This should allow me to recruit and arm another fifty cinderfists, "'although I'll likely need to bring some in from the nearby cities. "'Naturally, I will see to it that the cinderfists cause no difficulties for House Marstall. "'Naturally, although the time may come when I ask you to arrange for some selective damage "'to befall unimportant Marstall assets.' It wouldn't do for my lord's properties to remain completely untouched by your mob. Some might grow suspicious. A wise precaution, the Syracist remarked. Let me know when and where you would like the Cinderfists to strike. There was a knock at the door behind him. The serving maid slid it open and carried in a tray loaded with a jug of wine, two goblets, a loaf of black bread, and a wedge of cheese. She set it on the table between the two men, poured wine in both goblets, then curtsied and withdrew. Rovan waited for the door to slide shut before continuing. "'I have news that will interest you,' he said. "'Sometime after midnight, two nights from now, the Black Moon Brotherhood will attack Hullberg. I understand that it will be a large raid, the greatest pirate raid in the Moon Sea in a hundred years, five ships full of corsairs. I expect that they will cause much damage to the neighborhoods close to the harbor. Valdarsal stared at him for a moment before leaning back in his chair with his goblet of wine. Indeed, he murmured. Have your magical divinations shown you this danger descending on the city? Rovan smiled. If you would like to think so. And what leads you to provide me with warning of the attack? In the wake of a devastating raid, there will be outrage and recriminations. The Harmac's inability to adequately defend Hullberg from the depredations of the Moon Sea pirates will be plain for all to see. I wish the Cinderfists to run amuck in the days following the raid, Valdarsal. Riot in the streets and scream for Harmac Grigor's head. Rovan raised his own goblet and sipped at his wine. He heard the serving maid hurry past in the hall outside, her footsteps light on the floorboards, while in the common room of the inn someone began to strum a lute with little skill. With the rule of House Hullmaster shown to be fatally weak and incompetent, the Merchant Council will have no choice but to wrest power from the Harmac. The Cinderfists will enthusiastically support this measure, of course. Should the Harmac resist, the combined might of the Merchant Council and the Cinderfists will force him out. Valdarsal nodded to himself, his eyes focused on the events Rovan outlined. It is easy to see what Lord Marstall gets from all this, he said. But it seems to me that the poor, honest outlanders of the tailings and the foundries will simply exchange one master for another. The Cinderfists may go along with the idea of overthrowing an incompetent government, but they'll turn against your counsel next. I have to have something more to satisfy the rabble. Rovan shrugged. Doubtless there will be Hullmaster loyalists remaining among the population after the Harmac has been dismissed, especially among the so-called native Hullbergans, who own most of the land in these parts. As those people are found to be conspiring to overthrow the Council and restore the rule of the Harmac, the Council can deal sternly with them and confiscate their property, reward citizens loyal to the Council with Hullbergan land and goods, and I think you'll find that the Cinderfists may become enthusiastic supporters of the new regime." It wouldn't take much for a wealthy Hullbergen to be found to be resisting the Council's authority, would it? Some semblance of procedure should probably be followed, Rovan replied. Oh, of course, Valdarsal grinned like a wolf. It is said that wizards are subtle and dangerous, Lestanor. In your case, that strikes me as an understatement. A plan such as you propose warms the Black Prince's heart, 
It truly does. Rovan inclined his head, acknowledging what the Syracist intended as a compliment. It was possible that the merchant council alone might suffice to oust the Harmac in the wake of the Black Moon raid, but he needed to make sure that the Cinderfists would not interfere. In truth, he could not care less what became of the city or of Aldarsal's ragged mob once the Hullmasters were dealt with. He expected to shake the dust of Hullberg from his boots and never look back. Leaving the town to be torn apart among an idiot like Marath Marstall, a viper such as Valdarsal, and the desperate gangs of foreigners who lurked in its poorer neighborhoods, was one more little gift for Garen Hallmaster. He returned his attention to the priest of Syrik. The pirate raid depends on surprise. If you choose to move your cinderfists out of its path, or get them in place to strike during the chaos, make sure that you keep the reasons to yourself. The mage wished he did not have to confide in Valdarsal, but if he failed to warn the man about the coming attack, the cirrusist might very well wind up unleashing his rabble to some counterproductive cross-purpose. He simply had to hope that the prize was tempting enough for the priest. Valdarsal snorted. I am not stupid. He took another sip from his goblet, then nodded to himself. Best not to tell my people anything, I think. I'd rather make use of their unfeigned outrage in the days to come. In fact, I rather hope that the pirates do some damage to the tailings and Easthead. A few deaths or abductions would be just the thing to stir up anger. I consider that the safest option— you and I are the only people in Hollaberg who know what is coming the night after next. I prefer to keep it that way. Rovan drank again from his goblet. The wine was exactly what he might have expected from a place like the Three Crowns, and stood. We will speak again soon, he set his hand on the door, and was about to let himself out when he heard a thump from somewhere behind the wall where Valdarsal sat. Someone in the adjoining room said clearly, Ho! Oh, "'What are you doing there?' There was a muffled reply, another couple of thumps. Then the speaker shouted, "'Come back here!' Rovan wheeled on Valdarsal with sudden fury. "'You had someone spy on me?' he demanded. Valdarsal ignored him. The cirrusist surged out of his own seat and looked at the wall. The three crowns was rather shoddily built. The interior walls were little more than a thin weave of wooden slats covered in plaster between the rough timber posts. Valdarsal angrily threw aside several spare chairs standing against the wall, revealing a coin-sized hole in the plaster just a little above the floor. "'Not I,' the man spat. "'It seems there was a mouse in the wall.' Rovan threw open the sliding door and hurried down the hall, only to find that the room he was seeking backed onto the dining room from a different corridor. He snarled and rushed around through the foyer, linking the tap house to the inn, turned right, and found a hallway that paralleled the one in the tap house. A gangly, teenaged servant lad stood in front of an open storeroom, a small keg in his arms. Rovan pushed past him to look in the storeroom. Amid the clutter of casks and barrels, he saw the gleam of light shining through from the dining room on the other side, with a small space cleared by the spy hole. There was even a blanket on the floor. He turned on the serving lad standing there. "'Who was in here? Where did he go? Speak, boy!' The youth gaped at him before he found his voice. "'It was a woman, my lord, with black hair and a blue cloak. "'I opened the door to fetch this keg and found her on the floor there, looking through the hole. "'She—she she leaped up and ran out.' "'Which way?' Rovan demanded. "'The boy nodded down the hallway behind him. "'There's a door to the alleyway back there. I heard her go through.' "'Rovan ran to the end of the hall and burst out into the dark alleyway behind the inn. "'He looked left, then right, but he saw no sign of his quarry.' A moment later, Valdarsal appeared behind him. "'No sign of our mouse?' he asked. Rovan shook his head. "'No, she's gone. The boy said she was a black-haired woman in a blue cloak.' Valdarsal scowled. "'That could be anybody. Damn it all to the depths of Nessus. No one followed me here or knew that I was coming,' Rovan said. He looked at the cirrusist. 
Our mouse was spying on you, not me. Perhaps the folk of the Three Crowns have come to know you better than you would like. Oh, trust me. I intend to question them rigorously. The cleric kicked at the ground and walked in a small circle, composing himself. How much did she hear, I wonder? Assume that she heard everything until we have reason to believe otherwise. We need to find her, then. Tonight. Valdarsal took a deep breath and looked at Rovan. Do you have any divinations that might help? Divinations, no. But I might be able to do something else. Rovan headed back inside with the priest trailing him and returned to the storeroom. The serving boy was gone— He'd fled back to the tap-house with his keg as quickly as possible, it seemed. He kneeled by the place where the spy had crouched, and spoke the words of a light spell to illuminate the scene. There was the blanket, an old saddle blanket, he saw, a small candle in a tin holder, and a few crumbs of bread and cheese. Whoever it was, she had waited for some time for Valdarsal to arrive. Then something glinted in the light. He reached down and retrieved a long, fine strand of black hair from the blanket. "'Have you found something?' Valdarsal asked. Rovan showed him the hair. "'It may be enough. I must return to my chambers and make some preparations.' "'Go swiftly, then. We must catch this mouse before she squeaks.' The priest smiled cruelly. "'While you essay your magic?' I will find out what I can from the servants of the house. Someone besides that boy knew she was here. Very well, said Rovan. He hurried outside to the alleyway and spoke the words of his flying spell. In the space of a moment, he soared up over the rooftops, leaving the dark alleyway behind the three crowns behind him. This time he did not have to search out his destination with care. He could see the lights of the Marstall Manor from the moment he rose above the rooftops of the tailings. With all the speed the spell allowed him, he raced back toward Lord Marstall's home, high above the town in the richest part of the East Head. He easily avoided the guards at the front gate by alighting in a little-used garden behind the grand house. Rovan had appropriated the northerly wing of the Marstall Manor as his own months ago, evicting the other residents. He gave him space to set up a library, a laboratory, and a conjury for his arcane studies, and also made it easy for him to leave or return to the estate without being observed. He knew he would have been wiser to keep his quarters right next to Marath Marstall's own chambers, but he detested the old man and wanted an excuse to keep him at some small distance when he could. Instead, he made sure that Marstall's servants and guards never left the old man's side and knew to summon him the instant Marstall did anything he wasn't supposed to. The elf made his way into his rooms and went at once to his conjury. This room he kept sealed with a spell of locking, which he undid with a word and a gesture. In the center of the room a large magical diagram of beaten silver was inlaid into the polished stone floor. Shelves and work tables along the walls held a variety of arcane reagents and materials. When he entered the room, a hulking figure in a vast black cloak stepped into the light a pale creature almost the size of an ogre, with doughy flesh and lusterless black eyes. It reached one great hand toward him. "'It is I, Bastion,' Rovan said absently. The golem halted at once, its arm falling to its side. "'Has anyone tried to enter since last I left?' The creature shook its head in a slow, deliberate gesture. "'Good,' Rovan muttered. He looked around the room and found the item he was searching for— a large, thick glass jar filled with dark liquid. Inside floated a small, malformed creature, about the size of a cat. He carried the jar over to the center of one of his work tables, then used a small chisel to break apart the old, brittle wax seal that fastened the lid to the neck of the jar. Bastion stood by and watched him at his work, its eyes dead and dark. A rank, briny smell greeted Rovan's nostrils when he pried off the lid. 
Rovan held his left hand over the jar, then used a small, sharp knife to cut the tip of a finger. He squeezed a single drop of blood into the dark fluid where the creature floated. Nothing happened at first, but then the thing inside began to move slowly. Its limbs twitched weakly, and its beady eyes opened. "'Come, little one,' he said to the thing in the jar. "'I have need of you tonight. The creature, a homunculus, it was called, climbed awkwardly out of the jar and slid to the table-top in a splatter of dark brine. It unfurled a pair of bat-like wings and flapped them slowly, drying itself. Its motions were growing stronger, more confident with every moment. Rovan allowed himself a smile of satisfaction. Creating a homunculus was a tedious and unpleasant task, but now he was going to reap the reward of his own foresight from many months ago. He took the strand of hair he'd found in the spy's nest at the Three Crowns and gave it to the creature. "'Find the woman whose hair this is,' he said. "'Do not allow yourself to be seen. Then return and tell me who she is and where she may be found. If you do not find her by sunrise, return and tell me so.' "'Yes, master,' the homunculus said in a small, wheezing voice. Rovan went to the room's window, opened it, and threw open the heavy shutter outside. "'Now go,' he said to the homunculus. The creature hopped from the tabletop to the window sill, tested its wings, and threw itself out into the night. It flew clumsily at first, but quickly grew stronger and steadier. When it flapped out of sight, it was flying as well as any big, heavy-bodied bird.' The mage tended to the cut on his finger, and then settled down to wait. Since there was little more he could do until the homunculus returned, he motioned for Bastion to withdraw, and seated himself cross-legged on a low divan against one wall. The elf allowed himself to doze off into the half-memory, half-dreaming state that served as sleep for Elfkin. His mind wandered, and time passed. A little more than an hour later, he heard a sudden fluttering and scratching at his window. He rose and went to let in the homunculus. The little creature scrabbled across the window sill to the table nearby. "'Well, let us see what you have learned,' Rovan said to the creature. It could not truly understand him, of course, but it knew what it was supposed to do. It crouched down and held still. The elf-mage reached out to rest his living hand atop its head, and intoned the words of the spell that would reveal to him what his spy had discovered. He closed his eyes, the better to focus on the images of the creature's memories. He saw its wild, fluttering flight across the rooftops of Hallberg. It stopped frequently, clinging to the eaves of houses, or prowling over the rough wooden shakes of roofs snuffling and tasting the air as it sought the woman. At first it seemed to move more or less at random, a few hundred yards this way, then a few hundred yards back, but soon its movements became more urgent, more focused. It moved to the east side of the Winterspear River, and headed to the north side of town, not far from the foot of the castle Griffin Watch, flapping past a handful of passers-by and drunks staggering through the streets, despite the late hour. The homunculus steered wide around any people it encountered. Once Rovan saw a shield-sworn guard by the castle's battlements look up with a startled expression on his face, but no one else seemed to notice the winged monster. It soon alighted on an old split-rail fence by a small farmhouse in the middle of an apple orchard, and crawled closer on its wings and feet. In his mind's eye, Rovan saw the thing climb up beside a window and peer inside. The woman he sought was sitting by the table in her kitchen, frowning as she fixed herself a cup of tea. The blue cloak hung on a peg by the door. Rovan smiled coldly and lifted his hand from the homunculus's head. He knew where she was. "'What is her name?' he asked the homunculus. "'Miria,' the creature hissed. 
It possessed no real intelligence of its own, but sometimes it could learn things about the people it spied on, things it didn't necessarily observe or hear aloud. That was the nature of its magic. The name sounded familiar to Rovan. Mirja Erstenwold? That is Mirja Erstenwold? Yes, the creature wheezed. Why would Mirja Erstenwold spy on me? he wondered aloud. The homunculus just gazed up at him without answering. The creature simply didn't understand. He knew that she was a friend of Garen Hullmaster, but he thought she was a simple shopkeeper. As far as he knew, Les Stanor had given her no reason to pry into his business. But he hadn't been the only person in the Three Crowns, had he? She must have been there to spy on Valdarsal instead of him. Either way, he had to assume that she knew things she was not supposed to know. She might not have overheard much during the time she'd been spying on them. After all, she'd gone home instead of going straight to Griffin Watch. But he couldn't take the chance that she had. It seemed that he had one more errand for the night. He found a piece of parchment, scribbled out a short note, and handed it to the homunculus. Take this to Valdarsal. He was at the Three Crowns Inn earlier tonight and may still be there. Do not allow yourself to be seen by anyone other than Valdarsal if you can help it. Return by daybreak if you do not find him. Yes, master, the creature replied. It seized the note in its tiny paws and flapped away again. Rovan watched it for a moment. Then he donned his hooded cassock. Come, Bastion, he said to his golem. We must pay a visit to Mirja Erstenwold. Thirteen. Six Marpanoth, the year of the Ageless One, 1479 D.R. Hulberg's arches stood ninety miles north-northwest of Mullmaster's fortified harbor. With favorable winds and a full spread of sail, a swift ship such as Moonshark could make the crossing in twelve or thirteen hours. However, Narsk had Sorsel and Keffen run at half canvas during the night of the fifth, so that as morning broke on the sixth of Marpanoth, they were only about thirty miles out of Mulmaster. The jagged line of the Earthspur Mountains still showed above the horizon behind them, although they soon vanished into an overcast that thickened throughout the morning. Shortly after daybreak, Narsk and Sorsel summoned Merklemore, who served as the ship's carpenter, to the quarter-deck. Merklemore was soon hard at work building a frame or stand of some sort in front of the helm, using some of the ship's spare timber. Most of the deckhands paused in their day's work to peer up at the quarter-deck or look over Merklemore's shoulder, curiosity which was sharply discouraged by Sorsel when she noticed it. When the dwarf finished, Narsk brought the mysterious parcel from Mullmaster up from his cabin, and carefully removed a strange dark glass orb about the size of a man's two fists held together. Tiny pinpricks of light seemed to glimmer in its dark depths. The orb's sun freely inside a collar of silver metal. Merklemore secured the collar to the wooden stand he'd built for the device. The starry compass— Garin murmured to Sarth and Hamel as they watched from the main deck. They were half-heartedly pushing mops around the deck as they did their best to spy on the installation of the device. They weren't the only ones. More than a few of the ship's crew were looking for an excuse to take a look at it, whatever it was. "'What is it?' Hamel asked. "'Some device for steering by the stars? A magical lodestone? And what does Narsk need one for?' "'I don't know.' Garin answered. Kamos's letter didn't say much more than, "'Pick up the starry compass in Mullmaster.' He looked over to Sarth. "'Have you heard of anything like it?' Sarth shook his head. "'As I've told you, I know nothing about seafaring. That ignorance extends to arcane devices that might have uses at sea. I could imagine that would be useful to have an enchanted compass, though. We'll have a look at it later.' Garin decided. He was more than a little curious about the device, but at the moment the threat to Hullberg occupied the greater part of his attention. He returned to his mopping. 
On the quarter-deck, Sorcel and Merklemore cut a piece of spare sail-cloth to serve as a cover for the compass and its frame. They slipped the cover over the device and lashed the canvas securely in place. Clearly, Narsk and Sorcel didn't want it pawed by every member of the crew. Moonshark passed the day lazily pacing northward under half-sail, as Narsk dallied in the middle of the moon sea, well out of sight of the shore. Garin willed every ounce of speed from wind and wave, but the half-galley refused to hurry her steps. Under cheerless gray skies, he paced the decks anxiously, chafing as the hours dragged slowly by. The rest of the crew, on the other hand, spent the hours eagerly anticipating the looting of the town. They told stories of rich prizes from the past, boasted about their sexual prowess, or speculated about where the best loot would be found. The larger fists in the crew, Skamang and his men, Merklemore and his dwarves and their Teshan allies, the goblins and half-orcs, the Malmasterites, clustered together, laying their plans to go their own way once the ship's business was taken care of. Some of the smaller fists struck alliances with larger ones or grouped with each other. A few men who'd been to Hullberg before did their best to sketch out maps of the town for the others, which ranged from fairly good to wildly inaccurate. The pirates laughed and jibed at each other in a rough good cheer that lasted throughout the day. A little before midnight, Garin, Hamel, and Sarth arose and prepared themselves for their watch— but the sword-mage motioned for his captains to follow him forward, instead of going up to the deck. When he was satisfied that no one was in earshot, he said, "'We're taking the ship tonight.' Hamel and Sarth glanced at each other. Then Hamel nodded. "'What do you have in mind?' the halfling asked. "'We'll take care of the rest of the watch and steer due north for the rest of the night. I can't wait for Narsk to reach the Black Moon Rendezvous.' "'A dangerous ploy,' Sarth said. The tiefling frowned unhappily behind his human guise. "'Narsk roams the ship at odd hours. If he discovers us, we'll have to deal with him along with the rest of the watch,' Garin answered. He wished he could think of some other way to get to Hullberg in advance of the Black Moon raid, instead of risking all on such a reckless plan. But they were out of time. "'Let's get to it, then.' The sooner we change course, the closer to Hullberg we'll get. Hamel held out his fist and looked up to his companions with a bold grin. Good fortune to us, then, he said. Garin fought down his fears of what might happen if they failed, and set his hand on top of his friends. Sarth shrugged and set his hand atop Garin's. Good fortune, they both repeated in low voices. Then the three companions turned to the work ahead. First, they visited the ship's armory. Hamel expertly picked the lock, and Garin helped himself to a good cutlass. With a little work, he rigged the scabbard to lie across his back, where a hooded cloak might help to hide the fact that he was armed. Then, in the privacy of the arms locker, Garin quietly invoked the sword mage wardings and spells, which served as his armor for the first time in days. They were not normally noticeable, but someone trained in the arcane arts might sense their presence, and anyone who struck at him, for example the first mate with her cudgel, would likely notice their effect, which was why Garin had gone without the wardings. He hoped he wouldn't need them, but it was better to be ready. Tonight would be a night of decision, and the time for fitting in with their fellow corsairs was drawing to an end. "'All right, let's head up for watch,' Garin told his friends. They quietly closed the arms locker and went up on deck, reporting for their watch under the second mate, Keffen. Although Keffen's watch consisted of a full third of the ship's company, twenty men weren't needed on deck at all times. Normally, Moonshark sailed with the mate and a helmsman on the quarter-deck, a lookout in the bow, a lookout aloft, and a couple of roving deckhands who kept an eye on the rigging, tended the braces and stays, and looked after the lanterns below decks. Their primary task was to go below and rouse more of the watch if the mate had to change the set of the sails. 
Some minor adjustments could be handled by a couple of men easily enough, but other adjustments, for example breaking out or taking in a mainsail, required the whole watch. Those men who weren't on deck were allowed to catch as much sleep as they could, so long as they were quick to come up on deck when summoned. Over the course of a watch, it was customary for the helmsmen, lookouts, and rovers to trade places with their watchmates so that most of the crewmen had a chance to sleep at least four or five hours a night. However, Moonshark's stronger fists made new and unproven hands stand more of the watch than they should have. For tonight, that would serve Garin and his friends well. Garin took the helm after the watch change, while Sarth was kept on as roving hand, and Hamel was sent aloft to the crow's nest. The night was cool and dark. The moon was hidden behind thick clouds, and a light drizzle fell. Moonshark rode sluggishly on a west-northwesterly track, as the wind was light, and she still didn't have her full spread of canvas aloft. For half an hour he held the ship on course, biding his time to make sure the second watch was settled below. Keffen said little to him, sipping from his flask as he leaned against the lee rail. Finally he decided the moment was right. He looked over at the second mate. "'Take the wheel for a moment, Master Keffen,' he asked. "'I need to relieve myself.' Keffen sighed, but he shook himself under his damp cloak and nodded. "'Don't be long,' he said. Garin let the man get his hands on the helm and stepped back. Then he quietly drew a leather sap from beneath his cloak and struck the second mate across the back of the head. Keffen groaned and slumped. Garin caught him and lowered him softly to the deck. Quickly he looped a keeper over the topmost spoke of the helm, then dragged Keffen to one side. He arranged the unconscious man against the rail, and liberally sprinkled him with the contents of his own flask. Things would go hard for Keffen in the morning, but at least it wouldn't seem overly suspicious. Then he hurried forward. Hamel dropped lightly to the deck from the foremast as Garin approached. The halfling winked at him, and together they moved forward to take care of the remaining two men on watch. But atop the forecastle. They found that Sarth had caught both the forward lookout and the other rover together. Both men lay sprawled on the deck in an enchanted slumber, overcome by the tiefling's spells. "'Did you deal with Keffen?' Sarth asked. "'Not as neatly as you managed these two, but it's done,' Garin answered. Together he and Hamel securely bound and gagged the unconscious men, then hid them under a bit of spare canvas. "'The deck's ours for the moment.' Hamel said. So what now? Now we run toward Hullberg at our best speed, Garin answered. If we can get within a dozen miles or so of the northern shore, we'll put the longboat in the water and part ways with Moonshark. With luck we'll reach Hullberg by noon and warn the Harmac about the pirate raid. But I think we'll need a good three or four hours on a northerly course to get close enough for the boat, and then we'll have to get the boat in the water without waking half the crew. "'What can I do?' Sarth asked. "'Go forward and act like you're on watch. "'If anyone comes up on deck, "'try not to let on that anything's out of the ordinary. "'Hamel, you'll do the same. "'I'm going to turn us slowly to our new course "'and see if I can't quietly put on a little more sail "'without anyone noticing.' "'If this works, I'll be astonished,' Hamel muttered. "'But I guess it's worth a try.' "'The halfling shrugged and moved to take up his position "'near the mainmast.' Garin returned to the quarter-deck, checked briefly on Keffen, the mate seemed to be well and truly out, and took the wheel again. Working just a few degrees at a time, he brought their course a good fifty degrees over, settling on a heading just a little east of due north. Then he put the keeper back on the helm, and hurried down to the main deck to help Hamel and Sarth square the yard-arms back around now that they were sailing further from the wind. Garin sorely wanted to break out more sail, but he'd need most of the watch for that. He might be able to bluff his way through by propping Keffen up at the rail and telling the watch that the second mate wanted more sail on, but there were just too many things that could go wrong if he roused a dozen more of their watchmates. He settled for having Sarth and Hamel quietly break out the staysails, 
which were comparatively small, close to the deck, and easily handled. They didn't add much to Moonshark's speed, but every little bit helped, and the wind was beginning to pick up a little bit. They ran for most of the night with little difficulty. Several times sleepy crewmen came up to the deck to answer calls of nature. None seemed to notice that the ship was not on the heading she was supposed to be on, but that didn't surprise Garin. Very few deckhands knew anything about navigation, and Narsk was hardly in the habit of informing the crew exactly where he was bound at any given moment. Usually, no one other than the mate on watch and the man standing at the helm knew what course the ship was steering, if there weren't any landmarks in sight. One or two noticed the stay sails and said something, but Hamill deflected the questions easily enough by simply saying, "'The captain told Kevin to break him out.' The deckhands took Hamill at his word and made their way back down to their hammocks. Two hours before dawn, Garin judged that they'd pushed their luck far enough. In an hour or so, Tao Zhe would be rising to begin making breakfast. Garin wanted to be off the ship before then. He was just about to call Hamill and Sarth to the quarter-deck when he heard heavy footsteps on the port-side ladder. A moment later, Sorcel appeared on the quarter-deck. "'How goes the night?' the first mate asked. Then her eye fell on Keffin's motionless form, propped up by the rail. "'What in the—is that miserable bastard asleep on his watch?' Garin stared at her in horror. Fortunately, Sorcel's attention was fixed on Keffin. The first mate crossed the quarter-deck and kicked Keffin savagely. The second mate fell over with a strange grunt, but didn't awake. "'By Sirik's black blade, he's dead drunk!' she fumed. Master Keffin said he wasn't feeling well, Garin stammered. The night was quiet enough, so I just kept on as he told me. Sorcel looked at the lodestone in front of the helm, and then glanced up at the sky. The night had cleared a bit, and a few stars were shining through the overcast. Bloody hell! We're sailing due north, and who put on the extra sail? How long have we been going like this? Only half an hour or so, Garin said. It was the last thing Kevin told us to do before he fell ill. Sorcel was livid. The first mate kicked Kevin's unresponsive body again, and Garin winced. The last thing he needed now was for the second mate to wake up. But evidently he'd sapped the man harder than he thought, for Kevin still didn't rouse. The first mate rounded on Garin again. Half an hour, you say? You didn't think to send the rover to tell me that he was goddamned unconscious? How much longer were you going to go on without letting anyone know that you were the only man on the quarter-deck? Sorry, Garin. I didn't see her come up on deck. Hamill's silent voice cut into Garin's thoughts. A moment later, the halfling hurried up the ladder from the main deck. Is all well? he asked aloud. Ask your friend here, Sorcel snapped. The first mate looked one more time at Keffin, and then scowled at both Garin and Hamill. "'Bring the ship back to west by northwest, damn you,' she finally said. "'And you there, Dagger, you go below and rouse the whole watch. We're going to take in sail like the captain wanted, and then you're going to explain what in the nine hells is going on here.' "'Distract her, Garin,' Hamill told him. "'We can't afford a scene.' Garin grimaced. He knew he wouldn't like what came next, but he couldn't see any way around it, not if he still hoped to spare Hullberg the brunt of the Black Moon raid. He looked at Sorcel and said quite deliberately, "'I've had enough from you, Sorcel. I think the sails are fine as they are. Take them in yourself if you don't like the way they're set.' The first mate paled in rage. "'You think—' she snarled. She reached for the truncheon at her waist, and at that moment Hamill glided up behind her, reached up to clap a hand over her mouth, and sank his poniard into the first mate's back. Sorcel staggered forward two steps. Garin caught her and wrestled her over to the rail. They struggled for a moment, but the first mate's strength was already failing. With one final effort, Garin toppled her over the side with a splash, although Hamill had to catch the sword mage with a belt buckle to keep him from going in after her. I doubt that Dariad Selsharon would have approved of that, he thought grimly. It was murder, pure and simple, 
and Garin was none too proud of it. But Sorcel had killed more than a few of Moonshark's victims with her own steel, or so he'd heard from Tao Zhe and others aboard, and scores, perhaps hundreds, of Hulbergen lives were at risk if he failed to warn the Harmac of the pirate plan. He looked over to Hamel and nodded his thanks. "'I think we're out of time.' "'Agreed,' the halfling said. "'How far to Hullberg do you think?' "'It might be fifteen miles. It might be thirty. "'That would be a brutal distance if they had to row it, "'but the longboat had a small mast "'that could be stepped into place with just a few minutes' work. "'Garin hoped to sail to Hullberg, not row. "'They'll come after us once they find us gone,' Hamel pointed out. "'I know.' Garin thought for a moment, considering how best to sabotage the ship. Unfortunately, there was nothing nearby to run her aground on, so he decided to disable the rudder. He kneeled, slashed the ship's rudder cables with his poniard, and began to haul up the loose cabling. Rigging a new rudder cable ought to occupy Moonshark for a couple of hours at least, and by the time they were ready to pursue Garin and his companions, they'd have long since disappeared. "'Go on back and get the longboat ready to launch. Quietly.' Hamel grinned at him. "'Maybe this will work, after all.' He dashed forward to the main deck, while Garin yanked length after length of the rudder cable up from below. Without her rudder, Moonshark's bow began to fall off downwind, and she rocked a little as she passed through the swell. Garin got the last of the rudder cabling that he could reach, picked up the tarry mess, and dropped it over the side.' He brushed off his hands, hurried down the ladder to the main deck, and headed forward to help Hamel and Sarth wrestle the longboat over the side. This was by far the trickiest part of the whole business. Lowering the longboat was a six-man job, not a three-man job, and it was nearly impossible to do it quietly. With sheer brute force, they managed to lift it out of its cradle and stagger over to the rail but not before the boat's gunnels thumped the deck a couple of times. Garin winced, but they were getting close to the moment when speed would count more than stealth. At the aft end of the main deck, the door to the captain's cabin opened, and Narsk stepped out. The knoll took in the scene at a glance, catching Garin and his friends with a longboat half in its davit. "'What is this?' he snarled. Then he leaped over to the ship's bell and began to strike it vigorously. "'All hands on deck now!' he shouted. "'Treachery! All hands on deck!' Despair paralyzed Garin for five heartbeats. "'So close,' he muttered. The first pale glimmers of dawn were beginning to streak the sky to the east. In a matter of moments, the deck would be full of enemies. They wouldn't live long enough to get the longboat in the water. He could see only one slender chance— to kill Narsk quickly, and hope to cow or contain the rest of the crew long enough to make their escape. Before he could second-guess himself, he dropped his end of the longboat. Moonshark rolled heavily under Garin's feet, running clumsily before the wind with her helm spinning freely on the quarter-deck. "'Guard my back!' he hissed to Sarth and Hamel. Then he drew the cutlass hidden under his cloak and charged across the deck at the pirate ship's captain. Fourteen. Seven Marpanoth, the year of the Ageless One. 1479 D.R. Yo! Narsk snarled. It was you in my cabin in Mulmaster. I know your scent now, human. The knoll greeted Garin's attack with a snarl of pure rage. He yanked out the mace he carried at his belt and drew a long curved knife to meet the sword mage. Leaping aside from Garin's first thrust, Narsk answered with a furious onslaught of whistling mace swings, using his long knife to protect himself when the mace's weight left him out of balance and exposed. Garin didn't answer. He leaned away from the mace, parried a knife slash at his belly, ducked low to cut Narsk's legs out from under him. But the knoll leaped over his slash with surprising agility. Narsk threw himself closer after Garin's sword passed, and lunged for the sword-mage's neck with a snap of his powerful jaws. The sword-mage fell back again and survived a knife-thrust at his right side, only because his spell-wards deflected the blade. 
The tip of the blade gouged a bloody gash against his ribs, but it didn't sink more than an inch or so into his flesh. The stab still knocked the breath out of him and left him with warm blood trickling down his side, the wound throbbing in pain. I need to end this quickly, he realized. Otherwise there would be no hope of escaping Moonshark. With the instant, diamond-sharp focus he'd learned in Myth Draner, Garin invoked a sword spell even as his steel flew to meet Narsk's attack. Arvan Sanagon, he cried, and the pirate cutlass in his hand blazed with blue flames. Narsk swore and recoiled but not before Giran slashed his knife out of his left hand, leaving the knoll's fur smoking. Narsk snarled in pain. Fall sorcery! he shouted. Kill him! Kill him now! Garin risked a quick glance over his shoulder. Moonshark's crew was boiling up out of their quarters under the main deck, most with knives, belaying pins, or boarding pikes in hand. They gaped at the spectacle of their captain fighting for his life, then started to close in behind Garin, until Sarth raised his arms and wove a fence of lightning across the deck. "'This is between Aram and Narsk,' he shouted. "'No one else is to interfere.' The corsairs halted, unsure about whether or not they should intervene, and were dissuaded in any event by the sudden revelation of Sarth's magic." Narsk roared in fury when he realized that his crew would not cut down his challenger. "'You miserable rats!' he screamed. "'You will all pay for your cowardice!' He threw himself at Garin recklessly, pounding his mace against his foe with a furious barrage of overhand blows. Garin parried or dodged the blows, although one carried through his block with enough power to drive the back of his cutlass— fortunately not sharpened, into his left shoulder, almost buckling him to the deck. Narsk snarled and redoubled his effort, but this time Garin deflected the mace past him and stepped aside. The knoll was left off balance and stumbled forward as his mace head brushed the deck. Garin spun in the opposite direction and took off Narsk's head with one clean cut to the back of the neck, the body crashed heavily to the deck, and the head rolled into the companionway, leading down to the crew quarters, disappearing down the steps with several dull thuds. A stunned silence fell over the crew of Moonshark. They stared down at Narsk's body, and then they stared at Garin. "'We lost the longboat, Garin,' Hamel told him. The halfling stood next to Sarth, a pair of daggers in his hands.' It slipped from the davit when the trouble started. I sincerely hope you have another plan in mind. The Northman Skamang pushed his way to the front of the crew and fixed his eyes on Garin. The blue tattoos on his face seemed to writhe and jump in the flickering light of Sarth's crackling, spitting barrier. Where's Sorcel and Keffen? Keffen's passed out on the quarter-deck, dead drunk. Garin answered. Sorcels, somewhere astern of us, floating in the water with a knife in her back. Someone had better explain why the captain and first mate are dead, and your friends were getting ready to launch the longboat, Skamang said. He hefted a boarding axe in his hand. And soon, at that, Merkelmore crossed his arms in front of his chest and scowled. I'm with Skamang, the dwarf said. I'd like to know what in the nine hells you're about, Aram. Garin stared back at the two pirates and tried to think of something to say. He was not a good liar, and he knew it. Fortunately, Hamel knew it as well, and the halfling had a knack for thinking quickly in situations such as this. "'Blame it on Sorcel. That's the best chance I can see,' the halfling said to him. Garin glanced over and found Hamel kneeling by Narsk's body, quietly checking the gnoll's pockets. The halfling offered a small shrug and nodded in the direction of the rest of the crew. "'I thought I'd better have a look,' he said. "'There was a letter in Narsk's pocket. I've got it now.' The sword-mage frowned and returned his attention to the pirates confronting him. He let the point of his cutlass drop. "'It was Sorcel,' he said. "'She came up on deck and ordered us to put the longboat over the side. It seemed strange to me, but she didn't explain herself.' and Kevin was dead drunk. Then she went to the quarter-deck and sabotaged the rudder. 
I caught her at it and tried to stop her. Narsk came out of his cabin just in time to see Sorcel knifed and knocked over the rail. Narsk didn't give us much of a chance to explain ourselves, Hamel added. He stood up from beside Narsk's body and moved over to stand beside Garin. He rang the bell and called all hands on deck, and then he went after Aram. His final mistake, as it turned out, to Garin, he added, Not bad, but don't say too much more. Narsk is dead, Sorcel is dead, and Kevin's not but a fat, useless drunk, Merklemore said. I'd like to know who captains Moonshark now. I do, Garin said at once. If he was going to try to bluff his way out of this, it might as well be a brazen ploy. He winced a little, realizing that he had no idea what that might mean at the moment. Before he could think better of the idea, he pressed on. By the traditions of the Black Moon, I claim command. Narsk is dead by my sword. I'm captain of Moonshark. The crew muttered uncertainly. Some men shouted, No! or Not so fast! while others cried, No! Skamang! or Kevin! instead. I hope you know what you're doing, Garin, Hamel said. This'll be another fight. He's got the right to make his claim, Merklemore said. The old dwarf shook his head. We all saw it. This is no way it should be. But Kevin's no captain, and Sorcel's as dead as Narsk, if Aram's speaking true. My fist stands for Aram. Mine doesn't, Skamang snarled. I won't follow some stranger who's been aboard Moonshark less than a ten days simply because he bested the knoll. He pointed the spike of his boarding axe at Garin. I say, I'm the captain of this ship. Before Garin, the sixty-odd brigands, outlaws, cutthroats, and pirates who made up the ship's crew stood watching him, and each other, as they waited to see whether he or Skamang would seize control of the ship. No one wanted to be remembered later for backing the wrong man now. Garin forced himself to put on a cold, confident sneer as he studied the ship's crew. The appearance of confidence might be the difference between life and death, not just for himself, but for hundreds of Hulbergans, too. He had to make the crew think he was as hard and deadly as a well-sharpened blade, or Skamang might succeed in overthrowing him. In that case, Garin had no guarantee that the Northman would let him live, let alone sail Moonshark in the direction he needed to go. "'A ship can't have two captains,' Merklemore growled. "'It's no possible.' "'No, it's not,' Garin agreed. He fixed his eyes on Skamang, mustering every ounce of icy contempt that he could find. "'Will you fight me yourself this time?' Or do you want to send your ogre to die in your place? My fist will stay out of this if yours does the same. Your fist, all two of them, the north man laughed. Drop that cutlass, let every man on this deck hear you call me captain, and I'll let this whole thing pass. You and your friends can go ashore the next time we make port, with no hard feelings. I doubt that it would be that simple, Hamel told Garin. He'll kill you if you give in now, just to make sure no one else thinks they ought to be in command. In other words, you don't want to meet me with steel in your hand, Garin retorted. If he could goad the Northman into a duel, he might be able to take the ship with a single sword stroke. He risked a quick glance over at Sarth, who stood near the foot of the ladder up to the quarter-deck. Sarth had a tight grimace on his face, but he gave Garin the slightest of nods. Whatever came, he would be ready. Skamang's laughter faded, and a hard edge came into his voice. I won't be in such a generous mood if you keep up with this nonsense. You might not care whether you live or die, but I'll gut any man that stands with you and toss him over the side. Do you mean to gut me too, Skamang? Merklemore said. The dwarf took two steps toward where Garin and his friends stood, and turned to face the Northman. "'Aram's got me fist at his back. If that's slipped your mind, we stand with him.' Skamang scowled at Merklemore, but then Tao Zhe stepped out of the crew and went to stand by Garin, too. The old Shao cook's footsteps broke the remaining indecision among the crew— 
and, in twos or threes, most of the rest of the men shifted over to Garin's side. Only the half-dozen goblins and half-orcs remained by Skamang's fist, and they began to mutter and shift restlessly as they realized that their party was now outnumbered. "'Seems like Skamang and his allies haven't endeared themselves to the rest of the crew,' Hamel observed to Garin. Garin straightened his shoulders and allowed himself a small smile. He'd been afraid that the crew would choose the devil they knew instead of the devil they didn't. The Northman was a long-time veteran of Moonshark, after all, and no one had any doubts about his prowess or his ruthlessness. On the other hand, all they knew of Aram was that he knew how to use a blade and that he'd been caught in the middle of some sort of mischief during the watch. Based on that alone, he would have expected the crew to turn against him. But then he realized that no one on Moonshark missed Sorcel or Narsk, and Skamang would have been just as bad as the preceding captain in his own way. "'It looks like the vote's in, Skamang,' said Garin. "'I say I'm the captain. This is your last chance. Yield, or it's over the side with you and yours. Alive or dead, I don't much care.' The Northman's face darkened in fury, but he could count as well as Garin. He looked around the deck, and then he gave Garin a curt nod. "'So be it. You're the captain. But we'll be watching you, Aram. Make one mistake, and you'll see just how quickly those dogs on your side of the deck will turn against you.' Garin held his eyes for a long moment, and then looked around at the rest of the crew assembled on the deck. "'Does anybody else take issue with me?' "'Speak now, or hold your tongues later.' The pirates looked at each other, but no one else stepped forward. Garin nodded. "'I thought not,' he said. "'Very well, then. Dagger is the new first mate. Vor is the ship's mage, as you've all seen by now. When they speak, they speak for me. Merklemore, you're the second mate. The midwatch is yours.' "'What about Kevin?' the dwarf asked. "'Take him below and lock him in his cabin. "'I'll put him ashore the next time we make port. "'I've got no use for him, but he hasn't done anything to me. "'You can take Sorcel's cabin, Merklemore.' "'Aye, Captain,' Merklemore said. "'Hamel sheathed his daggers, brushed his hair away from his eyes, "'and stepped out in front of the crew. "'What are your orders, Captain?' he asked. "'Karen glanced up at the sails, luffing awkwardly as Moonshark drifted downwind.' The wind had shifted and strengthened during the last hour, coming around to the northwest. It was promising to be a blustery autumn day on the moon sea, with a stiff wind that would make for fine sailing, if he didn't have to sail straight into it, which it now seemed that he did. Already he suspected that the ship was too far east to make Hullberg without hours of laborious tacking. When he'd planned to abandon Moon Shark and strike out for Hullberg in the ship's boat— it would have suited his purposes quite well for the pirate galley to find itself adrift with a damaged rudder, unable to pursue him, and too far away to join the attack on the city. Now, with the longboat gone, but the ship at his command, he'd have to find a way to bring Moonshark to the shore somewhere near Hullberg. He could order the crew to the oars, but Garin wasn't so sure of his position that he felt ready to try them with a long stint of rowing just yet. "'The first thing we need to do is to repair the rudder,' Garin answered Hamel. "'Until we get the rudder fixed, take in all sail. The black moon is gathering near the ruins of Sea Wave at sunset today. By my reckoning, that's a good ways north and west of us yet, and this wind is driving us farther east every minute.' "'Rather ironic to order the repair of the rudder you sabotaged not an hour ago, don't you think?' Hamel told Garin with a small smirk. Then he turned to the crewmen around him. "'You heard the captain?' he shouted. First watch, get aloft and take in the sails. I don't know about you lads, but I don't want to spend all day rowing to Hullberg. Looting and pillaging's no fun when your back's sore and your dog tired. Master Merklemore, I know you're a mate now, but you're the best carpenter we've got on the ship. Have a look at the rudder, if you please. The crewmen started to move as Hamel badgered them. Some started aloft to begin reefing in the sails, while Merklemore motioned for a couple of his fellows to join him on the quarter-deck. Two more men came up to carry Kevin below. 
Sarth leaned close to Garin. "'You'd better have that cut tended,' he said in a low voice. "'If you pass out on your feet, we might have to repeat the whole round of challenges.' Garin lifted his hand from his side and saw blood on his palm. He winced and then looked around for Tao Zhe. The Shao cook was the closest the ship's company had to a healer. Tao Zhe, fetch some hot water and your sewing kit, he said. Narsk left me something to remember him by. Merklemore and his helpers began to lay out a new rudder cable. Garin didn't bother to press him to hurry his repairs. The dwarf knew that the ship's participation in the attack on Hullberg depended on regaining the ability to maneuver as soon as possible, and he drove his small crew of woodworkers and rope layers as hard as they could be driven. Garin remained on the quarter-deck, watching Merklemore work as Tao Zhe, in turn, worked on him. Narsk's blade had left a deep gash, but he'd been lucky not to have worse. "'I thought Narsk had killed you with this one,' the Shao told him as he stitched the wound. "'You were fortunate this morning.' "'It's not so bad,' Garin gritted his teeth against Tao Zhe's work. He'd had his wounds sewn more than once, and each time it seemed worse than receiving the wound in the first place. "'Truly, I did not expect you to move so quickly against Narsk when we left Zentel Keep that morning,' Tao Zhe remarked. "'Nor did I expect you to be adept in magic. "'You seem to be a man of hidden talents.' "'Narsk forced this fight on me. "'I had no intention of challenging him, "'but he left me with no choice.' "'Tao Zhe nodded. "'I am not greatly troubled, mind you. "'Narsk was not much of a seaman, "'and he was a greedy and vicious brute. "'Almost anybody would be a better captain than he was.' "'Garin snorted. "'My thanks for your confidence.' The Shao smiled. He glanced around and leaned a little closer, lowering his voice. "'What really puzzles me is why Sorcel was attempting to leave the ship. It seems hard to believe that she would desert Moonshark without anything from her cabin, or that she would subdue the other two men on watch and hide them under a canvas, but leave you and your friends free to stop her from going. I am not a very clever man, but it would seem much more likely to me—' The three men who'd only been aboard for a ten-day were instead conspiring to steal the boat. But if that were the case, then I would still be left to wonder why they wanted to leave Moonshark. How strange that events transpired in the manner you described. Garin studied the old Shao carefully. It seemed unlikely that Tao Zhe was the only crewman aboard Moonshark entertaining such thoughts. Speculation is pointless, Tao Zhe he said after a moment. "'Of course. But it is certainly not speculation to observe that you and your comrades are hardly the typical sellswords or outlaws who sail under the black moon.' "'What does the crew make of this, then?' "'Because they fear your magic, they will follow you for now,' Tao Zhe answered. "'No one liked Narsk or Sorso, but you should watch your back, and you should not expect the crew to deal with challengers for you.' "'Not until you demonstrate that you are a captain worth following.' "'I understand. "'I only say what is plainly true,' Tao Zhe answered. "'He finished with his needlework and covered the wound with a hot compress. "'There is little more I can do. "'It will trouble you for a ten-day or so. "'Try not to get stabbed there again.' "'I'll take it under advisement.' "'The old Shao grinned. "'He collected his medicine kit and retreated to his galley.' Merklemore managed to rig a working rudder cable only a couple of hours after sunrise. With the rudder repaired, Garin was able to turn Moonshark back to the northwest and Hullberg. But the strong autumn wind was directly out of that quarter, and so he had to resign himself to a west-by-southwesterly tack, heading back out toward the middle of the sea, as the pirate ship fought its way back to windward. A grey, stiff chop arose by afternoon, so that Moonshark battered her way through white-capped waves as she ran, soaking the decks with cold spray. The rough seas ruled out any idea of taking in sail and putting out oars that Garin might have entertained. Rowing was possible under such conditions, but just barely. In mid-afternoon, Garin decided that he couldn't afford to extend his tack any farther to the south, and came north to run across the wind. 
He wasn't sure if he'd strike the coastline east or west of Hullberg at this point, but he was fairly certain that he'd be nowhere near as far west as the ruins of Sea Wave. Due to their night of sailing off course and the morning of drifting ahead of the wind, there was no way they'd reach the Black Moon's rendezvous point. If he had been intending to join the raid on Hullberg, he'd have to steer straight for the city at this point and join the rest of the flotilla there. Since the afternoon was growing late, he figured he'd better prepare the crew for a change of plan. He called Merklemore, Tao Zhe, and a few of the other fist leaders together on the quarter-deck about an hour before sunset. "'Between the rudder damage and the shifting of the wind, I think we're too far east of the Black Moon Rendezvous to meet up with the other ships,' he told them. "'They're gathering a good twenty miles west of the town in just a couple of hours.' but I think we can reach Hallberg by midnight without too much trouble, and that's what I intend to steer for. We know that's where the rest of the Black Moon is bound, and we can join the flotilla there. The High Captain will no be pleased with us, Merkel Moore said. It can't be helped at this point, said Garin. If the attack on Hallberg succeeds, I'd wager that many sins will be forgiven. If not, well, I'll take the blame. Moonshark kept on her northerly tack for the rest of the afternoon and through the sunset. Still no sight of the northern shore greeted them, and Garin began to fear that he'd somehow completely lost his reckoning in the last few hours. He couldn't bear the idea that Moonshark might be too far away for him to get some word of warning to Hallberg. At least the raid would be one ship short, if that were the case— but then he and his companions would have to deal with an extremely, perhaps lethally, disappointed crew. Finally, as the last embers of sunset gleamed low in the sky to the west, the lookout aloft called out, "'Land ho!' Garin hurried to the bow, peering into the gloaming to see what he could make of their position, and his heart sank. They were still ten miles east of Hullberg, perhaps more." He quickly calculated time and distances in his head, trying to envision the course they'd have to follow. With this wind, Moonshark could make perhaps seven or eight knots running close-hauled, but they'd have to cover maybe three times as much distance on the tack as they actually managed to make good against the wind. That meant another four or five hours of sailing before they reached the arches. He returned to the quarter-deck, thinking furiously. "'Do you know this stretch of coast?' Hamel asked him. "'How far from Hallberg are we?' "'I do, and we're too far east,' Garin answered. "'I think we're out of time.' Hamel and Sarth exchanged looks with each other. The sorcerer frowned. "'So what do we do now?' he asked. Garin didn't see any other alternatives. He pointed at the coastline, perhaps three miles distant. "'Unless I'm badly mistaken,' That's Sulan Head. It's about ten miles east of Hullberg by the old coastal road. I'd bring the ship in to land on the beach at its foot, but that might take another hour, and I don't dare let the crew see me do something like that. They would surely suspect treachery. Sarth, can you reach the coast from here with your flying spell? Sarth studied the distance and nodded. Yes, and perhaps a little more. Then I need you to leave the ship— Get to Hullberg, and warn Kara, the Harmac, whomever you can find, that the Black Moon raid is on its way. I don't know if I can beat the Black Moon ships to Hullberg from here, not with the way the weather is running, but you may be able to go on foot. By my reckoning, you've got three or four hours to cover the distance. Can you do it? It must be done, so it will be done. Sarth looked back at Moonshark's deck. What about you and Hamel? If the crew notices that I am missing, they may rise against you. I'll tell them you're below, using Narsk's cabin to study your spells. That should work well enough for a short time. Garin paused as a stray thought crossed his mind. That reminds me, Hamel. What's in that letter you found in Narsk's pocket? Hamel frowned. I'd forgotten it. Just a moment. He pulled it out and carefully opened it under the light of the swinging stern lantern. After a moment, he shook his head and passed it to Sarth. "'It looks like some kind of incantation.' Sarth glanced at it and shrugged. 
Arcane words are written in several different tongues, and I had thought I would at least recognize a few words in any of them. But this is nonsense to me. Keep it safe, and I will see if I can use magic to decipher it when I have the opportunity to study it carefully. He looked back to Garin. What would you do with Moonshark? Garin smiled grimly. I still need to get to Hullberg, and Moonshark's going to take me there. Now, let's get you on your way, because I've got to turn the ship and run away from the coast again in just a few minutes. Fifteen. Eight Marpanoth. The Year of the Ageless One. 1479 D.R. Kraken Queen raced past the arches of Hullberg's harbor an hour after midnight, her oars sweeping her eagerly ahead through the white caps and the wind-driven rain. At her back came Daring, Wyvern, and Sea Wolf, all told almost five hundred Black Moon Corsairs thirsting for blood, rape, and treasure. Few lights showed in the town. Only a handful of street lamps and the occasional lantern-lit doorway of a tavern or merchant trade-yard. Sergen Hullmaster shaded his eyes from the wind and the rain, peering anxiously at the shoreline. If some word of the Black Moon fleet had come to Hullberg, he expected that ranks of shield-sworn, merchant coster mercenaries, and even the laughable militia companies of the Spearmeet would be waiting by the wharves to repel the attack. 